Hey guys, this is at row. Today, we are going to be building a complete full stack admin dashboard application using Mern from scratch. So this application is going to consist of a dashboard page with different stats, a line chart, a transaction table, and a pie chart. Now this information is going to be coming from backend and this will all be data that we'll be saving into Mongo database. So if you've seen my other dashboard application where we focus on the front end, this one is completely different because we will be focusing on full stack and making sure we have our data organized. After the dashboard page, we'll have a products page where we have a list of products with rating, description, name, category, and we can see more. Then we have a customer's page where we have a data grid. We're gonna use material UI data grid, which is an excellent data table that you can use and put our information. And then we'll go to the transaction page, which it may look like the same, but this one is different because we're gonna be doing server-side pagination, which is much harder, much more complex, and most tutorials are not gonna cover this. So we're gonna be doing that. And then we're also gonna to go to our geography page where we will see where our users are located. So we'll have a list of users and we'll be able to display where the users are located using Nivo geography chart. And then from here, we're also gonna have line charts showing our revenue by the month and we can swip, swap between sales and units. And then we can go to the daily chart and we can choose different ranges of dates for our daily sales. We'll also have a monthly chart. We'll also have a breakdown of our pie chart. We're gonna have an admin chart or admin table and then performance table as well. But the performance table for this information, it's going to be different because on the back end, we're going to be using something called aggregate calls in Mongo database, which is very advanced. In addition, we're gonna also be able to toggle on and off our sidebar with Material UI's sidebar and our website will be fully responsive. Also in this app, I'm going to show you how you can use an entity relationship diagram to data models so you can organize your backend before you start creating so you can save time and make sure your data is very well organized. And finally, I will also make sure I show you how you can deploy your application onto render.com and your app will be fully available to see on your portfolio. And by the way, if you saw my other admin dashboard app, this is similar, but this is actually very different because we are going to dive deep into the backend. For the technologies we'll be using, we'll be including the Mern stack, which is represented by MongoDB, ExpressJS, React, and Node. And the front end will consist of Material UI for styling, Material UI data grid for our tables, Nivo for our charts, Redux toolkit for our state management, Redux Toolkit Query for making API calls. For the backend, we will be using Node.js as a runtime, Express.js as our backend framework, and Mongoose for managing our MongoDB. Again, this app is for both beginners and experienced developers. I'm gonna show you step-by-step step and making sure you are using best practices. And finally, as I say with all my apps, this website is completely designed all by me, so you are free to use parts or even the whole project for your portfolio. Okay, let's get started. So the first thing we want to install is gonna be Node.js, which is a JavaScript runtime that allows you to run JavaScript code in your machine, and you can install whichever package is most sensible for your system. Then we can go to the NPM website and install a package called NPX, which will allow us to execute certain packages. And then finally, we can go to Visual Studio Code and install Visual Studio Code as our text editor. This was the one I'll be using, but you can use whichever one you want to. And by the way, all these links are in the description below if you want to figure out where to go. Now with those installed, I'm gonna open up Visual Studio Code. I'm gonna create a new directory, go into that, and I will open up the terminal. Inside the terminal, I'm gonna do make dir, so make directory. We're gonna create a folder called server. We're gonna go into that server with cd server, and I'm gonna run a command called npm init-y, so it'll initialize our npm package. And from here, I'm gonna install some packages. I'm gonna run npm i express for our framework for APIs, body parser for parsing our data coming in, 
cores for cross origin resource sharing dot env for environment variables helmet for protecting our apis morgan for logging our api calls mongoose for handling mongodb calls and nodemin for live server reload and we're going to wait for that to finish and then from here i'm going to open up i'm going to go to server you can ignore vs code for now these are just my preferences that i have it's not going to have any impact so i'm going to create a new file i'm going to call this index.js in this index.js file i'm going to create some imports so i'm going to import express from express like so import body parser from body parser import mongoose from mongoose import cores from cores like so import dot env from dot env at that then i'm going to import helmet and by the way i am using intellisense so whenever it pops up it's very highly recommended to use this because it does two things one that makes it faster to write so you don't have to write it and as well as it makes sure there's no bugs because if you click on it it's automatically generated so if you ever mistype it it's not going to be a problem finally i'm going to import morgan from morgan all right and then from here i'm going to set up some configurations like so and i'm going to start with dot env dot convig like that so we can set up our environment variables i'm going to do const app equals express and then i'm going to do app dot use express dot json to invoke it do the app dot use helmet then app dot use helmet dot cross origin uh, i need to spell that correctly cross origin resource policy and i'm going to put in brackets policy with cross origin so this allows us to make cross origin sharing requests and it's something you need if you want to make api calls from another server then we're going to do app.use morgan common like so so a lot of this is just boilerplate for a lot of these middleware that we're using from these packages you do have to just set and configure a lot of these so from here i'm going to do app.use body parser and do dot json pass that in and then do app.use body parser dot url encoded and we're going to set this extended to false and then do app.use cores so I have that, I'm going to save it. And then from here, we can set up some routes. So I'm going to do routes. I'm going to do app.use. And we're going to set up four different routes. We're going to set up client. So this is going to include all the client routes. Then I'm going to do app.use slash general like so, and do general routes. And then app.use slash management. And we're gonna set management routes. And then app.use slash sales. We're gonna do sales routes. Need to make sure that's camel case. All right, so what these routes represent is gonna represent client will represent these four routes or four pages all the routes relevant to this and then sales and then management and then general will represent getting the users and the dashboard so that's how i'm splitting the apis so now if i go back i'm going to go up i'm going to import client routes from files we have not created so client.js. So client routes correspond to this guy. 
And we're going to do the same thing for each of these. And I'm going to set this client. I'm going to hit Command D to hit both of those. And then from here, I'm going to do client as well. Change this to management. And the final one with sales. And then from here, I'm going to create the routes folder. I'm going to create the four different files in here. So I'm going to create uh, client.js, general.js, management.js, and then sales.js. So we're just going to keep these open. I'm going to just create the general skeleton. I'm not going to create the routes just yet, but I will create the imports and just the general setup. So I'm going to import express. I'm going to do router equals express dot router. So we can route these routes in here and I'm going to do export default router. Actually, this should be lowercase. I'm going to save that. I'm actually just going to copy this over for each of these files. So we just have the routers set up. We'll be setting the routes in a little bit, but not yet. And with that, I'm going to open up and I'm going to create a few more folders just for our general layout. Here we're going to create controllers. I'm going to create a folder called data and we're going to create one more folder called models. And inside here, I'm going to go and create a file called client.js. So it's just going to be exact replica. We're not going to have any code in it just yet. So controllers, general.js, management.js, and then sales.js. So these are going to be files we just leave blank for now. All right, before we get on to the next step, we want to connect our Mongo database with Mongoose. Um, so you're going to go to mongodb.com, and we're just going to try and sign in. And here you're going to sign up, and you're going to register your account. So now I've already registered, but I will do the onboarding process with you guys. So you can follow me along after you confirmed your email. This is what you're going to see. So from here, we're just going to do build a new application. We're going to say what type of application you're building. Doesn't really matter. I don't know, application modernization. I'm going to say JavaScript is my preferred. And then from here, we're going to build a database. I'm going to choose shared, which is free and we're going to create. And from here, we're going to choose a lot of this doesn't really matter. You're just going to choose a location that's closest to you for mine's Oregon. And we're just going to leave everything the way it is. And we're going to hit create cluster. And then from here, we need to do, we need to set our user. So this can just be anyone, um, dummy user. And we're just going to I'm just going to set this to a random password. So it's not that big of a deal. And I create that user. So this will be the main user that will be able to use it. And right now you just want to say, add my current IP address. So we have access to this database. So only this IP address has access to the Mongo database for now. Um, and we're just going to go to databases. You don't need any of this. So we're just going to, close. I'm just going to hit dismiss over here. And we're just going to wait for this cluster to load. And before we set this up, I just want to show you a few things. So you can go to database access. So these are the users that will have access to the database. You could set whatever permission you want. And the network access. So these are the ones where you set the IP address to the users or the servers that want to access Mongo database. So if they're not indicated here, you won't, that IP address will not be able to access your database. So make sure your current IP address is accessible. And if you go back to database, you can see browse collections. This will be where all your data will be once we add it. So we're going to go back to database and we're going to hit connect. And in this connect, we're going to do connect your application. And we're just going to copy this and we're going to go back. And we're going to create a new file called .env. Actually, this should be inside the server. 
and in here I'm gonna write Mongo actually let me close this underscore URL and I'm gonna put in quotations the thing we just copied and under the password we're gonna write the password and in this one I don't really care about this so ABC13 that's my password for this particular user so it's the user's password user name and their password not the mongodb username and password and then after that i'm going to write port and i'm going to say this is port 5001 and in here we're also going to do one more thing i'm going to add a file called dot git ignore and we need this so that when we push this folder up to the repo or on GitHub, we do not want to push up the ENV file or the node modules file. This needs to be secret. And node modules is just too bulky. So usually you have the server install it. So we don't want to have that over there. And so in the dot git ignore, I'm going to write, I'm going to write slash node underscore modules, and then dot env. So we ignore those. So we're going to save that. One last thing before we set up our Mongo code, we're going to go to our package JSON, and we're going to add a few things to this page. So if I go under main index.js, I'm going to write type colon module comma. So this will allow us to use import statements. So these import statements will be used by this, or this will provide us the ability to use those. And then under scripts, we're going to write a few commands. So we're going to do, we're going to set this as start, like so. And when we hit start, we're going to run the command index node index.js, like so. So we're not going to use node min for start, but for dev, we're going to use node min index.js and the reason why nodemin is a live server reload so anytime we save the server is going to restart but we only want that to be doing that for our development server but when we actually deploy we're just going to have them run node so we don't really want to use nodemin on the actual server so we're going to save that and with that i'm going to close this and what i'm going to do i'm just going to run the server so i'm going to write npm run dev and we just want to make sure there's no errors. Okay, so it started and it just completely exited because there's no server being run. But as long as there's no errors, we're good to go. So there is no error. And from here, we're going to be setting up our index.js and we're going to be setting up our mongoose finally. So I'm going to say mongoose setup. And in here, I'm going to say const port is equal to process.env.port. So process.env allows us to access the environment variables that we just created earlier, and we are able to access that. And if that doesn't exist, so sometimes it might not exist, we're going to set this to 9,000. So this is a backup port if needed. And then from here, I'm going to do mongoose.connect, and we're going to connect to our mongo URL using process.env. And inside this, we're going to pass in a few setup parameters. So use new URL parser. We're going to set that to true. We're going to set use unified topology to be true. And then from here, we're going to do dot den. I'm going to hit app dot listen to the port. Yeah port like so. I'm going to say console log as a callback function server port and we're going to put in curly braces for the port number that we just use. And then after that we're going to do dot catch pass an error And we're going to do console.log. I'm going to pass in the error message. 
and we're going to say did not connect. And we're going to save that. And now I'm going to try to run it again. And now we see the server port running. So it doesn't automatically stop. So now we are now connected to Mongoose and the Mongo database. Now with this, we have our backend set up. Now, normally I would go and start writing backend code, but we are going to build the application feature by feature. So I'm going to go and develop a certain page. I'm going to start with the APIs and then I'm going to go and do the front end as well and do this based on each feature. So we're going to start doing this via building the front end first. So I'm going to go out, create a new terminal. I'm going to do CD dot dot so I can go out of it. And here I'm going to run NPX create react app. I'm going to run I'm going to call this client. I'm going to run this installation, start create react app, which is going to be for the front end. So we have a react boilerplate. It'll help us set it up very easily and we'll be able to get, we'll be good to go from there. All right, before we go in and install some front end packages, we're going to go to the extension section and we're going to install some VS code extensions. So the first one I want to mention is going to be called ES7 plus React Redux, React Native Snippets. This is something you guys have been recommending me and I really do like it. So keep up the good suggestions. This is very good for writing boilerplate code for React components and then also other components that you can probably use is going to be prettier. So if you don't have prettier, this is very good for code formatting. It'll auto format your code. Another one will be Tailwind Shades. We're going to be using this one. Um, this is going to automatically generate some colors based on a color you provide it. And then finally, oh, I did not mean to disable that Turbo Console Log. So this is something that allows you to, if you highlight something, it's going to automatically write a console log for you. So these are some VS Code extensions that I recommend you can use. If you don't want to, feel free to disregard it. So having said that, we're going to be installing some packages. So I'm going to write npmi in here, and we're going to do React Redux. And make sure, actually, sorry we have to go into our client folder. So go CD client, make sure you're in that particular folder and we're going to run some installation packages. So I'm going to do npmi react redux for state management and we're going to do redux js slash toolkit. So I highly recommend if you're using redux, nowadays you should always use toolkit with it to make it make your life easier. We're going to use another package called React Date Picker. So this will give us a date picker range that we're going to be using later. Then we're going to use React Router DOM at six. So this will allow us to use React Router. Then we're going to do mi slash mui slash material at emotion slash React at emotion slash styled at mui icons material at MUI slash X data grid. So these are all material UI uh, packages that we're going to be using. And then we're going to have to add the icons as well as data grid, which is going to be the table that we're going to be using. And then we're going to add a number of charts for our, or chart packages for our charts. So Nevo slash bar, and then at Nevo slash geo at Nevo slash pi. And we're going to run that. We're going to wait for that to finish. And once that's finished, go to your client folder. You can click on package.json. I want to make sure that you guys absolutely have the right version for this one. If your React date picker is at a further version, there might be conflicts. So if that ever comes to be, do at npmi react date picker at 4.8.0. So if the date picker doesn't work, make sure you do that version because this is the version that I'll be using. Most of the other packages will probably be fine because of how much support they have. They're not going to break it on you, but this one is probably less supported. So this is the one that I would be worried about breaking. And then finally, we're going to go 
and we're going to create a, another file called jsconfig.json. And in here, and in here, I'm going to write a setting. I'm going to put brackets. I'm going to do compiler options. And in this bracket, we're going to do base URL. I'm going to put source inside. And I'm going to do include. I'm going to pass in source, not in curly braces, but normal brackets source like this. So this will allow us to have absolute imports starting from the source directory. I'll show you what we mean or what I mean by that later on. So we're going to save that. All right, from here, I'm going to close the terminal. I already turned off the server, so you can turn off the server for now. I'm going to close that terminal and I'm going to go into our source in our client folder and I'm going to delete a few files. So I'm going to delete setup test, report web vitals, logo SVG, app.test.js, and then app.css. So I'm going to delete these guys. And then in here, I'm going to go to index.css, delete everything. We don't need any of that. Inside our app.js, I'm going to delete all the header stuff. I'm going to change the class name to a lowercase just for convention purposes. And then I'm going to delete all the imports over here. And I'm going to go to index.js. We don't need the report web vitals as well. And we're going to remove the import from there as well. All right, from here, I'm going to just close all these tabs. So we have it clean, close up the server. We're going to go to our source directory on our front end, which is the client. And we're going to create a new file and we're going to call this theme.js. So now I've covered this quite a bit. I've done the same format in terms of how my theme is set up. But let me show you how I generate the color schemes. But I did some manual adjustments for this because it kind of needed it. But basically, this is a color that's like in between black and white. And what I'll do, I'm going to use Tailwind Shades. You can go and see this is the key binding, command K, command G. Other ones can be control K, com control G. Make sure you hit command K and then command G again. Make sure you hit the command key twice and it'll automatically generate a number of shades based on this initial color. And that's how I will be getting the colors for this. <clears throat> there are three colors that I'm using, which is going to be number 21295C, which is a slightly bluish color, and a yellow color, which is going to be number FFD11 or 166. Now what I'm going to do, I'm just going to go and copy the theme file because there's going to be a lot and I don't want to spend too much time, but I'll explain everything that I do. So in the link in the description below, I have a link to the theme file and you can just copy and paste everything and that'll include all of it. The reason why I'm not doing this manually here is because I added a lot of colors and I just so manually adjusted, meaning I added these manually because I needed a few more colors for it to look nice. So we have primary, we have secondary. So I adjusted a few colors here and there. And then what I did, I created my own custom function so this basically reverses the token colors automatically. So basically it grabs this and it's just going to reverse the colors from a thousand. Like this will be zero. This will be 10. This will be 50. So it basically reverses the number. That's because we want to do that for our light theme. So this is going to represent our dark theme. Then we can reverse it. We'll show that for the light theme. And then from here, what I did with the theme settings, this is for material UI. You need to set it up like this. You're going to have a return with palette mode, mode equals dark. And then we set tokens.primary. So I'm going to just copy the entire thing of tokens.primary, like right here. So all of this gets pasted into here so we can use all of those colors. And we need to set the main and the light color. So we use the light color if we need to, and this will adjust the colors based on the settings we set. And then we have secondary, neutral, and background. 
and we're going to be doing something similar for the light mode. We just have a few manual overrides like this. These are kind of different. Same with mine light, things like that. And then we have typography. We're going to use a Google font called Inter, which we'll add shortly. And then we're going to do font size for each one. So we can specify the H1 font size, H2, H3, H4 as the default settings. So this is pretty much all of this will represent our theme and we'll be using this throughout. And one last thing to note in our source directory off screen, I added this assets folder. You can find this image below. Now all this is, is just a image profile image that you can place. It can be any picture. It doesn't really matter. So you can just, we just need that one image. And then from here, we're going to go to server. I've also done this off screen as well but you can go to the repo. I have a link in the description below, but this is going to be a file that contains a lot, a lot of mock data. So we're gonna have all of this data that we can use for our database so we can pretend like we have lots and lots of user data and we can show how our database is gonna be set up, which I'll go cover, not now, but very soon. But let's go back to the front end. And before we finish setting up, our theme, we're going to go to Google Fonts and we're going to grab the font that we want to use, which is going to be Inter. So we're going to go to Inter, we're going to click this, and we're going to go down and we want a few different weights. So we want 400. So we're going to, actually, let me remove everything that I already have. So I'm going to get 400, 600, and 700. And then we're going to hit at import and we're gonna copy and paste everything that we have. And we're gonna go into our index.css and we're just gonna paste it there. And while I'm here, let me just set up like the default settings. So I'm gonna put HTML body root dot app. And we're gonna make sure everything's height of 100% width of 100% font family of enter and we're gonna say sans serif. So these will be our default CSS settings that we can use. And then from here, we're gonna be setting up Redux and Redux Toolkit. The reason why I'm setting up Redux Toolkit is so that we can set our mode, which is basically a dark mode or a light mode. We store that state into Redux so we can access that globally. So we're gonna be adding that to Redux. So we're gonna be setting up our Redux state. So I'm gonna create a new folder. I'm gonna call this state. I'm gonna pass in a file called index.js. In here, I'm gonna do import. I'm gonna make sure I close this. I'm gonna zoom in so you guys can see. I'm gonna do create slice. And again, I'm using the IntelliSense for better help. And I'm gonna do const initial state I'm going to pass in mode and it's going to start with the dark mode because dark mode always looks nice. And we're going to do export const global slice and I'm going to pass in create slice. And I'm going to say name. This will be called global because this one is just going to be global state. And we're going to say initial state. So we pass in initial state over here and we're going to have reducers and we're going to hit set mode. And I'm going to set, actually, this needs to be a function. So I'm going to pay state over here, arrow function. And I'm going to do state dot mode is equal to if state dot mode is equal to light. We're going to set this to dark. If not, we're going to set it we're going to keep it as light. So basically what this is doing is we're basically creating a function, a function that will allow us to change the mode from dark to light. Now, people always talk about these buzzwords and Redux, like reducers and actions and things like that. It's much better to think of these as just functions, functions that change the global state. So meaning state that exists everywhere. And then from here, we're just going to export const set mode. So we have access to this function. 
global slice dot actions and then we're going to export default global slice dot reducer i'm going to save that and then from here i'm going to close log this i'm going to go to our index.js not the state one but the index.js that lives in our source directory and inside here i'm going to be importing configure store from Reux JS toolkit. I'm also going to import global reducer from state like so. And by the way, the reason why we can just import state without doing something like this is because of our package JSON configuration or JS config configuration with base URL as source because we are starting from source, we can just say state. So it's much more convenient to do that. And I'm also going to import provider from React Redux. And with these three things, we're going to set up our store. Actually, this doesn't even need to do an export. You can say const store is equal to configure store. And we're going to pass in reducer. And we're going to do global and global reducer, like so. And then from here, I'm gonna do react.strict mode. I'm gonna pass in provider with store as one of the attributes, and we're gonna pass the store we just created. I'm gonna close this app with the provider. And that basically is our Redux toolkit boilerplate. And then from here, I'm gonna go into our app.js file and we're going to be adding a few lines of code. So what we're going to do is we're going to import right above everything. We're going to do import CSS base line. And we're going to import theme provider. And we're going to import this from at MUI slash, oops, MUI slash material. And then we're going to import create theme. Actually, it might be better if I do create theme like this. Yeah. So IntelliSense will be able to pick it up like that. Then we're going to import theme settings that we've created. And then from here, we're going to do, we're going to create const mode. And we're going to set use selector. And that's coming from React Redux. So we've got to make sure we import that. I'm going to pass in state. And we are going to grab state.global.mode. So this is a way to grab the state that we just created in the state file over here. So this is a way to grab the mode because it's accessible everywhere. And we're going to pass in const theme. And we're going to use use memo. Make sure you import that with the IntelliSense. I'm going to say create theme. And we're going to use the theme settings to pass in mode. Now, I know this looks like a lot of crazy stuff, but it's actually pretty simple. It's all in the documentation. We're basically grabbing the state, so the global mode. We're passing it into the create theme function that we've created. We're passing in theme settings with the mode. So we know that in our theme file, we have, we go down over here, we have our theme settings. We're passing in the mode into this, and we're using create theme to configure what's necessary for Material UI. And that is going to be what's going to be in here. So we're going to do theme provider. We're passing in theme over here like this. And finally, we're going to pass in CSS baseline. So just to recap, this is just to set up Material UI. Material UI has a lot of documentation, but this is probably the easiest setup that you can do for theme and also provide a light and dark mode. So we have the mode stored in our state so we can use the state information anytime we want. We just need to make sure we pass it into the create theme function 
with both the logic for the theme, which is all in the documentation, and we pass it into the theme provider. Now the CSS baseline is just an extra thing. So basically it resets, it's like a CSS reset. It resets everything in terms of the CSS, making your code have more CSS defaults automatically. And it's pretty recommended. Okay, and there is one mistake I actually made for a create theme, this should be slash styles. So from here, we're gonna be now be able to create our nav bar. To set up our nav bar, we're gonna need React Router DOM for our routes that we want to create so that the nav bar we can navigate. So inside div, I'm gonna create, I'm gonna fetch something called browser router from React Router DOM. So make sure you use IntelliSense to grab it and making sure it's importing. And I'm gonna grab and uh, wrap theme provider with browser router. And then from here, inside the theme provider and below CSS baseline, I'm gonna create routes, plural. Make sure I import that and close that. And inside our routes, I'm gonna create a singular route. Make sure you import that as well. And we're gonna pass in element and we're gonna pass in a component called layout component. So this is a component that we're not gonna import from one of the third party libraries. This is a component that we will create. And what this is doing for the element is that any route within this particular component, it will have the layout component as the main parent. So for example, we're gonna have the nav bar and the sidebar existing on every single page. And that's what the layout component will have. And so every route that we create in here is going to have the nav bar and the sidebar. And we're gonna start with a route and we're gonna set path for the default and we're gonna say element and we're gonna navigate. And this is another thing we're importing. We're gonna navigate to slash dashboard and we're gonna set replace. Actually, that should be, yeah, that actually, that's correct. Replace, and I'm gonna do self-closing, and then unclose the route, like that. And actually, this should be self-closing. We don't need to wrap it. So we're gonna have a path that will navigate to the dashboard if we land on this page. And we're also gonna create one more route, and we're gonna say path equals slash dashboard like so, and we're gonna say element, and we're gonna pass in dashboard, like that. So I know this is a lot going on, but what's happening is that if we go to the default homepage, we're gonna be navigating to the dashboard route, and we're gonna render the dashboard component. This is so that when we land on the homepage, it's gonna take us to the dashboard. This is to emulate what we would do if you signed in and it's gonna redirect you to a different page, which is dashboard. But we won't have any login for simplicity purposes, so this is just kind of a way to show that happening. So the first thing I wanna do is create the dashboard component. I'll come back to the layout component, but let's handle the dashboard. So I'm gonna do import dashboard from scenes slash dashboard. So we have not created this component, but it will be in the scenes folder. So in the source directory, I'm gonna create a new folder called scenes. And then inside the scenes, we're gonna create a folder called dashboard. And inside the dashboard component or folder, I'm gonna create a file called index.jsx. Now with this, we can use the VS Code extension that everyone recommended, and we can write RFCE. And that will automatically create the component that we want to use. And we're gonna just call this dashboard like that. So again, keep up the great suggestions. I really am fond of what you guys recommended. So with that, we have our dashboard component. So we're gonna go back to app.js, and now we can now create the layout component. So I'm gonna import layout 
from scenes slash layout, like so. So I'm going to go to scenes. I'm going to create a new folder, and we're going to call it layout. And inside the layout folder, I'm going to create a new file called index.jsx. And again, we're going to use we're going to use the shortcut RFCE, and we're going to call this layout. So with that, before I go and create the nav bar, I want to go and open up our terminal. And I want to actually just run the server, make sure we don't have any errors. So right now, what we're going to expect to see is just going to be the layout component. We're not going to see the dashboard because right now we don't have a component called outlet that's going to show everything else in here. And I'll show you what that means later. But for now, we are expecting to see the layout. So let's go open up localhost and we're going to see layout. So this is what we expect. Everything's working. So make sure you don't have any errors right now. And then from here, what we're going to do, all right? And then from there, I'm going to close the terminal. Now I can go back. I'm actually going to create one component before I start this. And this will help with setting up layouts and Flexbox. So I'm going to create a file called flex between JSX. Now, if you've seen my other tutorials, I use, I use this quite often. It's very handy to have, but we're going to create a, we're going to create a style component. So style component. So style components is a way for us to reuse styles or CSS in a component like manner. So if I do styled, I'm going to import from MUI system. I'm going to import box from MUI material. And what we're going to do is we're going to pass in some CSS property. And this is going to be display of flex, justify content of space between and line items center. So this is one set of styled components that I use quite frequently and it shortens the amount of code we have to write. I don't use style components too often, but this one is very handy to do. So I'm going to create that. And then from here, I'm going to go to our layout and we're going to start from here. On this page, I'm going to close this. I'm going to import a number of things. So I'm going to import use state. Actually, this could be on the same line. We're going to do use state like so. I'm going to close that. I'm going to import box and use media query from at MUI slash material. I'm going to import something called outlet. So this is the thing I mentioned earlier from React Router DOM. So this will allow us to have those template layouts. I'm going to import use selector from React Redux. And then finally, I'm going to import a component that I have not created yet, which is import navbar from components slash navbar. All right, I'm going to save it. So from here, inside our layout, I'm just going to erase everything and create a box. And inside this box, I'm going to give it a property called width 100% and height of 100%. So if you haven't seen my tutorials or if you're not familiar with Material UI, Material UI has a component called box that allows you to pass in properties as if they're CSS properties. So you can say with, you can do display, things like that. Any kind of property for CSS, you can pass it into the box component. You cannot do this for all components. So the normal syntax normally would be SX and then you pass in your CSS prop like display, flex like that. That's the normal way to do it. But for box, you can pass it in like that. I really like it because it's very convenient, um, but it's up to you how you want to set this up. And then from here, I'm going to create another box in here. And inside this box, I'm going to get a nav bar like so. 
and it will be self-closing. And then below this, we're going to create outlet component. So now I was hinting on what this is, this is, but basically layout will set up the box. So nav bar will exist on every single page and the outlet is going to represent whatever components is underneath. So the layout, this is a child. For example, if it's on the dashboard page, we're going to render this component where this is located, where this outlet is located. So that's what this layout and the outlet is basically doing. And then from here, I can now go to components. I'm going to create a file called navbar JSX. I'm going to use RFCE to create the layout. So navbar like so. And then from here, I'm going to import a number of things. So I'm going to import light. Actually, let me close this. Let make sure I get the IntelliSense. So light mode outlined. I'm going to import dark mode outlined. And later on, I've already set this up, but menu, we want to set this as menu icon because we're also going to import menu from a different package. And then we're going to import search settings outlined and arrow drop down outlined. I'm going to save it to format and everything is going to come from icons material. So these are all the icons that we're going to be using for our nav bar. Then we're going to import flex between so components we created. I'm just going to change this to components like that to be cleaner. Now I'm going to import use dispatch from react redux. And then I'm going to import set mode. So this is the function that we created earlier that will allow us to change from light mode to dark mode. And then finally, I'm going to import profile image from assets slash profile.jpg. So we're importing the one image that we created. And then we're going to import, actually, we're going to go up here where React is, put a comma, and we're going to do use state like so. We're going to save it. And then inside here, I'm going to do const dispatch equals use dispatch. And we're going to invoke it. We're going to do const theme equals use theme. And make sure you get it from MUI material for invoking that. So you should see this import coming in. Okay, with that set up, I'm going to go and highlight the div. I'm going to create a component called app bar, and this should be imported from material UI. So this will help us set up our nav navigation bar. Inside our app bar, we're going to add some styling. So this is where I'm doing SX like this. So we can set up some of our properties. So here I'm going to do position. I'm going to set this to static so it doesn't move. We're going to set background of none because by default app bar has a background, but we want no background. And we're going to also get rid of the box shadow. And then inside our app bar, we're going to do toolbar. I'm going to pass in MUI material and inside here, I'm going to do SX justify content space between. And I'm going to close this toolbar, make sure I imported it right there. And over here, I'm going to call this the left side. So right now, what we're building is going to be looking like this. If you see the app bar, this is the completed build. We have an app bar. The app bar will exist from here to here. So this is the sidebar. The app bar stops here. So if I open up a I'm using Brave, but Chrome extension also has this it's called Pesticide. It allows you to see the layout of all your components. And in here, what we have is an entire div that goes extends all the way. And we're going to have two sections. So this is going to be a div 
And inside this div, we're going to have Flexbox as well. Same with over here. We're going to have Flexbox rendering these three things. And from there, we have the left side. We're going to create the left side first. All right. So if you take a look, this is our completed build. We have an app bar with two sections. So this side and this side. So if I toggle this extension, I have something called Pesticide. It exists on Chrome and Brave. I think it probably exists on Firefox, but I'm not entirely sure. But it's going to show you all the div layout. It's very useful to look at it and visualize. So over here, this is an entire div. And this div is going to have a flex with space between, meaning we have a div, like this entire guy over here is a div. And this guy, entire guy over here is another div. And we're doing space between these two items. And then flex also has something called align items, meaning it centers it vertically. So this is centered vertically up here with these items. And that's why we have flex between the component that I create. It made, makes it so much easier to use it and allows us to center both vertically and do space between each item. For the toolbar, we already have something that does space between. So that represents these two guys right here. That's already doing the toolbar. But the left side is also going to have its own flex between. So we're going to do that. And then here, we're going to start with the icon button. And I'm going to set on click. And we're going to set this to console log open sidebar open close sidebar so now we have not created this yet but we will once we create the sidebar so here we're going to set menu icon and then we're also going to do flex between and inside the flex between i'm going to add some properties background color and here i'm going to use our theme color so theme.palette dot background dot alt so if you remember the themes we set this is how you can use them and then we're going to do border radius and we're going to set this to nine pixel i'm going to set a gap of three rem so this is a property many people don't use but gap is pretty new it allows us to put gaps between each item so you don't have to go to each item and put margin right some 3rem you can just put gap on the parent component and it gives you a gap between each item it makes it very convenient and i'm going to set the padding and in here we're going to do a shorthand which is just p and we're going to do another shorthand which is 0 0.rem rem 1.5 rem meaning we only have two properties or two uh, values so if you only have two values for either padding or margin this represents top and bottom. This represents left and right. So padding of 0.1 REM top and bottom, 1.5 REM left and right. And then we're going to use input base. And that's going to be imported from Material UI. If you saw that IntelliSense pop up. And we're going to do placeholder search dot 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 flash. And we're going to do a closing tag. And then from here, I'm going to do icon button again and inside here I'm going to create the search icon like that let me save it and let's make sure everything's working we have the items perfect everything is here so this should just console log we're going to have the other items over there and as you can see we have dashboard so we no longer have the layout we have the dashboard so our outlet is basically working and then from here we're going to create the right side And in here, I'm going to create flex between, give it a gap of 1.5 REM. Inside the right side, I'm going to create icon button with an on click. And this one is going to be from dark mode to light mode. So this will trigger the function 
we created, which is set mode. So this, when this button gets clicked, we're going to switch from dark mode to light mode or light mode to dark mode. And the way we do this is we're going to do theme dot palette dot mode. And if it's dark, we're going to give it the dark mode outlined icon that we saw. And we're going to do font size of 25 pixels. So this represents the size. I know it's weird. It's a font size, not just size, but font size represents the icon size. And then I'm going to finish up the ternary operator. And in here, I'm going to do light mode outlined. I'm going to copy the SX that we just created, pass it in here. And we're going to have our theme button for it to work. I'm going to finish this off and I'll demo it real quick. I'm going to create one more button and this is going to be the settings outlined. I'm going to close it like so. Now, if you see, we have our app bar going all the way, our light and dark mode and settings. So if I click it, now you can see we have light and dark mode already. So that's perfect. And you can see the icons also changing. So the next thing we're going to be building is going to be the sidebar on the left side. We can open and close like this. We can go to different pages over here with different icons and hover effects. And we'll be able to see all of these as well. And each of these will take us to different pages. So from here, if I go over here, I'm going to import sidebar. And these, this is a component we have not created. So I'm going to do components sidebar like so. And then from here, I'm going to create a variable called is non mobile. And we're going to do use media query. And I'm going to pass in min width of 600 pixel. I'm going to close that. So what this is going to do is it's going to give us a true or false Boolean depending on whether this minimum width is achieved on their screen. So if it's a mobile screen, we're going to have this is non mobile is going to be false. And if it's on a desktop screen, this will be true. And the next thing we're going to do, we're going to create a state and we're going to say is sidebar open. And as a secondary, we're going to do is side set is sidebar open. And we're going to set that use state to true. So this is going to give us another Boolean so that we can determine if the sidebar is open. And just a note, I always love putting is as a prefix to any variable we have, because that makes it very easy for if you're working on a team or anyone else who looks at a variable and if it's prefixed with the is, now you Im immediately know that it's a Boolean. Then I'm going to put a display over here and I'm going to set is non mobile. And we're going to set it to flex if it's on desktop screen and block if it's mobile. And then finally, from here, I'm going to add the component sidebar. And inside this, I'm going to put is non mobile. Actually, let me make sure you don't have a capital over there. And we're going to set this is non mobile over here. And then we're going to set drawer width of 250 pixel. And I'm going to set is side bar open is sidebar open like that. And I'm going to set is side bar open set is side bar open. I'm going to close the sidebar and then we'll have that over there. And then I'm going to copy is sidebar open. I'm going to pass that into navbar so we can have the functionality of opening the sidebar and closing it with that menu icon that I clicked earlier. And with that, I can go to components and I can create a new file. I'm going to call this sidebar JSX. Okay. So in our sidebar component, we're going to start with our template. So RFCE. And we're going to have sidebar over there. 
and I'm going to import a number of items. So I'm going to import box, divider, drawer, icon button, list, list item, list item button, list item icon, list item text, typography, and use theme. I know these are a lot of items that we're importing, but they should help us build this pretty quickly. And we're going to import this from MUI material. And then from here, I'm going to import a number of icons. So all the icons you see, so there's going to be quite a few. I'm going to do settings outlined, Chevron left, oops, Chevron right outlined, home outlined. Not exactly sure why it keeps creating the JSX format, but shopping cart outlined, groups to outlined, receipt long outlined, public outlined, point of sale outlined, today outlined, calendar month outlined, admin panel settings outlined, trending up outlined, pie chart outlined. And this is all going to be from at MUI slash icons material. I know these are a lot of things that we're importing. If you really need, you can go to the specific page on the repo and just copy this if you really need to. Otherwise, it's just going to give you an error and then you can just follow back and trace the error of which ones you maybe typed incorrectly. And then I'm going to import use effect from React as well as use state. Then I'm going to import use location from React Router DOM as use navigate. Promise we're almost done. We're going to import flex between from the component we created and then import profile image from assets slash profile dot JPEG. All right. So in our sidebar, we're going to do a number of items. We're going to import Actually, let's add the properties first. So we're going to import the drawer with is sidebar open, set is sidebar open, and is non-mobile. So these are all the properties we passed in from the layout page, and we're going to be using a lot of those. And then we're going to pass in the const path name, and we're going to grab this from use location. So this will be used to grab the path that we're currently at. And we can use that in our sidebar. And then we're going to use const active, set active, and we're going to use state with an empty string. So this will determine which one we're currently on, what page we are currently at. And then finally, we're going to do const navigate so we can use navigate from React Router DOM so that we can navigate to other pages. And then we're going to have const theme to grab the theme and colors. And the final thing we want to do is we're going to do use effect. And we're going to set active to path name dot substring one. So what this will allow us to do is anytime we have the path name changing. We are going to set the active value to the current page. So anytime our URL changes, we're going to set the active to the correct URL. So this will keep track of the URL that we currently have, and we will use that to determine what page we are on.
Okay. And then in here, we're going to set box. I'm going to close that. And I'm going to give this a component of nav. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a drawer component for material UI. So if I go to the material UI docs, they have a react drawer. So we're going to be using this to show a drawer component. Now they have a lot of different options, so you can have different variations, but the one we are going to be using is going to be the persistent drawer like this. So our goal is to have something that opens up when we click it and we can close it. So the way you can grab the code if you ever want to is just open this guy up and you can copy and paste. That's a little kind of crazy, but we'll just go through the steps of writing this. So here I'm going to set is sidebar open. So we want to make sure this Boolean is true. Then we will show the drawer component that we imported. Let me make sure we close that. And over here, I'm going to say open is going to align with is sidebar open. So this is always going to be true no matter what, because we already have that Boolean over here, but we just need to pass it in there as well. So we're going to say on close is equal to a function side is set is sidebar open. And we're going to set this to false like so. And we're going to say this variant needs to be persistent. And then we're going to set the anchor to be left. So that positions it on the left side. And then finally, we need to add some custom CSS. So I'm going to set width is equal to the drawer width that I set before. And I'm also going to do some custom CSS, modifying some of the CSS that they already have. So at MUI drawer paper. We're going to set the color to theme.palette.secondary200. We're going to set the background color, theme.palette.background.alt. We're going to set box sizing to border box, then border width to is non mobile question mark. This is going to be zero and two pixel. For some reason, I keep capitalizing this O. Make sure it's not. And then we're going to set the width to drawer width. All right, so that closes that. These closes this. And that should be our drawer component. Let me make sure we have a closing because we're going to put something inside. Now, just FYI, to get this CSS property, this is the one downside of Material UI. If you ever need to customize it, you can open up the terminal and you can go and see into the drawer width. So if you ever want to change, you'd have to kind of look up you have to look up the CSS class and see which one you want to change. So once you have MUI paper, you can probably change MUI paper root or you have to MUI draw root depending on what you're looking for. So it's, sometimes it's kind of a guessing game. In this case, we have the MUI draw paper. This is what we're modifying. And that's how I grab it because this is a drawer. Then you do and MUI draw paper. So we're targeting that particular CSS. This is the one downside of CSS in Material UI. If you really want to change their components, it kind of becomes a little bit annoying, but it's not that big of a deal. Moving on from there, we're going to add a box. We're going to set width of 100%. And inside this box, I'm going to set the margin of 1.5 
REM, 2 REM, 2 REM, and 3 REM. So again, this is going to be a shorthand. This margin, if you have four values in there, this is determining from clockwise top, right, bottom, left. So this is a very convenient shorthand, so you don't always have to do margin left, margin right, margin top, things like that. So it makes it in one go. Then we can do flex between, and we're going to give it a color of theme dot palette dot secondary dot main. And then inside this flex between, I'm going to hit a box and in this is going to be display of flex and we're going to do align items center and we're going to give this a gap of 0 0.5 0 .5 REM. Close that and in here I'm going to set typography give it a variant of H4 a font weight of bold I'm going to close that. I'm going to say Ecom Vision. So that will be our logo and title. And below this, I'm going to do is non mobile. And we're going to say we are going to open up an icon button on click. And we're going to set set is sidebar open. To the opposite is sidebar open. And we're going to pass in chevron left. So essentially, if it's on the mobile screen and the menu sidebar is up, we have a button that we can close this menu for mobile screens so it doesn't get in the way. And then from here below this box, we're going to do a list component. And inside here, I'm going to be creating each of the nav items. So before we do that, I want to create a list of nav items above here. And then we're going to map through and loop through this nav items to create each of those components. So I'm going to do const nav items is equal to an array. And we're going to have text of dashboard. And we're going to pass in an icon of home outlined. And we're going to be doing this for every single one. So I'm going to do a comma, pasting a lot of these. And we're just going to adjust a lot of these as we go. So going back to text, we're going to say client facing. So this one is going to be null. So this is just going to be the topic title and the category. So if you take a look over here, we have client facing sales and management as the titles for each subsection. And so we're just going to identify those with an icon of null. From here, I'm going to set this as products. I'm going to set this as shopping cart outlined. Below this is going to be customers. We're going to do group, groups to outlined. From here, I'm going to do transactions. And I'm going to give this receipt long outlined. And making sure I don't capitalize that R. Here, I'm going to do geography. And I'm going to pass in public outlined. And then this one is going to be sales. So this one's going to be a title. This should be a null value. And then below this, this is going to be overview. This is going to be point of sale outlined. And I'm going to have daily. And I'm going to do today outlined. And then we need to create a couple more. I'm going to paste some more over here. I think that should be enough. 
if I can find it. Okay. And then we're going to have monthly. I'm going to set this to calendar month outlined. I'm going to have breakdown with a pie chart outlined. And then below this is going to be management. And this should be null. This will be admin. This should be admin panel settings outlined. And we're just going to have one more. And this will be performance. And this should be trending up outlined. There's quite a few lists, but once we have that, this should be pretty simple. So we're going to go back down to where we have the list and we're going to write, we're going to loop through the nav items and create a component for each one. So I'm going to do nav items dot map and inside it, I'm going to destructure grabbing the text and the icon value. And I'm going to do an arrow function. And I'm going to set if icon doesn't exist. So if it's a null, we're going to do something separate for this one. So we're going to do return. And I'm going to give it a typography with a key of text. Because if anytime you make a list, you need a key. And we're going to set SX is equal to margin of 2.25 REM, 0, 1 REM, and 3 REM. Again, this is a shorthand with the three values, or four values, I mean. And inside this, we're going to place the text. And it seems like I am missing a parens right there. So that should be good right there. Correct. So this will take care of the instances where it, you have the icon as null. So that will represent the title. And then right here, we're going to do const lowercase text. So we want to just do text dot to lowercase because we want the lowercase version of this. And below this, I'm going to have a return. So this will cover the normal scenario where we actually have navigatable icons that we can hover and click. So this is going to be list item. We're going to say key is equal to text again. So we have unique keys for each list item. And we're going to do disable padding. Inside this, I'm going to give it a list item button. And I'm going to give it an on click where I'm going to navigate to slash colon LC text like so. And it seems like I do have some kind of error. I'm going to do set. Actually, let's fix this. All right, that's because this is not even closed. So this should be closed like that. I'm going to save that. And then on the next line, I'm going to hit enter because we want one more thing. We're going to have set active LC text. So let me explain what's happening over here is we're creating a list item button around some text that we will be creating. And when you click on it, we're going to be navigating to that URL through the LC text. So based on the text title of the navigation item, we're going to navigate to that page. And we're also going to set that page as the active version so we can highlight the color. So if you go over here, anytime you click somewhere else, let's say I'm going to customers page. And here, as you can see, we have a slash customers page. So that's where we can take our users. So this, so based on this title, we're going to lowercase it and we're going to take us, we're going to navigate the user to this particular URL. Same thing for the rest of the page. And then from here, I'm going to do list item icon. I'm going to close that and inside. And let me make sure I close that. So we can have prettier automatically format for us. And inside our list item icon, I'm going to style this a little bit. SX is equal to margin left of two REM. 
And we're going to set this to have a color if the active is equal to the current LC text, we're going to change the color of the icon. So based on whether we are on the page that the nav item is clicked on, we are going to change the color of the text. So we're going to give this a theme dot palette dot secondary 200. And we also need to change the color of the button. So we're going to do SX is equal to background color. And we're going to do the same thing. Active equals LC text. And based on that, we're going to give it theme.palette.secondary 300. And it's going to be transparent when it's not. And I actually spelled background color incorrectly. So background color like so. And I'm going to give it a color of active LC text, and then we're going to say theme.palette. Actually, it'll be exactly the same as this. So actually, let me just copy this entire thing, and we're going to replace that. And actually, I want this to be secondary 100 to give it the proper color. Don't worry, we're almost done. And then after this, we'll just be checking if everything is correct. So here, we're going to actually pass the icon inside the list item icon. And then below this, we're going to do list item text. We're going to the primary of text within. And below this, I'm going to do active is equal to LC text. And I'm going to give it and give an icon with a chevron right outlined. SX is equal to margin left auto. And we're going to close this. And with that, we're going to open up our terminal. I'm going to go into our client and I'm going to run our application. And as you can see, we have a slight typo outlined. So let me close this shopping cart should be like that. Let's save it. Let's take a look at one more. And we did spell that incorrectly as well over here outlined. Let's save it. Make sure we don't have any other errors. So we're going to go back. And now you can see we have our sidebar. So now if you go to any other page, we're not going to see anything because right now we have not configured this page. But once we do, everything should be working. So we're going to next do handle this. This right now doesn't do anything. That's because we have not set the configuration. But aside from that, the layout is, or the sidebar is working as expected. So we're going to go back to nav bar and inside the nav bar, I'm going to go down or actually go up to our nav bar and we're going to grab the properties that we passed in. So it's going to be is sidebar open and then set is sidebar open like that. And we're going to go down to where we have the left side and where we added the console log, we're going to change this to set is side bar open. And we're going to set is sidebar open like that. So that when we click on it, we can now open it and close it like that. Perfect. Now, normally you can do animations to make this a little transition smoother, but I want this particular application to focus more on the back end. So we're not going to worry about that. And also, oh, let me check one more thing. So if you open this up, we go to this screen. Now over here, we have this little Chevron icon so you can open and close depending on that. So there you go. So the next thing we want to add is going to be this user information. We want to be able to grab information about the user by sending an ID to the back end and the back end will send us the information about the user. So to do that, we're going to go into, actually, let me close all these tabs first to clear up everything. And we're going to go to our state. I'm going to go to index and I'm going to be adding user ID. And this is going to be kind of a long ID. So make sure you 
write this correctly. So 6370-1CC1F0323. Nine B seven F seven zero 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 E. So this is a user ID that I have in the mock data that I put in the back end. So we're just gonna grab this particular user with their ID. And we're just gonna assume that the user has logged in and has the user ID. So we're not gonna do the login authentication to keep it short but we're gonna be placing this user ID and grabbing the user information. So now to do this, we're gonna go now to the back end, and we're gonna to go to our routes, we're gonna to go to general. And in here, we're gonna be creating our user ID. So from here, I'm gonna do some imports. So I'm gonna import get user from dot dot slash controllers slash general dot js. And then below our router, we're going to do router.get and we're going to do user slash user slash ID and we're going to do get user. So this will be a function coming from controllers. And note that there is going to be a param, so this is where we will pass in the ID for the user. Now before we write the controllers, I'm going to go to models, I'm going to create a new file we're going to call this user.js. So this is going to be a schema that we will create for the user that will represent the model of the data. So here I'm going to import mongoose from mongoose and we are going to be creating a mongoose schema in here. So the way we do that is we're going to do const user schema and we're going to say no, new mongoose.schema and in here I'm going to pass in a number of properties and the way this user is going to be modeled is we're going to pass in a name and we're going to give it a type of string so every user is going to have a string name that's required of true with a minimum of two values maximum of a hundred values and then from here, I'm gonna give it an email as well. I'm just gonna copy all of this so we can paste it. This is gonna be type of string, required of true. We're just gonna give it a max of 50. And instead of this being max, we're gonna say unique of true. So the email has to be unique. And then we're gonna give it a password of type and then string required of true and a minimum of five. And then below this, I'm gonna do city. And for simplicity's sake, I'm not gonna add all these validations. So normally when you set up these schemas, you're gonna set up all these validations and things like that. But because we have a lot of models and a lot of things to go through, I'm gonna keep it simple and just give this, each of these guys a string. So you don't need to go through and write all the validation criteria. You can do that on real life applications, but here we're just gonna keep it simple. So I'm gonna give an occupation of string, phone number of string, transactions with an array, a role that's going to be an enum, meaning it's only gonna be one of three values. We're gonna say this is a type of string, but an enum of user, admin, or super admin. So this will determine the role that the user has, and we're gonna give it a default of admin. And finally, below all this, right here on the second closing brackets, we're gonna give it a timestamp of true. So this just gives us automatically created date and updated date as well. And below this, we're gonna do const user is equal to mongoose.model. And we're gonna pass in user with the user schema set up. So this is just kind of how mongoose kind of sets this up. And we're gonna give it an export default of user. 
So again, here, let me just explain everything that's happened. This is a schema that we pass into Mongoose and Mongo database will be using this model to make sure that every time you put in actual data into the database for a particular user, it has to follow this format. So this is like the format or structure, or you can say schema. There's a lot of different words to describe it, but basically the same schema for each data that you're going to put in. So if we want to add a user, they have to have most of these params. So required means they have to have these properties. Whereas if you don't have these properties, these are basically optional. Same with this one. Okay. So this will be our models and we'll go, I'm going to very shortly, I'm going to set up an ERD diagram, which is entity relational diagram. So we're going to be mapping out all the data that we have for each models. And we're going to show, I'm going to show you how you guys connect it and how you guys can think about building these data models. But for now, let's move on, making sure we finish this particular route. So we're going to go to the controller because we still need to create that. So we're going to go to general and we're going to create, we're going to actually don't need to import anything. We're just going to actually, we need to import user from user model. So user from dot, dot slash models slash user dot JS. So in this case, this is different from the front end. We do have to put dot JS. So make sure you add those. And then we're going to do export const get user. And in the get user, we're going to pass in async and we're going to do rec res. So this is typical of express application. We have a rec, which is where you can get the params and the body. And the res is going to be what we use to send back information to the front end or whoever's calling the API. And the way we do this, we're going to have a try catch block. So meaning we will try everything in the try block. And if it doesn't work out, the catch is going to catch any errors and send it back. We're going to say it's res.status 404.json. And we're going to pass in a message of error.message to the front end. In the try block, we're going to do const id is equal to rec.params const user is going to be await user.find by id and we're going to pass in the id value and i'm going to send to the front end if this is true we're going to give it a, a status of 200 and pass in the user so here what's happening is we're going to try to find based on the params of the id we will try to find the user and that will grab us the information. If we get any kind of errors, we're just going to hit this error block. Otherwise, we're going to be sending the user information to the front end. And just FYI, the rec.params, this ID comes from the fact that we have this as our route. So on the front end, we have to pass in the ID in the route to grab the user. All right, so with that, we have the route created, but there's one issue is that right now we have the models and everything, but there's actually no data in our Mongo database yet. So if you go to MongoDB, you can go to collections and we're gonna see, we're gonna retrieve, we don't have any data. So to do that, that's where I have that data file that we created and I told you to copy and paste this. So we're gonna be using this, so if you take go down to data user. We're going to be using this particular information, which has a list of a lot of users, and we're going to inject that into our database. And to do that, we're going to go to our index.js and I'm going to be importing our data. So I'm just going to set data imports as a comment over here. And we're going to import our model first, because we actually need that to inject it. So we're going to say models slash user dot JS. And then also I'm going to import data user from that data file. So we're just grabbing the mock data so we can inject it into our database. 
And then right below dot, dot then, this is where we're going to be adding our information. So I'm going to do user dot insert many data user. So now I'm just going to make a comment just to make sure you guys don't add the data multiple times. Only add data one time so that we do not have any duplicate data. So you're going to run into lots of errors if you try to insert all of this data multiple times. So if I save it right now, the server is not running. So we have the front end server running, but not the back end. So what I'm going to do is npm run dev actually. Actually, this is the client. So I'm going to go back out and we're going to go to CD server and I'm going to run npm run dev like so. And it seems like the user schema is not defined. Here we have a reference error, user schema is not defined. And that's because you need to go back, go to user. This was spelled incorrectly. This needs to be capitalized. We're going to save that and we're going to rerun it, see if it works out this time. We're going to start node index.js. And with that, our port is working correctly. So let's actually go to Mongo database, go back to our databases. We're going to go to browse collections and let's see if the collections have been added. And we can see that there's a user. So this is a good sign. And yep, we have one to 20 of many. So there's quite a few users, but we have the users that we need. And just a note, we have our user ID. So I'm in the state index on the client side. I can grab the user ID and we can actually search for this. So if I do slash underscore ID, and we have to put this in something called object ID, and we pass in the value like so, and we can do enter, and you will see that we have a query result of Shelly, and this is the person that we are looking for. So this is the user we're essentially gonna grab. So with our backend set up, now we are free to start creating our setup to make API calls for the backend. So if you take a look here, I am in the state file with the index.js, and this is our Redux toolkit. But Redux Toolkit Query, which is what we're going to be using to make those API calls, we're going to create a separate file and we're going to set this up a little bit differently, but it's pretty simple. So in our state folder, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call this api.js. In here, I'm going to import a number of items. So I'm going to import create api and then fetch base query from at Redux JS toolkit slash query slash react. And then from here, we can now start writing our API file or API slice is what they call it. We're going to do that with it create API. And the way we set this up is we're going to set a base query of fetch base query like so. And we're going to set the base URL to be process.env.react app base URL. So this is an environment variable we have not created, but I will cover that shortly. So right here is going to be the URL, the base URL that we're going to cover. So right now, the base URL is going to be located at localhost 3001. Actually, let's take a look. So if you go to .env, actually the port is going to be 5001. So this is our base. So you know what? Let's just create our environment variable. And the way we do this in the front end is going to be .env.local. So just FYI, there's a difference between .env and .env.local. For create React app, they want you to do this configuration because that's what git ignore is also ignoring. So .env.local, so we want to use .env.local instead, but essentially it does the same thing. And then we want to set React app base URL, and we're going to set that to HTTP slash slash local host 5001. So I'm going to save that. 
that's going to be the base URL we are setting. And the reason why we are doing this with the environment variable is that when we deploy our application, this variable needs to be something different. So we would set that environment variable on the hosting app, which is going to be rendering render.com. That's where we set the base URL for the server. And that's going to be different from here. So this will never make it up to our repo, but in the actual server, we're going to set the environment variable to be something different. And we'll cover that when we get there. But anyways, to go back to our API file, I'm going to set the reducer path to be admin API. So again, it's just like the name of the slice. And we're going to give it a tag types and we're going to give it one value and it's going to be user. So these tag types represent the value, basically the state of which you can identify a particular, particular data. So when we grab the user, the tag identification value is going to be user. So don't think too deeply into it, but a lot of this will make sense because it's pretty simple. So finally, endpoint is going to be where we have our main logic of our API calls. So here the endpoint starts with the callback function and we're going to have a build parameter that gets passed into a parens object. And this is where we identify the API calls that we can make. So the first one that we're going to make is going to be get user. And in here we're going to do build.query like so. And we're going to have query with an ID and it's going to be general slash user slash ID. So this is going to be the path that we have set. So again, if you go back to our routes, we have actually go back to index.js. You can see that we have the routes over here. So it starts with slash general. And if we go to general routes, we're going to see slash user and then slash ID. And that will allow us to call this function, get user. So it's all kind of a long little path, but that makes sense with the URL that we want to call. And by the way, the base URL will be attached to this beforehand, to this path. And this ID comes from when we call the API or call the function for this particular, um, this will be a hook we can pass the ID and it will go into it and we'll, it'll be transparent when we get to it. And then here we're going to do provides tags and we're going to pass in user. So we identify that the tags are related. And with that, we basically have our API call all set up with this. So this is basically a get call with build.query. And if we go down below, I can do export const. And I'm going to set use get user query. And this is going to be equal to API. So the way this value comes is comes from get user. So that is represented by these two values. And it has a prefix of use and a suffix of query. So that's all you have to make sure it aligns with this particular endpoint. And with that, it's pretty simple. We have our Redux Toolkit query basically set up. There is actually one thing that we kind of do have to do is I'm going to close all of this again to clean up everything. We're going to go to our index.js and we're going to do last few setups for Redux Toolkit in particular. So we're going to do import sure I spell that correctly, import setup listeners. And this should be Redux toolkit, not dist, but just slash query. And we're going to import API from actually the value is not popping up. So we're going to just do API like so from state slash API. because that's what we're basically exporting. And then finally, 
in the reducer, we need to set api.reducer path. And we're going to set api.reducer. And we're going to have below this reducer, we're going to have a middleware with get default. And we're going to set get default invoked. And we're going to concat that with api.middleware. And below this, we're going to have setup listeners. And we're going to do store.dispatch. And with this, we basically have our Redux toolkit all set up and ready to go. And just to recap, what we did for this particular page on the store is we set up the setup listeners and API. We just did this, we added the middleware, and we just set up the listeners. This is all you need to use toolkit query along with Redux toolkit. So now we have not made the API call yet, but we have set up the configuration to make the API calls. So if I go to components, I am going to go into actually the scenes folder. We're going to go into the layout, go to index.jsx, and we're going to make the API call over here. So the first thing I want to do is I'm going to import use get, use get user query. <laughs> A little bit of tongue twister right there. And then below this is sidebar. This is where we're going to grab information. So we're going to grab the user ID that we created from Redux Toolkit. So use selector. We're going to pass in state. And we're going to grab state.global.user ID. So this is going to grab it from the Redux Toolkit. Not the Redux Toolkit query, but Redux Toolkit. We're going to grab that information from here in this index file. And then we're going to then make our API call. And in our API call, we're going to destructure the data part of the information. But to make the API call, we're going to use use get user query, and we're going to pass in user ID. And we're going to save that. And I will show you, I'm going to console log this. Now, if you remember, I added a VS Code extension called Turbo Console Log. Basically, you can highlight it and press Control Alt L and it'll automatically console log. Now, before we set this up, I want to show one more thing, just a couple things. For the user.insert many, I forgot to mention it, but make sure you comment this out so you don't have any duplicate data. But if you actually did duplicate the data, you might want to go back to mongoose database if you might have some weird errors if you need to you can delete you can delete your users like this and drop it and then redo this make sure you only do it once though so with that note we have use get user query we console logged it so if we go back to our current application let me close a lot of these we can see that the console log is displaying our information. So we have the user, we have grabbed the user information, we have a super admin, her name's Shelly, all of that information. So if you take a look, I know it's a little bit small, so let me zoom in for you guys. But if you go to your network tab for Brave or Chrome, Firefox has it, but it's a little bit different. But you click on fetch X XHR, so this shows all the requests that you make. You can see that you want to see the request URL. Make sure the user the request URL is correct. You might see localhost 3000 instead. If you're seeing that, make sure you turn off your server. That's what's happened to me. You want to close. You go. You want to turn this off, and then you can restart your client application. And you can come back and then you can see this. And then you can see the preview if you want to see all the information that's being sent back from the back end. And then the response as well is just like the raw version versus this is more a formatted version. So you want to make sure all of these check off. You're going to get a status code of 200, request method get.
And as a front-end developer, you should get very comfortable with looking at this. There's a lot of information here, but a lot of times you don't need all this information. You just want to double check that request URL is correct, with the request method is correct, status code is correct. Occasionally you have to look at the headers, but you just want to check the preview is correct. And with that, we also console logged what we're getting back and it's exactly what we need. And now that we got our user information, when we console logged it, we made sure all the data is correct. We can now pass it into both sidebar and navbar so we can build the the information or the UI that holds the user information. So here we want to do user and we're going to say data. However, we want to make sure we're not sending something open. So if you notice, we have a data of undefined. So when it's loading, when the information we're waiting for it, we get a value of undefined, which can be quite problematic. So that's why you can have an or sign to make sure that if it's undefined, we're going to send an empty object. Otherwise, we're going to send the data information. So this will prevent us from breaking our app. And we're going to do the same thing for navbar. So in our sidebar, we're going to go in and we're going to pass in user, like so. And by the way, if you have this, you can do you can hold command or control depending on Windows or Mac. You can hold control, wait for it to underline, and you can click. And that, that takes you to that particular component. There's some oddities about it, so sometimes it might not work. And with that, we're going to go down. We're going to go all the way down. And below this box and above the drawer, we're going to add a box component and we're going to do position of absolute. I'm going to say bottom of two REM and inside here I'm going to give it a component divider from material UI, give it a flex between component with text transform and give this a none value with a gap of one REM, a margin of 1.5 REM, two REM for the right side, zero REM for the bottom and three REM for the left side. I'm gonna make sure I close that. So now in here, I can give it a box component. And inside this box component, I'm gonna give it some props with component of image with an alt of profile. So this is the alternate text and then source of profile image and then height of 40 pixel with a width of 40 pixel border radius of 50 percent an sx of object fit of cover now i really like this object fit you may this is a more nuanced css property that many people don't use but this is object fit it crops the it crops the image as necessary to fit in this image. And we're doing a circle. Border radius 50% will make it into a circle. So this will provide us to automatically crop as needed. And I really find it convenient for images. From here, we're going to do boxed text align of left. And inside here, I'm going to give it a typography with a font weight of bold, font size of 0 .0, 0 0.9 REM, and give it an SX of color with theme.palette.secondary100. And then close one of that. Sweet. Oh, this should be actually a bracket not curly braces and then we should have one more closing curly braces make sure we close the typography save it so we auto format and inside here we're going to give the user user.name like so and then I believe I can just copy this 
and we're just going to change. We don't want font weight of bold. We're going to change this to 0 0.8 REM. Give this a secondary of 200 instead. And instead of user.name, we're going to say user.occupation. And below this, we're just going to have an icon, settings, outlined. We're going to do self-closing tag. And above this, we're going to have SX of color, theme.palette.secondary of 300, and then font size of 25 pixel. So I'm going to save this. Um, I'm going to actually comment this out so we can see the sidebar, see if it's working. So I'm going to save it. We're going to go back. And it does seem like we do have an error. So let's check that out. Go back to sidebar. So if you take a look, this component image should actually be a self-closing tag. And we just need to get rid of this box near the bottom. Actually, this particular one. Make sure you get rid of the one on line 229 right before the flex between. And with that, we should have everything. Save it. We have our user information or our user profile image, the username, user occupation, and the setting. And now we're going to do the same thing for over here, except this will be a drop down. All right, so with that, we can close our sidebar and go to index.jsx. We can uncomment our nav bar for or the user information for our nav bar, and we're going to add the user as well. I already did it, but add the user right here in the nav bar uh, props. And then you can go all the way down to where we have the right side and make sure you identify this correctly, but it's below the icon button, but before the ending flex between. So right here is where I'm going to have our user information. So we're going to do flex between. I'm sure it closes. This has just popped up randomly. And then in here, I'm going to do a button. I'm going to give it an on click. And we're going to set handle click. So there's a few things we want to set up. And I'm going to go up right below the theme setting. So over here, we need to set a few things up. We're going to set up anchor L and set anchor L like this. And we're going to set use state is going to be null like that. So this, a lot of this setting is going to be because we're doing a drop down, we need to set this up. And if you just look at material UI, they will have the settings for you ready to go. So we need this for like our menu drop down. And then we're going to have a is open and we're going to set this as Boolean anchor L like that. And then we're going to do a handle click function, which is what we were creating earlier. So we're going to have event and we're going to make sure we do set anchor L and we're going to do event dot current target. And then we're also going to have a handle close, which is just going to be a set anchor L of null. So we reset it. So this is all for opening up our menu and closing it as needed. So if we go down to where we are over here, we have the handle click. And inside of here, we're going to do SX is equal to display of flex justify content of space between. Let me just save it so I have more space. And then align items of center text transform of none and the gap of one rem i'm going to save that so we have this pretty big button all ready to go and again i'm going to have something very similar to what we have for sidebar so i'm just going to reference our sidebar just a little bit so we can just copy and paste a few things because there are some similarities here. So 
image, profile, everything is the same except the width and the height should be a slight smaller, slightly smaller. And then from here, I can copy the rest of this with the username and occupation. And we're going to make some tweaks like we did. So copy that. This should be font size of 0.85. This one's going to be 0.75. I'm going to save that. We can leave everything else the same. And over here, we're actually going to add one more icon. So this is going to be arrow drop down outlined. I'm going to make this self-closing and I'm going to style this a little bit. So I'm going to do SX color of theme dot palette dot secondary 300. I'm going to set this as font size of 25 pixel like so. And we're going to have a closing box right here. Actually, this closing box should be right above the arrow drop down instead. So the arrow drop down outline should be below the closing box of this. And then finally, right below our button, we're going to have our menu. So this is going to be the actual drop down image. So this is where we're going to use anchor L. Anchor L will be set and open. It's going to be is open with on close is going to be handle close. So this is all in the documentation for material UI menu. So that's all you got to search if you want to look these documents up. So anchor origin is going to be set to vertical at the bottom with the horizontal set to center. Like that. And let me close this and then we can save it to format. And the only menu item that we really need is going to be the logout button. We're not actually going to implement the functionality of the logout, but we're just going to have the image of it or just going to have one item that allows you to supposedly click on it. So if I save it, let's double check. We have no errors. We do actually have menu item is not defined. So if I actually go back, there seems to be a number of components I have not imported. So if you take a look, we have a lot of items that are not imported. So Let's actually take the time to write all this. So we have button, we have box, typography. So it's all shown in this over here. Typography, I forgot the comma. Menu is not defined as well. So let's add menu. And now with that, we don't have any errors. So we can go back to our site and see we do have this, but the flex item is not properly line so let's take care of that so the main culprit as to why this is not growing to the entire width is because of we need something called flex grow so if i want to put flex grow is equal to one over here on this nav bar this will allow this part of the flex so this is like flex box right here this sidebar will take up the width of 250 pixel, but this other box is in this particular flex when it's on non-mobile screens. We're going to have the rest of it take up as much space as it can. That's what flex grow one is going to do. So if I save it, we're going to see that we have everything growing to the full width length. And so with that, with all of this, all the setup, we have our themes, we have, we have dark mode, light mode, we have the sidebar, we have the nav bar all ready to go. And now we can finally start building our pages with the Redux toolkit query to make API calls. And then we'll have the backend somewhat set up and we're going to continue building out the backend so we can grab information as needed. So after we have the sidebar and the navbar all fully set up, 
now we can work on the pages. And the first page we are going to be working on will be the products page. As you can see, we have a list and we have some information about this. A lot of this data is pretty straightforward, but when we create a big application that has information that are kind of related to each other, it can be an absolute mess if you just go at it without any kind of thinking. So when you're trying to design your application, you need to sort out and organize the data beforehand so you don't end up in a big pile of mess. So if you go back, we can see I've created a little diagram over here, and this is going to be a process called data modeling. So you want to organize your data properly before you start coding. And now I know if you look at this, this might seem a little complex because everything you see is just kind of already laid out and there's a lot of relations between each other. But let me go through this and I'll show you how you can get some ideas of how you can do this on your own and learn some general tips and why I'm doing these things. So we've already created a user model. So this is the user schema that we created already. Now, if you take a look, a lot of this is basically just string just for simplification purposes. But we have a few things that might have some relations. For example, we have a transactions property, and this is an array. Now, this array will consist of string IDs that represent a transaction. Now, you might be thinking that you can just store an array of objects, of transactions inside this user. And you might not be wrong. In some cases where if you just want users to have their own set of transactions, like this is the user and he's made, he's bought these three items and made these three transactions essentially, and you can just go through the user and find the transaction you want. However, there are many situations where you look at this and be like, you might want to get the entire list of all the transactions throughout the entire database. And this is where you might have issues because if you store it like this, all in the transactions, if the transaction exists, okay, that looks kind of crazy, but let's assume, let's just delete all these array or like the links and assume transactions exist over here. Now, if you want a list of the entire list of transactions, now what you would have to do is grab every single user. And because you have to loop through every single user, you have to loop through every single user and then loop through their entire transactions to get every single transaction. And that's an extra loop instead of having an ideal scenario where you can have the transactions stored separately in its own tables and diagrams. So that's why here we have a list of transactions and this is just storing a reference to this transaction. And this goes into the concept of SQL databases and them establishing relationships between each other. Now we are working with MongoDB, which is no SQL. So essentially these are non-relational databases, but when it comes to complex databases and complex data models, you definitely want to separate it and act as if it is an SQL database, just because we have separate information. Because we want to keep it separate, we want to keep the relations there, and we want to make the data clean and accessible for different use cases. So why would you use a NoSQL database? Well, in this case, we're using Mongo database. That's why you it allows you to adjust your database very quickly, and you get increased speeds. Now, I'm not going to go into the depth of SQL versus NoSQL, but know that you can set up your NoSQL databases like an SQL database as long as you think carefully and format it properly. So going back to our database, you always want to look at the different relations. For example, a transaction can also have a link between the products, but we want to store the product separately they need to be stored separately because if you want a list of products, you want that information to be separate from all the information. And then we have the product stat 
And another reason, like you have to think about this very carefully for your application. For example, the reason why I have the product stat separate from the product, because sometimes you just want the product stat information and you want to keep this separate from just regular products because maybe if the user, let's say a regular consumer goes onto your website and he wants a list of the products, you don't want to be sending the product stat information to that specific user separately because it's not, I mean, you shouldn't show them how many of that product has been sold. Like if you are sending that to the front end, then they can see how many items of this product has been sold, which, I mean, maybe you don't care, but you know, that's generally not what you want. You just want the product information, how much it costs and the name and description, whatever, that's what's get, getting sent to the front end. But you don't want to send the statistics of that product with it. So essentially you have all of these users, they have all these uh, relationships between each other. You want to be able to map out this information because it can get very hairy if you're doing this on the fly. And if you don't take care of setting this up properly beforehand, you can end up in a situation where your code base and you're making all these weird requests, it can be unoptimized and it can be an absolute mess of writing code while you're doing it because you have to think of how these data is, is going to interact with each other. So it makes a lot of sense to prepare this beforehand. So you can take a you can take a pause and look at how your data will be structured. So I know I'm doing a lot of talking about these data modelings and setting up these diagrams, but I think it's very important to note that this is a process that you need to take care of beforehand and it'll save you a lot of time while you're coding. And I'm just saying this because you don't have to think too, too hard because you never know what type of you know predictions or what kind of features you might end up having to do. You might have to make adjustments. You have to do a lot of different, you have to, you have to figure out all the different possible edge cases and scenarios that you might encounter. And it all depends on your application you can have a general sense of how you want to organize it beforehand and making sure that's as clean as possible, then you can move on. And by doing that, you don't need to be like this massive database architect to get everything perfect from the get-go. You can have a good sense just by carefully thinking about it, what your application needs, what your end result should be. There's all this information about read speeds and write speeds. You can optimize for read, you can optimize for write, but just take into consideration of just break it down, see what you your application needs. Does it need to be fast for regular users? Does it need to be able to save files? If it needs to save files, you need to probably optimize speeds for that and you can figure out the best way. The ultimate goal is to have the less, less amount of processing power for your servers, meaning less code to you, meaning you loop through your data as least as possible for any given situation. But there's a lot of trade-offs. So you have to consider those. But I'm not gonna go too in depth into that, but there's just a lot to think about when you build these databases. You just wanna make sure you're doing this step-by-step -step process and over time you will get better. All right, so I will leave a link in the description for you to access this and you can just take a look at this. And by the way, if you wanted to create your own ERD diagram, you can go, this is this app is called Lucidchart. I find it, it's one of the mo more easier diagrams that you can make and it also looks pretty nice. So if you wanted to make your own ERD diagram, you're gonna need these shapes. So if you go down to the shape library, you can go down to the shape click the entity relationship and then you can drag drag these guys and you can make your own set or own data model. So feel free to go Lucidchart. This is all free. I have a paid version because I'm using Lucidchart quite heavily, but you can just you can do this with a free version. And 
as we build this app, I'll be referencing this and I'll show you how these things will work. All right, so now let's go back to our code. So now we're gonna get a list of products and we want different information as well as the product stat information. So the first thing we wanna do is we're gonna create the models. So I'm gonna go into the models folder. I'm gonna create a new file and we're gonna call this product.js. And I'm gonna create one more model as well. And it's called product. Actually, this should not be a folder. Let me delete that. So we're gonna create a new file and this is gonna be called product stat.js. So in our product, we're gonna create another schema. And actually, let me go to the user. I'm gonna click on all, copy it, paste it. So I don't have any errors. So I'm gonna just delete everything inside here. Make sure I have it closed. And I'm gonna copy this and say product, product schema. And this should be product, all three of these. So I did command D, I clicked all of them, did product like that. Inside here, I'm gonna do name, it's going to be string. We're gonna do price, should be number, description, and where this is gonna be a string, category, this should be a string, rating should be number, supply should be number. Just keep note that this these should be required entities in a real application, but for simplicity's sake, I'm just setting this up like this. And one more thing, we actually need to add the timestamps. It's always good to have the timestamps just in case, because you always want to know when these products have been created. It's a useful information to keep. All right, so that is our product. Now let's go to our product stat. So I'm just gonna copy everything, paste it over here again, and we're just gonna do the same thing with the names. I'm just gonna go where the product is, and I'm modifying both of these guys. This should be product stat. Same with these two over here. So I'm just gonna type in there. I'm gonna save it. These should be different right here. So I'm gonna do product ID and this should be string yearly sales total, which represents the number of items that have been sold or the total price that has been sold per year for that particular product. We're gonna do yearly total sold units and that's going to be a number. We're gonna do year, it's gonna be a number as well. We're gonna set monthly data. So now this is going to be specific to this application, but generally when you do maybe like an e-commerce application, you're gonna have statistics and maybe, maybe the business people or the product people, they want information on how much we have sold of this particular product on a month to month basis. So in this case, we're just gonna store for every single month, the total number of sales and the total number of units being sold per month. So we are essentially nesting an object within array. So we have a list of objects that will include this information. And then we're gonna do something similar for daily data. So we want information per day for this product. So we're gonna have total sales, the number, and total units, number, like that. I'm gonna save it. Now we have our product stat schema. We also have our product schema. So before we create the actual routes, I want to inject this information into our database. So I'm gonna go to index.js. I'm gonna go down to where data imports is. I'm gonna do the same thing I did before. So I'm gonna import product from dot slash models slash product dot JS. Remember we need the dot JS as well. I'm gonna copy this. This should be product stat. And then inside here, this should be data product and then data product stat. 
like so. And I'm gonna go down over here and we're gonna do what we did before with the users. We're gonna do product dot insert many and we're gonna do data product product stat dot insert many data product stat like so. Let me open up the terminal. We still have our server running. So I'm going to save it. I'm going to only do this once. It's going to take some time. And then just to double check, we want to go to our Mongo database cloud. We're going to hit refresh. And now we should see products. And we have our products information. Perfect. And then we also have our product stats. And everything is there. And that's a lot of information and we want to make sure we want to comment this out. Now we have information in our database. So now we can just set up the routes. So I'm going to close, close my terminal and I'm going to go, we're going to set this up in the client routes and under our router, we're going to do router.get and we're going to do slash products comma get products like that and we should import that function that does not exist yet so get products and we're going to do it from dot dot slash controllers slash client dot js and then finally we can go to our controllers we can go to client and this is where we will be setting up our get product function so the first thing I want to import is going to be product from dot dot slash models slash product dot js. And then we're also going to import product stat. Make sure we have the dot js. And then we're going to import, uh, actually I don't need the user. So we're going to export const get products and we're going to do async rec res like we did before. And just because I'm lazy, I'm going to go to general. I'm going to copy this over here, paste it, and I'm just going to erase everything in the try. But the catch, we're going to just keep it the same. Now I know normally you want to make sure you handle the error and be more specific about what's the problem, but because this application is quite heavy and intensive already with all the data and what we're doing, I'm going to give it a very generic error. So make sure you don't do that in your actual applications. All right. So from here, we're going to set a products variable and we are going to do a wait product dot find. So we're going to grab all the product that we can get. So now we also want the product stat information because we're on a dashboard we want the user to be able to see this is the final by the way this is the final build we want to be able to user to be able to see all this information about user sales or units their rating and the price things like that you want to be able to see everything so we also want to grab all the product stats as well so we're going to do that so we're going to grab each product and we're going to do await promise dot all and what we're going to do is we're going to with each products we're going to cycle through and we're going to make an api call for every single one api call to the database essentially so we're going to ask mongodb i want this information for each product i want the product stat of each one so i'm going to grab the stat and the way we do this is we're going to grab product stat dot find and we're going to grab and pass it in the product ID using product dot underscore ID like so. If you don't fully understand this, I'll in a very short bit, I will explain everything here. So product and for whatever reason, we need to set product.doc because that's what 
MongoDB sends to same. I'm not entirely sure why that's the case, but MongoDB sends when you're using promise.all sends to give you product dot underscore doc. If you understand it, please let me know why that's the case. But here, so let me rehash what's this. This is a little crazy, but basically we're cycling through all the products that we received. So product.find will give us all the product that we just requested. And what we want to do is for every single product, we're going to find the product stat using that particular product ID. And we are returning an array of objects with both just the product information. So this is just all the product information and we're combining it with the stat information. So we're combining it into one big object. So referring back to our ERD diagram, what I'm essentially doing is I'm essentially telling Mongo database, I want all the list of products here. And then on the second go, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the ID of each one and I'm now going to call the database and tell them I want the product stats relevant to this particular ID. And this is what's called a foreign key, essentially. So using matching this with the product ID, I can grab the product stat relevant to this particular product. So if I wanted like a shampoo ID, it has an ID. And that ID is stored in the product ID property of the product stat. So by doing this, I can get the product stat information of each product and we combine it into one object like this. So here we have as one single or an array of objects for each product, we have all the product information along with all the stats for each product. And with that, we can do res.status 200 dot json and we're going to return to the front end with products with stats hopefully that makes sense because we are essentially grabbing every product just grabbing the stat information alongside with it now this is a little bit slow in reality this query is actually pretty slow so if you actually re refresh the page this will be slow because we're constantly telling the database, I want this information for this product, then this product, then this product, and there's just separate information. Now, I don't want to cover this yet. I'll save it for later in this video, but there is something called aggregate functions, which allow you to use two databases and you can make a query that will combine information together. And Mongo database has optimized it with aggregate functions. Now, if you're familiar with SQL databases, this is equivalent to what you would see in SQL database called joins and unions. And they have Mongo database has its own version of those aggregate type functions. So, but we'll cover that shortly. I just want to keep this simple so you understand what's happening. And so with that, we have our products information. So that will be sent to the front end. And so with this, I know you guys have requested me to call this API endpoints as we go using Postman. But what I'm going to do instead, just to speed up the process is that I'm going to build a front end just for the products page. And we're going to make an API request to test this and we'll be testing it from the front end, but we won't build the entire back end first, like I have done before, but I will build this just for build the front end relevant to this section first. So we have the products, get products. So we're going to make sure we call this particular endpoint. So I'm going to close everything and we're going to go to our front end now, close all this. And then I can go, I'm going to start by creating the API endpoint for our Redux toolkit query. So in here, since everything is all set up, we just have to set up a tag type called products. And in here we can do get products and we can do build dot query. And we're going to do query and we're going to do a callback function. And we're going to say 
client slash products to hit the endpoint that we want. And remember, the reason why we add the client is because this is part of the router. So slash client, and then go to client routes slash products, and then that's what's gonna hit the endpoint. All right, and then for the provides tags is gonna be products. And it's pretty straightforward and make sure we got to export that use get products query and that's pretty much it we don't need to set up the store anymore because we already did that last time so this is all we have to do to create another endpoint i know before we were kind of all locked into setting up the store and all of this but when you're actually working at a company and you've set this endpoint you set the entire store and was it the query and this page you'll realize that you don't need to you don't often need to set up everything like that's very infrequent you don't have to do that often and plus it used to be this used to be a lot worse okay if you're going to complain about this it used to be a lot worse trust me there there didn't be there was all sorts of like packages that made a lot of this very complex and people have complained a lot so right now this is Pretty, pretty good, I would say. And then from here, we're gonna go, I'm gonna close these guys. We're gonna go to the app.js file so we can create up our products page. So first I'm gonna do import products from scenes slash products. And in here, we're gonna create a route for that. So route path is equal to slash products. And we're gonna do element and we're going to pass in the products component that we just imported. And we're going to create that route. Now, obviously, this is not going to work yet because we have not created the products component. So I'm going to go to scenes, create a new folder, call this products. And oops, I really need to not type these things incorrectly. OK, so products, we're going to write index.jsx. And in here, I'm going to use rfce to write products like so and in here we're going to do some imports so i'm going to import a number of components so box card card actions card forgive me for doing this kind of fast but it's pretty straightforward you just have to copy it you can pause the video if you need to copy these so we're gonna have button, typography, rating, use theme, and use media query. And we're gonna import it all from at MUI slash material. Like so. I'm gonna save that. It'll auto format. And up here, I'm gonna import use state as well. And then I'm gonna import use get products query from from state slash api so that's what we created earlier use get products and then finally i want to create a component called header so before we work on the products there is one component that if you take a look this is you i use the products header component on every single page like this header. So I'm going to make this into a reusable component. So let's actually do that. So I'm going to import header from components header. And we are going to create this particular component. So I'm going to create a new file. This will be header.jsx. And in here, I'm just going to import a few things. This component will be pretty small. We're going to do box use theme like that. I'm going to do RFCE and we have our header. And inside here, I'm going to pass in parameters of title and subtitle. And I'm going to pass in theme equals use theme like so. And inside this, this should be box. 
And I'm going to make sure I close this. Inside here, this is just going to be a typography with a variant of H2 with a color of theme.palette.secondary100 with a font weight of bold and an SX of margin bottom 5 pixel. I'm going to close this. And inside here, I'm going to pass in the title params that I passed in. And below this, I'm going to have another typography. Actually, I'm just going to copy this to make my life easier. This should be a variant of H5, secondary color of 300. And I'm going to just remove these two guys. And this should be subtitle. I'm going to save it. Now, I'm, no, I'm going this kind of fast. But this is essentially just two typographies with the title, with the box laid out. And it's kind of reusable. So it just makes our lives easier when we're creating new components. We can just pass this in. So as we did, we pass in header. So we're going to go back to our products page and we can set up our header inside of here. But let's do this box slash box like this. And I can pass in they're like so and we can pass in the title products has to be capitalized and then we're going to do a subtitle equals see your list of products and we're going to make that a closing tag and we shall see that we have a header let me make sure everything's running we're just we just have a lot of unused but they're not detrimental so if i go to the products page we have this. We don't have the correct margins yet, but we can set that up easily. So I'm going to go back, close the terminal, close this, close a lot of these, and we can now get started writing our product information. So if I go down, I'm going to write const data comma is loading. And this is something we can get from use get products query. So as I mentioned before, we are able to grab the data we are getting from the back end. But we also have something called is loading. So we can use this Boolean that Redux Toolkit Query provides, and we can check if the data has not come back to the front end yet. That's what this guy is particularly used for. But before that, let's actually double check. We can console log the data and making sure we have the information that we are requesting. So this is going to double check our API endpoint. So let me save that. And let me go into products. The way you can check it is opening up your dev tools. We do have some kind of code. You'd like to forgot to export your component. OK, it seems like I did not export something correctly. Give me one sec. OK, it turns out. There was no issue with that. So if you just refresh it, you won't see the error. But now you can see that we have the data. So this is our product information. Now I know this; these are names of people, but I'm just imagining this is just a product name. So we have our list of products that we are grabbing from the back end. So everything is working as expected. All right, so now we can resume back, going back to creating our component. So I'm going to go down. Right before, right below use get products query, I'm going to do const is non mobile, and we're going to do use media query. And in here, I'm going to set up min width of a thousand pixel, like so. And with the box, we're going to set up a margin of 1.5 REM, 2.5 REM for our edges. And by the way, I've never explained this yet, but the reason why I'm using REM instead of pixel is because it it makes it very consistent across different browsers. So this is called root root EM, and we're basically essentially using the default pixel size, which is like 16 font, and we're 
basing it on that. So everything is proportional to that initial starting point. And that makes it more convenient than just using an absolute value like pixels. Anyway, so below the header, we're gonna add a box and we're gonna set data or if is loading. Now, React Redux Toolkit query is a little quirky with the is loading, but you wanna make sure that the data is not loading and to make sure the data already exists. So you wanna make sure both of these, one of these is not, one of this is true before we can actually render our component. And then inside here, I'm gonna create a box, make sure I close it first, like this. And I'm going to add another one over here just so we can have our formatting. So inside our box, we're gonna have a lot of properties. So I'm gonna say margin top is going to be 20 pixel. And we are going to use grid for this one. So display of grid, because grid is much better for two dimensional, or no, yeah, two dimensional uh, layouts as opposed to one dimensional layouts for reflex box. So if you take a look on our final build, we have a grid that's spanning over here. And the way this works essentially is we're gonna have a grid of four items until we hit a certain point. Until we hit a certain point, we're just gonna make each item be on its own line like this. As you can see, we have one for every single line. And grid actually makes this very, very easy. So you can use flex for something like this, but grid makes it even easier once you know how to do it. So let me turn that off. We're gonna go back and we're gonna set display of grid. And I'm gonna set grid template columns. And we're gonna set this as repeat four comma min max with zero and one fractional unit. Let me save it so we have all of this on the separate line, easier to read. But basically, we are gonna repeat a grid set of columns. We're gonna split it into four, and we're gonna give it a min max of zero, so a minimum of zero, and one fractional unit. That's what this unit represents. Actually, let me make sure, close that one fractional unit as the maximum value. So if it gets to a point where it's too small, it's gonna, it's gonna allow it to decrease further. But for our purposes, it's going to be four columns of items split. And we're also gonna set justify content so that we have a space between layout for the items. So it's very similar to how Flexbox is setting up. We're gonna set up a row gap of 20 pixel, meaning the gap for each row, so vertically. And then we're also gonna have a column gap of 1.33%. This is something I just played around with getting a percentage. So this will be the gaps between each column, so left and right, and then row gap is gonna be vertical, so up and down. And then here I'm gonna set the SX and this is a very convenient way for me to make this responsive. So if you do and, we target the immediate div. That's what this represents. The immediate div, we can set a setting that will allow us to make it responsive. So what I would do is do grid column, and we're gonna set that if it's non-mobile, so basically desktop screens, we're not gonna set anything. We're not gonna set any kind of value for this. However, for each div inside this parent component, we want this to be span of four, meaning it takes up the entire width for mobile screens. By doing this, we are selecting the child elements of this parent component. So anything that exists in here, so if we have a div like this, every child component 
it's going to have a span of four, meaning it takes up the entire width when it's on mobile screens. Whereas if it's not on mobile screens, we're not going to give it a span of anything. So it's going to take, there's going to be four columns per line. And this is how you kind of do it. So instead of doing this as a div, we can use box component. That's how this kind of works. Below this, I'm going to write loading because that's what we're not going to handle like a fancy loading component. We're just going to put loading. So when the data is not loaded, we're going to have this. Now for this, I want to be able to map through our data and we're going to create a component for every single item. And inside this, I'm going to have arrow function. We're going to create a component called product. And I'm going to create the product component up here above it. Because if I put the product component over here, it gets a little messy. So I'm going to have the product component up here. So I'm going to do const product. And I'm going to pass it a number of things that come from the data itself. So underscore ID is coming from the back end. Same with the name, description, price, rating, category, supply, and then stat. And from here, I'm going to just return something. So here, I'm going to do const theme equals use theme. And here, I'm just going to do a lot of like layout things to create our card that represents each product. So I'm going to do set is expanded over here to make sure this represents the see more button to open and close it. And it lives on each component here. And I'm going to return a card component. I'm going to make sure we close that. And inside this, I'm going to have an SX. I'm going to set this background image to be none. And then we're going to have a background color to be theme.palette.background.alt for the color. And then border radius of 0 0.55 REM. And just a note, I haven't mentioned this, but the reason why we use this color theme.palette.background.alt instead of having a hard coded value of the color, like as some hex code, blah, blah, blah. Instead of doing that, we are using the theme because if you change it to dark mode, Material UI will automatically assign the dark mode or light mode version of these colors. Whereas if you hard code the colors, it's not going to allow you, it's not going to flip that color. It's always going to be, let's say if it's going to be like white, if I have that over here, then whether it's dark or light mode, it's always going to be a white color, but we don't want that. We want it to be different based on the theme mode. That's why I kind of have that. And then from here, I'm going to do card content. Inside of this, I'm just going to set a bunch of typography. We're going to do SX of font size of 14. I'm going to set a color of theme.palette.secondary 700. And I'm going to set a gutter bottom. This is just a property that gives a little bit of bottom margin. And we're going to do category in there. And here I'm going to set another typography. We're going to set this a variant of H5 component of div. And we're going to set this as name. And then finally, I'm going to just copy this one. If we're going to do one more. We're going to set this SX of margin bottom of 1.5, actually 1.5 REM, like so. We're going to remove the component div. We're going to say it's color. We're going to copy this color of secondary, except change it to 400. And then what I want for this one is going to be 
actually the price. So I'm gonna put the dollar sign and inside curly braces, I'm gonna put the actual price and we're gonna change that to a number. So I'm gonna do price in here. Since it's in a string format, we're gonna do two fixed to two decimals. So this will change our price and set it to two decimals at most. Below this, I'm gonna set a rating, give it a value of rating, and we're gonna do read only. So this is a specific component that Material UI provides. This is why I really like component libraries, because sometimes you don't need something fancy, you just need something functional. And by Material UI provides you with a rating component. And if you were to create your own rating component, it takes a lot of time. Like most people underestimate how, how much time those things can take. Building your own component library is one of the biggest time sinks I've seen. A lot of people really underestimate how much time <laughs> it takes to make it. Is it worth it? Maybe for a large company. All right, so anyways, we have a description. We have a typography. We can put that as the bottom one. And then finally, we need card actions. And by the way, a lot of this information about this card exists on Material UI. Maybe I should just show you how you can do a card. I just want to show you that you can just go to Material UI Docs and they'll give you all the information as needed. So this is all the card content and card actions. This is where I got all this information from. So it's not magic. Okay, so we have card actions, and then we have button. And then we're gonna have a variant of primary. And we're gonna do size of small. And we're gonna do on click. And we're gonna pass in set is expanded. And we're gonna say not is expanded. So we're just gonna invert that. And we're gonna give it a C more text. And below this, we're gonna say collapse. So this is a component that just will collapse the information if, if we need. So it's gonna be based on is expanded. So in is equal to is expanded. And we're gonna set a timeout of auto. And we're gonna do unmount on exit sx color of theme dot palette dot neutral 300 and below this we're going to do card content again and we're going to set a number of typography over here so i'm going to use typography and i'm not going to have to style this one i'm just going to do id colon and then pass in underscore id value I'm just going to copy and paste this four times, three times. This should be supply left. So the number of items left. So this should be supply. This should be yearly sales this year. And we can do stat dot yearly sales total. And over here, we're going to do yearly units sold this year year. I'm going to pass this over here, stat.yearly total sold units. And we do seem to have some kind of prettier format. Okay, that's because we have a syntax error. If you go down over here, we have not completely finished. So we have the product component now, but we want to be able to use that. So if I go down over here, we're going to create the product component so we can use them. So data map is going to be an object. So we're going to destructure that item and make sure you're getting the syntax correct because there's, it's a little hard at this point to see it. So we're going to do underscore ID, name, description, price, rating, category, supply, make sure you spelled supply correctly, and then stat. And then after the curly braces and after the prends, we're gonna do arrow, 
and we're going to pass in product like so and this should be self-closing and we're going to pass in a lot of the params that we've just added and i am silly because this arrow function okay i need to take my own advice about the syntax so just get rid of this arrow and i believe this should be correct you have two parens and then the curly braces and then the curly braces the closing parens this should be product okay and then we're just going to copy all of this over here and i'm going to i'm not gonna, i'm going to select all the commas actually let me put a comma there i'm going to select all the commas hit back then i'm going to hit equal sign hit curly braces and then paste what we just wrote again and we're going to get rid of the comma and then i'm going to save it and it seems like we do have another syntax error okay so now i can save it we have everything over here we just need to add a key don't worry if you didn't follow what i did but just make sure that you have all the properties getting destructured from data and passing all of them down into the product component and making sure you have the key ID for as well. So React doesn't yell at you. And then make sure all your products are good. Now everything looks good to me. So let's see how it looks. And with that, let's go to our website. And as you can see, we have our list of products. We have loading, when we're waiting for that information and we have all of the data that we need. We can go see more. We can see all the items that we see. We have the ID of each one as well and everything works as expected. And if you close it, we have responsive. So everything looks properly, looks proper to me. Just want to note that Yes, it took a long time to set up everything, but now with all our setup with Redux Toolkit Query, our schemas and models and everything, makes it very easy to continually build all these pages. So with that, we have the products page. Now we're gonna go to the customers page. And with that, now we can create our customers page. So the customers page is going to be grabbing information from the backend and we're going to put this into a data grid, which is the material UI table component. So to start off, we're going to go to our backend. We're going to go to client.js and we are going to be adding a route. So under router.get products, we're going to do router.get slash slash customers. And we're going to put get customers. like so and then from here i'm going to import get customers from controllers and we're going to go to client and this one is pretty simple so we're just going to do export const get get customers and we are going to do async rec res and what i'm going to do is i'm going to import the user model from dot dot slash models slash user dot js and then from here I'm going to copy the try catch block again we're going to keep the catch the same and inside our try block I'm going to do const customers is equal to await user dot find and for us to get the customers we're going to say the role is basically users. So users are basically the people who are going to be our customers. Admin are the people who will be able to access the dashboard. Super admin are the people who will be able to access and manage the other admins. And then right here, we're also going to add select and we're going to do minus password. And the reason why we're doing this is that if you take a look at the models, and the user, we see that we have a password. 
we want to make sure we don't include the password when we send it to the front because <laughs> you don't want to send their passwords to the front end or else it can be abused. And then from here, we're going to do res.status 200, meaning that's okay. And then .json customers. And we're going to save. So that's pretty straightforward. And then from here, I'm going to go to source into our front end. And we're going to go to API. And we're going to do what we did before, except we're going to do it for get customers. So get customers. We're going to build .query query and we're going to have an arrow function and we're going to say client slash customers and you could put that closing bracket but it doesn't really matter we're going to do provides tags and we're going to put customers here and I'm going to put customers up here as well I'm going to save it and we're going to put use get customers query. And then from here, I'm going to go to app.js and I'm going to import customers like we did before. Customers from scenes slash customers, which is a folder and file we have not created yet. And then we're going to create a route and we're going to say path is equal to slash customers say element is equal to slash customers closing tag and we're going to close that route and then we have not created this customers yet so let's do that so we're going to go to scenes create a new folder we're going to call this customers and i'm going to add a file called index.jsx within there and in here i'm going to do rfce and call this customers So here, I'm going to import a few things. I'm going to close this tab. I'm going to import box from MUI material as well as use theme. Then I'm going to import use get customers query, the hook that we just created, and then import headers from components header. Then finally, we're going to import data grid from material UI data grid. So I'll cover this very shortly. So I'm going to create theme is equal to use theme because we need colors. And then we're going to grab data and is loading from use get customers query. And we're going to make sure this customers API endpoint that we created works. So I'm going to save this. I'm going to go back to our application and go to our customers page. We see our customers title and we see the data coming back. Now I'm console logging this, but preferably you check the network tab. So check the network tab. We'll make sure that you have everything correctly. So over here we have information about each customer in the preview section. So you always want to, you want to be able to learn how the network tab is working. We have our correct route. We have a good status. We're using the get method. And in the preview, this is kind of what we expect. We have 102 customers here. And then we're going to go back and we're going to set up some layout stuff. So we're going to do box and we're going to set this as margin of 1.5 REM top and bottom 2.5 REM left and right. I'm going to close this box. And inside the box, I'm going to set the header to be title of customers with subtitle list of customers. Now in here, I'm going to create a box and inside this box, I'm going to put data grid. All right. So data grid. So we have an error over here. Failed the prop. Okay, yeah. So right now, data grid is not working because we're missing some props. But if you go to material UI, data grid, we will see 
extensive documentation here. So Data Grid has editing, sorting, filtering, pagination, selection. They have a lot of different things over here. Now they, if you see this, there is an open source version. So this is the free version, but they also have a commercial version, which is pro plan. They have a lot of extra features in the pro plan, but you'll be able to get away with using the open source or in the free plan, even for a lot of different companies. You'll be able to use a lot of the features without having to pay for it. So you don't have to worry for the most part. And now you can find a lot of information of how do you style your components, do filtering, sorting. A lot of this information is there. Now, the reason why we don't create our own tables is because I personally have created a reusable table myself. And I can assure you that creating your table yourself takes a significant amount of time. You're going to spend a long, long time building up your own table. There's way more functionality in tables than you would reasonably predict. But why would you do that? when you can use something like Material UI Data Grid, which offers a lot of the functionality, has a lot of documentation, has a lot of things where they fixed a lot of the bugs and provided an easy way to access a lot of it. So I highly, highly recommend creating a table. But I know people, they're going to want to create their own table. By all means, if you want to go and try. I have done it for work and it's not fun. It's not fun when you try to make a table reusable in 10 to 15 different places. I don't know. I don't think it's worth. <laughs> I don't think it's worth. But anyways, we have our data. So now we can set up our data grid. So the data grid, let me put this on a different line and uncomment this out. So data grid requires a f just a few properties namely rows. And this is where we're going to put our, our data. And the way we're going to do this is going to put an empty array if it hasn't loaded with data like we've done before. And then we're going to do columns and we're going to place a columns array. So we have not created this columns array yet. We'll do it in a very short bit. But before that, we're going to write loading and we're going to do is loading and we're going to make sure the data is not loaded. So this will provide loading. You'll see a spinning circle in the middle of the data when the data is going to be loading. So it's very nice and convenient. So then we have get row ID. So meaning every single row needs an ID. And typically it goes by dot ID. It tries to find the property of dot ID in our data. But in our case, it's dot underscore ID. So instead of saying row dot ID, we're going to do row dot underscore ID. And that should give us the proper rows. We're going to save it. We're still going to have issues because the columns don't exist. So now let's actually create the columns. So the columns represent each column and the header, as well as the field in which we should be gathering it from. So for example, the field, meaning inside our data, we're going to have a property called underscore ID. So we're going to say, if we want to grab that information, we're going to say underscore ID. The header name is going to be a capital ID. So this is the title or the column title of each column. And then flex, we can set this to one. So this is going to be how you want each column to grow, shrink, and how much space it can take up. So if you wanted to take up an even space for each one, you can set every single one to flex to one. Or you can, let's say you want this to be smaller, you can say this to 0 0.5. But for the ID, since it's kind of long, we're going to set that to be one. I'm going to copy and paste. We're going to say this is name. The header name should be capitalized N name. And then we're going to say 0 0.5 for this one. And we're going to continue doing this for all the properties that we want. 
So the next one is going to be email. Let's change this to email. This one should be capitalized. And the email should have a flex of one. And then from here, the next one's going to be phone number. So the phone number is going to be a little special. So we're going to say phone number like this, but the field is called phone number camel case. We're going to set the flex to 0 0.5 and we're going to set render cell and we're going to give it this a function. So if we ever want to customize that particular column, we can create a callback function that looks like this. And we're going to return params.value.replace. So what we're doing is essentially we're grabbing the value for this particular column, but we're going to replace it with some regex because this is a phone number. We want to format this phone number. And the way we do this for this particular format is we can just put a parens. We're going to put slash D, meaning a number, and we're putting three, so three numbers. And it's going to be wrapped around parens. And we're going to say slash D, curly braces three again, because that's going to be another set of three. And we're going to put parens slash D, and then this time four, because this is how phone numbers are represented. And then we're also going to have quotation, oops, we're going to have quotation, double quotations like this. And what we're doing is we're going to place it like this. So essentially, this is what, like, if, you know, if you're familiar with regex, what it's doing is grabbing the first three set of numbers, placing it in this section. We're going to grab the next three. We're going to place it in the two. We're going to put a dash after that and put the last four in this section. So this is how it formats the phone number, because the phone number is a set of 10 numbers. And we just need to format with the parens and the dash. And then we're going to continue on adding a few more columns. This is will be country and a capitalized country over here with a flex of 0 0.4. I'm going to copy and paste this. We're going to have occupation for this one. Occupation, and then make sure this is capitalized, and this will be 1. And then finally, we're going to set the role. Capitalize this and set this to 0 0.5. Five. And now let's save it. Let's double check everything is working. We're going to go back to our app. And as you can see, we have our box, but we're seeing nothing so far. And that's because we need to set the height of the parent component. Because there's no height set for this, it's just not going to show anything. So we're just going to set a margin of 40 pixel, actually a margin top of 40 pixel. And we're going to set a height of 75 viewport height. So that will take 75% of your screen's height size. And now, as you can see, we have all our information. We even have pagination. Everything works expected. We can change the rows, the number of rows, change that. We can even sort information as well. And just note, data grid by default has, first it sorts by ascending, descending, and then the third time you click it is actually, it unsorts, so it doesn't ascend. And then the following time it's gonna go around that cycle again. But so here we have, we have our data grid, and you can see how simple that was. We have the ID, we have the actual value, and it's grabbing, for example, underscore ID, that's the field and then the city as well, or actually we're not even using city, but country grabs the country value. So as you can see, it's pretty convenient, but we still want to style this a little bit. So we're going to go back and styling can be, it's going to require us to grab some of the CSS class names. And I think this is pretty convenient. If you know 
which one to modify, it's not too bad. So the way you would figure out what class names you want to use is you can go over here and check the rows and fields. For example, if you want to see columns, headers, inner, if you want to modify that, you can grab that particular class over here and you can modify it with and dot something like this. And that will allow you to change that. But I've already set and found all the CSS properties I want. So I'm going to get MUI data grid root and I'm going to set this as border with none. And then and dot MUI data grid. Actually, I'm going to keep this copied so we don't have to write this over and over. I'm going to have dots and we're going to modify the cell this time. I'm going to give it border bottom of none. And then from here, paste what I had. We're going to change the column headers and change the background color and give it a theme dot palette dot background dot alt. Give it a color of theme dot palette dot secondary. 100 and give it a border bottom of none. And then right here, I'm going to do the same thing as before dash virtual scroller colon brackets. I'm going to copy this over here. So we have theme dot background dot alt. Actually, this should be primary dot light. I'm going to copy and paste this for convenience sake. And this should be footer container. So we are changing the footer this time. And I'm going to copy all of this in the column headers and make some modifications from there. Give it a border top of none instead of border bottom. And these two colors are going to be the same. And then finally, I'm just going to copy this guy. And we're going to do toolbar container and MUI button dash text. So we're changing two things. We're going to give this a color and give template strings theme dot palette dot secondary 200. And we're for this particular case, we're going to have to use important because it doesn't overwrite it properly. So if we take a look, and now you can see we have our styles. So it looks pretty good. Let me make sure everything is going as expected. Yep. Perfect. And as you can see, Data Grid is very convenient and has a lot of functionality that you can use and it provides an easy way to add all your data. Okay, we so we did our customers page. The next page we're going to handle is going to be transactions. Now, if you take a look, you can see Data Grid again. You just have some extra items which are pretty cool. You can close and open some of these columns and then we can change the density of it as well. We can even export this as a CSV if we wanted to. And then we also have a search where we can search something in this table. However, there is a major difference between this table and the customers. And it's not because of those functionality. Customers page is what we just did, which is client side pagination. What that means is that what the server is going to do is going to send you all the information to the front end. So once you make one query, we're going to get all 100, 102 results onto the front end, and then we do the sorting on the front end. But what happens if you are sending thousands and thousands, or maybe even hundreds of thousands of information to the front end? That's not ideal. You don't want to send that much data because it goes, it costs too much and it becomes too slow. So in our transaction table, we have 500 transactions, but we're not going to send all 500 
to the front end at once. What we're instead going to do is we're going to do this every single 20 pages. And when we hit next, the back end is going to set us, send us new information. And as you can see, these are getting populated every time I click. So it will be different information. And then when we sort, since we don't have all 500 results right now, we need to send to the back end the sorting information. So this is what's called server-side pagination. It does get tricky and a bit challenging, but this is valuable information because this happens quite frequently that you have a list of a, a very long data. You're not going to send all the information to the front end, and that causes issues with you know, sending um, and trying to sort information because you don't have all the data in the front, so you have to send a request to the back end to sort the information. And then also when you change the rows of pages, you're going to have to tell that to the back end as well as the page number you are currently at. So this is server-side pagination, and we're going to do this with Data Grid. And I'll show you how this differs and how convenient it is to use with Data Grid. So to do that, we're going to start with the back end. So I'm going to close all these tabs. I'm going to go close the client, and I'm going to go down to Models. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to create a transaction transaction model over here. And in here, we're going to import. We're actually just going to go over user, actually product, copy all of this, paste it. And what we're going to do, we're going to get rid of product schema. We're going to say transaction schema. And over here, the product should be transaction. And we're going to change this to user ID to be string. Cost should be string. Products is going to be a type of mongoose dot types dot object ID. And I'm going to put of number. Just a couple things to note is that cost should typically be a number instead. And there's ways to convert the numbers and doing all that. But for our purposes, we're going to keep this a string. And I'll show you what we need to do for that. And products is going to be essentially an object of type with an object ID, and we're going to give a number as well. We're going to save that. And then from here, I'm going to go to index.js. And I'm going to import our model. And we're also going to import the data as well. So we're going to do import transaction from dot slash models slash transaction dot JS. And then from here, I'm going to do data transaction. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go scroll down, and this is where I'm going to add the transaction. So I'm going to add transaction.insert many. I'm going to do data transaction, like so. I'm going to open up my terminal. I'm going to save it, make sure everything goes as expected. And we're going to go to our Mongo database over here, and I'm going to refresh. making sure our transactions exist over here and everything is perfect. We have user ID, cost, and our list of products. Okay, so I'm gonna close this. I'm gonna comment this out. I'm gonna save it. And then from here, I'm gonna go to our routes page. I'm gonna add another route using router.get slash transactions, and we're going to hit get transactions over here. Inside here, I'm going to say get transactions, and we're going to be creating this function. So if I go controllers, client, and below this is where I'm going to write our function. So this function is going to be kind of tricky because we're going to do some server-side pagination.
So over here, I'm going to copy the try catch. I'm going to remove all this. I'm just going to remove our customers. And because we're doing server side pagination, we need to grab some values from our query string. So the way we grab that is going to be, we're going to grab the page and we're going to have a default of one page size of 20 for default. The sort is going to start off with null search is going to be empty. And we're all grabbing this from the front end and the front end is going to send us the rec dot query values over here. So these are the defaults with the equals and we're just grabbing these values from the front. And by the way, sort the way we're going to make the sort look like it should look like this. We're going to have field. We're going to mention the user ID or sort. And we're going to say maybe something like descending or ascending. So that's how this is going to be sending to us from the front end. And that's what material UI will be sending. And then the way we want to format our sort, it needs to look like something like user ID of negative one. So this is what we need to format this string for the Mongo database. So this is what Mongo database will be able to read versus this is what we're getting back from material UI data grid. So we need a function to make that happen. So we're going to do const sort parsed. So we're going to parse the string of sort. So the front end will be sending this as a string. So we need to parse that into an object and we're going to do sort formatted and we're going to create an object. And in this object, we're going to set sort parsed dot field, grab sort parsed dot sort. And if it's equal to ascending, we're going to set that as one. And if it's not, we're going to set that as negative one. And then we're going to do return sort formatted to give us our value. And we still need to call this function. So we're going to say sort formatted this is the variable and we're going to call generate. Actually, we're going to say Boolean is sort. So if it exists, we're going to do generate sort like that. Otherwise, we don't do anything. And this should be generate. The reason why we need this Boolean is to check if sort exists or not. If it doesn't exist, we're just going to give it an empty object. And then finally, what we need to do is set up our transaction search. So the way we do this is we're going to do await transaction.find like we normally do. Find. And actually, we need to import transaction import transaction from dot dot slash models slash transaction dot js. And that will allow us to use this variable and we can find and search what we need to look up. So we're going to do or and in here, I'm going to give it a cost with a regex new regex p search comma I like so. So now let me, let me go over what this is doing. So basically if we want to search, we can set this and we can search the cost value, like the cost params or the search field of cost. And we can do regex P with the search and we can check for <clears throat> All right, so let me explain what's happening over here. So over here, we are checking for cost 
and we're going to do a regular search with the search value that the user inputted. So this is a search term that if they want to search something specific, then they can give us a string and we'll set it over here. So this will allow us to search the cost field for us. And this or allows us to search multiple fields. So if I wanted to search up cost, then I can search up another one. Let's say we can search up user ID over here. So now we're searching both of these fields. Now there was an issue that I encountered with my data is that if I go to data transaction, I made this user ID, it needs to be an object ID format. MongoDB has this particular object ID format that you need to set, otherwise it's not gonna work. So here the user ID works, but not for these underscore ID. This needed to be in a different format, but for standard purposes, we're just gonna be able to search these two columns. So we can't search every single column, we're gonna only search these two columns. So keep that in mind. So over here, I'm just gonna get rid of that semicolon. I'm gonna do sort, and we're gonna go by sort formatted. So this will provide the query of sorting alongside this search right here. And then we're also gonna add skip, and we need to do page times page size. So that will allow us to skip to the proper page as well as the page size we need. And then we're also gonna limit to the page size of how many results we need. So we're gonna keep that. So now we have our transaction query. So this will give us all the things that we've formatted in terms of what the user requested on the front end. The only problem is with this is that transaction has a limited number, but we still need the total amount of queries because we need to display that information. So to do that, we're gonna run another query. So we're gonna to do total, we're gonna say await transaction dot count documents. So this will just give us the number of documents that exist in the Mongo database. So we're gonna set regex search and we're doing options of I. So we're basically counting with the search option that we've already found and we are setting the options and this will allow us to give us the total count. And with that, we can send the front end both the total number of documents that exist as well as all the transactions that we have. So I'm gonna write transactions and then total. All right, so that was quite the handful we're doing essentially we're grabbing the sort we're grabbing the page number and the page size as well as the search term and we're returning all that information or we're sending that information in our query so mongodb can give us the right information and then we send that information back to the front end all right from here now we can work on our front end so i'm going to close all these tabs close this we're going to go to our client and I'm going to go under source and then state API. So this is going to follow the similar path of what we've done before. So we're going to do get transactions. We're going to build dot query. And inside here, we're going to do query. And because this time we're actually going to have a decent number of params that we need to pass, this will look slightly different. So I'm going to, create a callback like we normally do. I'm gonna give it a page, page size, sort, and search. Like all the similar params that we were setting for the backend, we're passing it over here. And then we are going to return an object. And this is going to look a little different. And we are gonna pass an URL with client slash transactions, comma, a method of get, params of page, page size, sort, and search. 
like that. So now if you look at this, the format looks a little bit different from what we have written. This is if you need params, we're going to have to write it like this. This is essentially a shorthand that we can use if we're not using something like params or the body. But if we do have it, we have to write it in this format. And then from here, we're going to do provides tags. And we're going to set this as transactions. And by doing so, we need to set the transactions up here. And then in here, we're going to do use get transactions query, like so. And that will give us our hook. And then from here, I'm going to go to our app.js file, and we're going to import our transaction page. The transaction from scenes slash transactions like that. And we're going to create a route of path is equal to slash transactions. And we're going to give it an element with a transaction component and like that. And we're going to go to our scenes folder. We're going to create a new folder called this transactions and create a new index.jsx file inside here. And I'm going to do RF, R A F C E, paste that in and call this transactions. I'm going to save it. And then from here, I'm going to make some imports. So let me close that. So over here, I'm going to do use state with from React. I'm going to import data grid from Material UI data grid. Then I'm going to import use get transaction query from state API, import header from the header component we've created. And then from here, I can save it. I can go on to the transaction line. We're going to do const theme equals use theme for colors. And then we're going to create some values that we'll be sending to the back end. So values to be sent to the back end. And we're going to save this as state. So the first thing is going to be page. So set page is equal to use state. And we're going to initialize it with zero. And then we're going to set page size to set page size. We're going to do use state of 20. And then from here, we're going to do sort, do set sort equals use state. And we're going to start this with an empty object. And then we're going to do search. And we're going to do set search like this. So this is going to be use state. Empty string. And then from here, I'm going to grab the data and is loading from our query. So use get transaction query. And in here, we're going to pass an object and we're going to pass in page, page size, sort with json.stringify sort. So we're going to stringify the object that we have in our sort so that we can put this in a query string and we're going to put sort like that. So this is going to be the params that we're sending to the backend. And to double check everything works as expected, we're going to console log our data. And it's going to send these values. We have not set it to be dynamic at all yet. So it's just going to send these values, but we should still get an input back. And it does seem we do have some kind of error. So actually, let's go back. We're going to go to our server and we're going to go to our client JS get transactions. So this should be plural actually. And let me make sure, okay, this is commented out. So that's fine. We're going to save that. Let's see if this works. All right. So we have that to be worked. It seems like we do have another error over here where it says use theme is not defined. 
So if I go back to this, we are actually missing some imports. So we're going to miss box and use theme from at MUI slash material. So we're going to save that. So as usual, you can see a lot of the times I'm looking at these terminals and that helps me diagnose things that I've missed. All right, so I saved it. Let's go to our application and we're going to go to transactions to double check everything is as working. So we have our transactions value and we are getting the first 20 items and that's as expected. Perfect. And so if we go back, now we can create our columns. So I'm going to create columns over here and I create an array of objects. So a lot of what we had with customers, we can kind of copy. So I'm going to go to my customers file. I'm just going to copy everything over here and paste it. And we're just going to modify. All right. And then let me close this. Let me close all these tabs to avoid all the clutter. And then, so I'm going to have ID. That's good. This should be user ID instead. And we're going to call this user, user ID like that. This should be a flex of one. This should be created at, and this should be capitalized flex of one. We're just going to get rid of the phone number because we don't need that. We're going to change this country to products. And this one should be number of products. And what we're going to do is we're going to set sortable to false because we don't want this to be sorted because this one doesn't actually work properly. So we're going to do render cell and we're going to set params to be params.value.length. So here we're just going to grab the number of products instead. So we're grabbing the number of pr products this transaction has. And then finally, the last one we want is going to be the cost right here. I'm going to call this capital cost and I'm going to do render cell. I'm going to set this as params and this will be double dollar sign because we have a template string. This is going to be number and we're going to pass in params dot value and we're going to set this to fixed. So two dev small places. And by the way, this is not going to sort properly. This was my mistake because I created the data and I used the cost and I did not set this as a number. And that's why I mentioned this should be a number. If you wanted to sort this properly, it should be a number. But because we're sorting based on string, the sorting does not go from lowest dollar value to highest. All right, so from here, we're going to create a box like this. And inside here, we're going to set margin of 1.5 REM. So 2.5 REM for left and right. Then from here, we're going to set header. I'm going to give it a title of transactions, a subtitle of entire list of transactions. I'm going to close this. I'm going to set this as box. And inside our box, we're going to put data grid. This should have a height of 80 viewport height. So this one's going to be taller. And I'm going to go back to our customers. We can copy majority of this, of the SX that's coming over here. And there might be a couple modifications, virtual scroller for the... actually everything should be the same. Okay. And then from here in our data grid, we're going to set 
some of the same values. So we're going to do loading is equal to is loading. And we're going to change the data. We're going to do get row ID. And we're going to set row to return row dot underscore ID. We're going to set rows to be data and data dot transactions. Both of these have to exist for this to work. So we are setting both of those. So it's a little different from what we had before. And then we're going to set columns. So now this would be fine for a normal data grid, but we're doing server side. For server side pagination to work, now we can go to React Data Grid and we can search up server side pagination. So server side pagination, special configurations from the table. Actually, let's close that and then we can see that these are the things that we basically need. So we're going to have rows, row count. We're going to set the page, the page size, and the pagination mode should be to server. So a lot of these configurations will allow us to use server-side pagination in a very straightforward manner. So I'm just going to go over here, and I'm going to start taking a shot at all of those. So we're going to start with row count, and we're going to set this as data and data total. So the total is the number of values that we've sent and we need to set this to be the total data, the total amount of data that we needed. So that's what we are sending to be row count. And we're going to set pagination because we want this to be paginated page. We're going to give it a page of page, page size of the page size state that we've created. We're going to set the pagination mode to be server. We're going to set sorting mode to be server. We're going to set on page change. And we're going to set new page to be set page of new page like that. So this is a configuration for setting the new page. And we're just configuring our data grid to follow this format. And then we're going to set on page size change. And we're going to be setting new page size to be set page size with new page size like that. And on sort model change. So this is the sorting. We're going to set new sort model. And we're going to set this to be set sort. And we're going to do dot, 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 new sort model. And finally, what we need to create is we're going to have to create this column. But this column right here is a little bit custom. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to create my own toolbar. And you can create your own toolbar. They have custom data grid toolbar, MUI. You can, you can create custom toolbar as well. Somewhere over here. Yeah, right here. So typically you would just use grid toolbar, but if you want to create your own, you can create your own function toolbar and just pass that in into the component section of the data grid. So that's how you get this custom toolbar if you would like. And that's what we're going to do. So here I'm going to show you, you can pass in components and we're going to say toolbar. We're going to pass in data grid custom toolbar. So this is a component that we will be creating. So I'm going to import data grid custom toolbar. And we're going to put this in the components file over here. So I'm going to save that. If I go to components, I'm going to create a new file. I'm going to call this data grid custom toolbar.jsx. 
and then run R A F C E. And then in here, I'm going to do some imports. So I'm going to import search from MUI icons material. So we get the search icon. Then we're going to import icon button as well as text field. And then we're going to do input on Dorn Mint. So this is so we can create our own search component. And then we're going to import grid toolbar density selector. So this is how we can customize our toolbar. So we're going to do grid toolbar container, grid toolbar export, and grid toolbar columns button. So we're going to save that. Let me close this. And then we're going to import flex between as well. So once we have all of these, I'm going to go over here and I'm going to create grid toolbar container. Actually, this should be capitalized over here on line six. Say that this container and close this. So this is how you can create your own toolbar container and you just pass it in to data grid. So over here, I'm going to say flex between. We're going to give it a width of 100%. So it takes up the entire width. And we're going to do another flex between. And inside here, I'm going to give our toolbar. So these are all the toolbars that Material UI Data Grid comes with. We're just going to add the ones that we want. So we want Density Selector. We're going to add Grid Toolbar Export as well. And then below this, we want a text field. So this is going to be our search. So below this, we're going to give it a number of params over here. So we're going to do label is equal to search dot dot dot. SX is going to be margin bottom of 0 0.5 REM with a width of 15 REM. And on change, we are actually going to give it some other value. So we're going to say E is going to be set search input. And we're going to do e.target.value. So for now, let's ignore this. I will show you where this comes from. And the value is going to be search input. And this is also going to come from somewhere else. But we're going to ignore that for now. And the input props is going to be the end adornment. So this is if you want to customize the text field that you are creating. And we are doing that with like a search icon. And we're passing an input adornment. And we're going to set this position to be at the end. I'm sorry if I'm going a little too fast for this. I don't want to focus too much on the front end, but I just wanted to show you how we can customize our data grid. And then from here, we can do icon button. We're going to close this. And inside the icon button, we can do on click. And we are going to just have an empty function. We'll add something soon. And then right here, we're going to have our search icon. By doing this, we now have something that's going to be passed into our component. So if we take a look at our current app, we have our search, we have the columns, we have everything we essentially need. So this is looking pretty good. We can do this. We can even sort. We can sort by user ID. Same with over here. Um, but search is not going to be working just yet. The page size 20 is not a preset. OK. I will cover that shortly. All right, so going back, we have our data grid. We have everything. Now, the only thing about search is the problem is we can typically pass in set search over here. But 
we don't want it to search every time we type because that's what's going to happen. If I pass in set search over here, it's going to make an API request anytime we search. Now, one alternative is to debounce it, but I just want to search when they hit the search button. So what we're going to do instead is we're going to create a separate we're going to create a separate state and we're going to call this search input. Set search input and this will be the temporary state that we will set. So we're going to keep track of what the search input is at the moment and when they hit the search button we are going to set this value. And anytime this value changes, then we are going to make an API request. So that's how Redux Toolkit query will work. So anytime these values are going to be changed, set page, set page size, it's automatically going to make another API request. So you got to make sure you are aware of that. And now you might ask, how do we pass this in to DataGrid custom toolbar? Because we're just passing in the component like this. There's no room for props. But the way you would do it is a little, a little out of it, but it's pretty simple. So you do component props and we can say toolbar and in an object, we're just going to set search input. We're going to set set search input and we're going to do set search like this. And then we can save it and that will allow us for us to grab those values inside our data grid custom toolbar. So here we're going to do search input and do set search input and then do set search. And because of this, we can now uncomment this out. And in our on click, we can, we can configure our settings. So Anytime we do set search, or if someone clicks the search button, we're going to do set search. We're going to set the value over here, and we're going to set search input as an empty string, like so. So let me <laughs> recap everything, because it looks a little confusing. So set search input is going to be this value, what I would call the temporary search value. So anytime we make a change, it's going to change this state. That's what on change will be doing. We're also grabbing the search input as the current value. But when you click the search button, we're going to set the actual search text using set search once they click it. And we're going to also clear out the temporary set search input. So if that makes sense, we're basically using two states to keep track of our search. And finally, to address the warning we were having, we need to set rows per page options. So this is like the options that we want to set. And we want to keep only 20 items and then 50 and then 100. So these are options that they can choose for their values. And finally, I want to change the text field variant so it looks just a little better just for me. I'm going to do a variant and we're going to set this as standard. So we do that. We can now see the search looks like this. We have columns, so we can change the number of columns that they can see at some point. So the user has access to all of this. They can change the density. We can export this as a CS CSV or print it. And for the search, we can do a little bit of a search. Let's say 3.3. Three. And we're going to search up everything that has 3.3 three in there, in the user ID and the cost. Remember it. Because we have a date and we have an object ID for the ID, we can't really search these two columns. And number of products is not something we can search on the back end. We would have to implement a search on the front end for this. So that's why we have some issues with it. So if you ever want to implement for all the columns, you're going to have to make sure your ID is in the right format when you create the mock data, as well as the created at, which is going to be the proper date. But with that, we have our entire transactions. Everything gets sorted on the server. This is a very common issue people have, and you 
happen to do this quite frequently for a lot of data tables that you do. So this is very valuable information to place into data grid and data grid provides you a lot of easy ways to do these things because otherwise this would be this would be a lot of work for you to put this into some kind of other table and add server side pagination with a lot of manual work. All right, so here is going to be the next page. So we're going to work on geography. So this is actually a chart that is based on user information that we have. So we have Based on this, China has a lot of users that we have, 53 to 60. And then we have, we don't have that many USA users, for example, 60 or six of them. Brazil has nine, so on and so forth. So this will show us where our users are located, which is very nice. So we're going to go back. We're going to go to our server. And I want to show you that we do have all the country information in our users. So country information, this is India. I don't, I'm not exactly sure, but country CN represents China, for example. So we can continue looking at all the other countries. I'm not exactly sure what all these countries stand for, like AR, not too sure what that Armenia, but anyway, so we can go to index.js and we are going to Anyways, so we can go to our client page and now we can add the geography route. So I'm going to go under this, going to write router.get and we're going to write slash geography and we're going to get geography function that we have not created. So we're going to do get geography. So I, like I said, all the country values are existing in the user. So we don't actually have to create a new model for this. So we're going to go to controllers, go to client, and we're going to be creating another function over here. And this is going to be called export const get geography. And we're going to do async rec res like so. And we're just going to copy this last part we're just going to start with try and i'm going to paste that over here so we have our mp try so the first thing we need to do is we're going to grab the users so we do that by await and we're going to do user dot find and by the way i guess i haven't mentioned this i probably should have mentioned this a long time ago but you can find a lot of these you can figure out how to call our apis on the mongoose docs. So if you wanted to call, you can find it dot find. So if you want to just find specific things or you want to find all the documents, it's all on this mongoose page. Link in the description below if you want to find it. I probably should have told you guys about that earlier. It's just hard to remember everything I want to <laughs> communicate because there's so many different moving pieces here. Um, all right, so from here, I'm going to do mapped locations and I'm going to say users dot reduce. So what we need to do, what I'm trying to do is I'm going to try and format this in the way that Nevo charts wants us to. So if I go Nevo chloropress chart, so this is the chart that we're going to send information to. We need to make the data look like this. So we have an ID and a value. The value is the amount of users that we want to set that, but the ID is going to be the country. So this has three val three characters, whereas our format is two characters. So what we're going to be using is we're going to be using a specific package. We actually need a package that we have not installed. And we have an error but that's because we haven't finished this and save it. But I'm going to close this actually. I'm going to do NPM I and we're going to grab a package called country slash country dash ISO two ISO dash two two 
three. This will help us convert the two country symbol to three country symbol. And that's what we are going to do in this function over here with our reduce. So in our reduce, if you guys know the reduce function in JavaScript, we're going to have an ACC, an accumulator value that we can pass along across every instance or every loop. This value goes through each item. And we're also going to destructure out country from each of those values. So from here, we're going to do an arrow function. And I'm going to set const country ISO 3. And we're going to get country ISO 3 from country. And we actually need to import this from the package that we just got. Get country ISO 3 from country ISO 2 to 3. So this will allow us to convert the country to the proper format that we need. And in here, basically if the accumulator, so the accumulator is going to be in object. So hopefully you guys know what reduce is basically doing. We start with this empty object and we can add things to this object for each item as we go along. But basically, if our country doesn't already exist as a key property, then we are going to set the value to be zero. Actually, it should be one, I believe. But if it already exists, actually, no, this should be zero. Sorry, this is zero because we're going to increment that value below this. So we're going to do country ISO 3 and we're going to increment that. And we're going to return the object. So basically for every single one of our users, we're going to grab the country value. We're going to convert it to the ISO 3 format. And we're going to add it to this object if it doesn't exist. And if it doesn't exist, we're going to set that value, that country, the three format country of zero. And once we have done that, we're going to increase that value. And we're going to return that accumulator. So in the end, we're going to have an object that lists all the countries as our key. And the value is going to represent the number of users in that country. And with that, we're going to do one more loop because this is still not in the format we want. This will just make it more convenient for us to do our final formatting. So we're going to do object.entries. We're going to pass in mapped locations. And we're going to map through what we just used using object on entries. So this is going to have key value pairs. And the key value is going to be country. The value is going to be count. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to return an object of ID of country and the value of count. So now this is the proper format that Nevo charts for the geography chart that we need. This will be the format that it can read. And with that, we can do res.status200 and we're just going to send that value, like the formatted val formatted locations, to the front end. It's a bit of a hassle, but sometimes you do have to do a lot of these conversions, especially on the back end, to properly format so the front end can use. Or you can do this formatting in the front end. It doesn't really matter for different scenarios. Sometimes you generally want to do the formatting in the back end as much as possible. All right, and then from here, I'm going to close everything out. I'm going to open our directory, close up the server. We're going to go to our source. We're going to go to our state, and we're going to go back to our API. So here, I'm going to do get geography like we have done before. And this one's pretty simple, so we're going to do build. 
not build queries, build.query. And we're going to pass in query in arrow function of client slash geography. And in here, I'm going to do provides tags with an array of geography. I'm going to pass this up here into our tag types. I'm going to save it. And then we are going to do use get geography query. And then from here, I'm going to go to app.js and we are going to create the component. So import geography from scenes slash geography. So component we have not created and then a route for that component. So slash geography element of the component. We're going to close that and then we're going to go to components, actually, sorry, scenes, create a new folder, call this geography and create an index file in here for that geography component. And then we're going to do RFCE and we're going to create the geography component like this. And here we're going to make some imports. So we're going to import box from MUI material as well as use theme. And I'm going to import use, so use get geography curry from state slash API, import header from components slash header. So for us to have like a world map that looks like this, we actually need to copy and paste some information. So if you go to the Chloropleth website, nevo.rock slash Chloropleth, you can find the file used for this example. And you're going to have to pass the features value. So this is a very large file. You can click raw over here. We're going to, we're going to hit command all, and we're just going to copy this file. So this gives us the information to create the geography data. And where I'm going to put this is going to just be in state. We're just going to say geo data.js and we're just going to paste everything in there. And it's a huge file, but we're going to save it. And actually, because this is not a JSON file, we need to do export const geo data is equal to this object. And that should technically save. And I think it will. It's just a huge file. Yeah, there we go. Everything works. So we can go back to our file. And there's another, there's a couple more things I want to import. I'm going to import responsive chloropleth. So that's the chart that we're going to be using. And then we're also going to import geo data, which is the stuff that we just created or we just copied over. And in here, I'm going to do const theme is equal to use theme. And we're going to do const data is equal to use get geography query. And we're going to grab that information. And just like we usually do, we're going to do console log for the data just to make sure our API endpoint is working as expected. So I'm going to close this out. If I go to React app, I'm going to go to actually, I need to make sure my server is running. So make sure your server is running over here. It's working as proper. So I'm going to go to geography. And as you can see, we have our information and it's in the format. Like I mentioned, the ID is representing the country. The value represents the number of users over there. So we have all our data ready to go. And so from here, I'm going to close this terminal so you guys can see better remove this console log because we don't need to worry about that. We're going to do box and pass in margin of 1.5 REM, 2.5 REM, like we normally did. And then in here, I'm going to give it a header, give it the title of geography capitalized with a subtitle 
of find where your users are located. And we're going to have a box component. And in here, I'm going to give it a margin top of 40 pixel, height of 75 viewport height. So these are all configurations that I've showed that makes a lot of sense or it looks very nice with these settings. So I'm going to give it a border with a shorthand, one pixel, a solid border, and we're going to give the color of theme.palette.secondary200. And I'm going to set a border radius of four pixel. And inside this, I'm going to say data will be, this will be where our responsive chloroplet will exist, but I'll get to that in very short. And over here, I'm just going to do loading like so. So for our responsive chloropleth, now I could put the, the component over there, but instead we're going to go to this page on the chloropleth. We're going to go to the chart and we can make modifications over here. So the way I want to format this is I can just change things like this make different settings, I can rotate, but I'm going to keep a lot of these the same. The one thing I want to get rid of is these like lines over here, which is something you get rid of with the fills. Actually, we'll just manually do that. We can get rid of the graticules or basically the grid if you want to. Um, this represents the graticule, okay, so that's if you want to change the lines. We want to make it interactive. We want to keep these legends. Okay, I think that's perfect. So I'm going to go over here, grab this code, and we're just going to modify a lot of it. So I'm going to copy, and we're just going to erase this, and then paste it, and we're going to have our information over here. So what I don't want is going to be these fills. So all the weird like polka dot and the dots that you have, those are the fills, but we don't want any of those. We also don't need any definitions, which kind of goes along with the filling. And we're just gonna modify a few things. So let me take a look. The features, so one of the mandatory things we need to do is this feature needs to be the geodata that we copied over and it needs to be the features parameter. So make sure you have this properly set. The margin that we have for this is going to be negative 50. So we want to make sure we have those. And let me check, I don't think we want any of the colors for default, so we're just going to erase this. I'm going to keep this to point to projection scale should be 150. Projection translation is going to be 0.45 and then 0.6 over here. I'm going to get rid of the graticule line color. We don't need that. We're going to set a border width of 1.3 and a border color of FFF, so basically white. We want the legend to be bottom right instead. We want the translate Y should be negative 125, translate X of zero. Left to right, this item text color should be instead theme.palette.secondary200. And then when we hover over it, we actually want this to be a theme.palette.background of alt color. So now this is a lot of like, this is based on your preference. So you're gonna have to choose the colors that you particularly want. And here you can customize it further using the theme property over here. Nevo has some charts for you, but 
or has some documentation for customizing this, but I'll show you what we want to customize. So we're going to have access and we're going to set the domain over here and we're going to set the line and we're going to set the stroke to be theme.palette.secondary200. And then in this domain, under the domain, we're going to set the legend to be a have a color text fill of theme. Let me remove the E. We're basically going to set all of these to the same color. So I'm going to go down. I'm going to set the ticks to be line of stroke with the same color and a stroke width of one and a text color of fill and we're going to set the setting over there and then finally we need to set the legends to have a text and a fill of the same color and below this I'm going to set the tooltip to be container color and this one is actually going to be primary dot main. Make sure this fill doesn't have any. So I modified that. And let's actually double check. We don't have any errors, so that's good. So if I go back to my app and we have everything as we need. Let's refresh it, make sure everything works. So nice, we have a lot of these settings. The only thing I've noticed is that these are not the correct values. These should be much smaller. So for example, Russia should have 24. So that zero to 110K does not, is not correct. So to change that, we just need to go and change the domain to 60. So that will go, this basically is the min and the max value. So our min max values are way less than what they had. And then now we have our perfect numbers. So these correspond correctly. And we have a nice geographic chart of where our users are located. So we have a lot of users in China, a lot of users in Russia, no users in Australia, same with this. So the next thing we're gonna build is going to be the Nevo line chart which here is going to be the overview page. And this will show the overall general revenue and profit that was made in this year. And we're gonna have two different views, which is the units and sales view. So let's get started. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna to go to our models folder in our server. And we're gonna create a new file and it's gonna be called overallstat.js. In this file, I'm gonna copy over everything in product just to make our lives easier. And we are going to select our product schema and we're gonna say overall stat schema, like so. And I'm gonna change the product to be overall stat. And inside here, we're gonna change the key properties. So we're gonna start with total customers and this will be number, yearly sales, total should be a number as well yearly total sold units is going to be a number year is also going to be a number and then monthly data should be actually we should just we can copy over a lot of this both the monthly data and the daily data and we're just going to paste it over here so it should be essentially the same and then we're also going to have sales by category. And we're going to create a map, which is basically an object in JavaScript. And we are going to have a value of a number. So the key will be the string, basically the category, for example, shoes or clothing or something like that. And the value will be the number. So we're just going to have an object for sales by category. And you create objects via map in mongoose then we're going to keep the timestamps as well so i'm going to close this we're going to go to our index.js and now we're going to be importing our model stat from dot slash 
models slash overall stat dot js and from our data we're going to import overall stat just to note in our data if i go find data overall stat it's only going to be one object that will have our month and all 365 days for 2021 but we're not going to have any other years so just keep in mind I've only put 2021 for our stats to make it comprehensive. And then finally, below here, I'm going to paste in overall stat dot insert many. And we're going to put data overall stat like so. And let's see, we have our server running. And we're going to save it, make sure our data goes into our Mongo database correctly. So we should go to MongoDB, go to our cloud, refresh this page. I'll probably need to re-log in. And after I re-logged in, I'm in the collections page. I see the overall stats and I see our data as expected. So perfect. So you can see monthly data is just going to be an array. Sales by category is also going to be an object as well. All right. And then from here, I'm going to comment this out so we don't add duplicate data. I'm going to save it. And then we're going to go to our routes page and we're going to go to our sales file now. So here I'm going to create router.get and this is going to be slash sales and get sales like this. And then we're going to import get sales from actually this should be in curly braces. from dot 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 slash controllers slash sales dot js. So this is a function we have not created yet. And for this, just F specifying for the routes for sales, the sales page, there's four of them, but they're all going to use the same endpoint because this has all the statistics. And this is a nice way because we only need to build one endpoint for four different pages because we're all, we're using the same pieces of data for that page. All right, and then else, let's go to sales.js in our controller page and we're going to import overall stat and this should be .js, so don't forget that. And we're going to export const get sales and we're going to write async rec res and we're going to do a try catch block again. And I'm just going to write this one manually. So we're going to do res.status 404.json. And we're going to pass in a message, error.message. Save it. And inside our try block, this should be pretty simple. So we're going to grab the overall stats as a variable. And we are going to call overall stat.find and we're just going to grab everything from that database. And we're going to do res.status 200.json. And what we're going to be sending to the front end, so this is going to be an array. But in our array, like I mentioned, we only have one data point, which is going to be. 2021, we have the stats for 2021. So we're just going to be sending that information. So we're just going to send the first version of that just for this case. So we're going to save that. And our sales route is pretty much good to go. So we're just going to close this. And now we can go to our front end. Okay, so here on the front end, we're going to go to the source directory file. We're going to go to state api.js. And we're going to do what we normally do. And here we're going to put get sales. We're going to do build.query like so. And we're going to get a query. We're going to put a callback function. And here we're going to put sales slash sales. I know it's a little weird for that endpoint, but that's just how the routes ended up. And then from here, I'm going to do provides tags. And we're going to put sales like so. And we're going to make sure we add that 
to the tag types. And for our export, we're going to do use get sales query to export that value. And then from here, we're going to go to our app.js file and we're going to import overview component, which we have not created yet. So it's going to come from scenes overview like that. And in our routes, we're going to add that. So we're going to do path slash overview and we're going to set the element to be overview like this component. And we're going to close that as well. So I'm going to go now into components, actually scenes, and I'm going to create a new folder called overview. And inside this folder, I'm going to create a file called index.jsx. Let me just make sure. Okay, scenes, everything is correct. So here I'm going to close it. I'm going to say RFCE and call this overview. Inside here, I'm going to do some imports. So I'm going to import use state. I'm going to import form control from MUI material, menu item, input label, box, select. And then we're going to import header from components header. And finally, I'm going to import overview chart from components overview chart. So this is a component that we have not created, but this is going to have our line chart. And the reason why I'm creating this separately is because this is going to be used on the dashboard. Anytime you have a component that's going to be reused in multiple places, we're going to place them in the components file because those are where our shared components will be used. And then from here, I'm going to do const view set view like so i'm going to set the use state to be units so this will be the toggle between the two views inside this div i'm going to set this to be a box i'm going to be closing this box as well i'm going to set this as margin with 1.5 rem top and bottom and 2.5 rem left and right and inside here, I'm going to set the header. We're going to say title will be overview. And the subtitle will be overview of general revenue and profit. And then below this, I'm going to set a box. Make sure we close that. I'm going to have a height of 75 viewport height. And inside here, I'm going to create the form control. So this is going to be the drop down where we can switch between the sales and the units. And form control is a way to group our information and data or our UI basically. So I'm going to close this, give it a margin top of one REM. And in here, I'm going to do input label and I'm going to set as view. Below this, I'm going to set select with the value of view label of capital view on change. And it's going to be E and we're going to set this as set view with E dot target dot value. And inside the select, we're going to do menu item with the value of sales and sales will be the item. And below this, we're going to change this one to be units. And this should be capitalized. And we have our drop down right here. And below this, oops, didn't mean to delete that. Below this, we're going to have the overview chart we have not created. And we're going to pass in something called view. So that will change the display of our chart depending on what the view is. So I'm going to save it right now. It's not going to be working because we need to go to our components file and we're going to be creating our overview chart, JSX. 
In here, I'm going to do RFCE. And we have our overview chart. And then we're going to do some imports. So I'm going to import responsive line. Actually, our IntelliSense is not detecting that. Let me make sure we have the correct. All right, so I'm missing one package, and that should be at Nevo slash line. So we're going to open this up. I'm going to close this terminal. I'm going to run npm i at Nevo slash line. So this is the package we need to create our line charts. And once we have that, I'll be running that. We now should have Nivo that line. Our IntelliSense has picked that up, so we can import that. All right, I'm going to close our terminal once again, and I'm going to import use theme from Material UI. And then here is where I'm going to import our use get sales query. So our API call that we're going to make will be in this chart because we're going to be using the same data for both the charts on the dashboard and the current page that we're on. And then from here, we're going to import use memo from React. Actually, this should be up here. So you do comma use memo and we can just get rid of this. And inside here, we're going to have actually two parameters. We're going to say is dashboard is equal to false. And we're going to set this as view. So I know we didn't write this one, but because I have a default param, we can set this. This is basically an optional parameter. And by default, it is not the dashboard view. So if we are working on the overview chart where it has is dashboard equals true, then we can make adjustments to the UI based on that. And that's what we kind of need to do for our dashboard. So here I'm going to do const theme is equal to use theme. And I'm going to grab data and is loading. And you're going to do use get sales query. We're going to invoke that. And before we move further, I am going to save this. I'm going to console log. And then I'm going to run our server once again. OK, once we console log and we have our website running, we go to our overview page. We can see that our data is logged. I did notice that we are actually missing daily data. So I have made a mistake in our models. So if you go back to overall stat, daily data is an object, but it should be an array of objects like that. And I did copy this from product stat. So daily data in the product stat also has this issue. So I'm going to change this. And as you can see, if you go back to Mongo database, overall stats didn't have daily data as well as product stats as well. So what we're going to do, and this is a good, good learning experience. If you want to reinsert the data, it's safest to drop the collection, meaning you're just going to delete the data and we're just going to reinsert it. So I'm going to go to overall stats. I'm going to delete that one as well. And then when I go back, I'm going to go to index.js and I'm going to go over here and I'm going to insert product stat and overall stat. And we're going to make sure we save that and let's see if that works. Okay, it looks like it ran. So I'm going to refresh our database and we can go to our overall stats. And now we can see our daily data. Same with over here. This should be product stats. We have our daily data. Cool. So if I refresh this page, we should see the daily data being populated. Perfect. So this is how you can diagnose database problems. You can delete and reinsert them if you need to. And with that, let's actually uncomment these. Oops, I don't know why I was clicking on that. We're just going to comment those 
back out. So we're going to save it. I'm going to close all these tabs and I'm going to work on overview chart. So we have our data. It's working as expected. So I'm going to delete the console log. So here is going to be where we format our data so that we can input that into our line chart. Now there's always a question of whether you should format the data on the back end or the front end, but there's no general clear cut answer when those things should take place. Here in this case, we have a back end where we have a sales endpoint that we are going to grab information from because we are going to use that endpoint for four different pages. It makes sense that we're going to do our formatting on the front end for each of those pages while the data stays in the format that works for all four pages. So we're going to do some calculations on the client. As long as the calculations aren't too extensive on either client or the back end, usually you're pretty safe. So here we're going to create a create a variable called total sales line and total units line like this. And here I'm going to do use memo. So we're going to use use memo, not use meme. We're going to use use memo to make sure this doesn't recalculate anytime we don't want it to. So the time we want it to recalculate is when the data changes but we shouldn't recalculate this information any other time aside from when it loads. And so if we do not have any kind of data though, we want to return an empty array. So we don't want anything happen, so we don't break it. However, we're gonna grab the monthly data from the data set, and we're gonna grab total sales line is equal to ID of total sales with a color of theme dot palette dot secondary dot main and the data is going to start off with an empty array. So this format, the reason why I'm doing ID color and data is because if you go back, now we're going to go to Nevo and we're going to go find the line chart, which is going to be right here. Sorry, it took me a while to find that. If you go back to the data, you can see this is the format that we have for each line. We have an ID representing what that line represents and then a color as well as a data with an array of objects that represent X and Y. So we want to format this in this correct way that's why we have this particular line. So here I'm going to do const total units line. So we're basically creating both of these lines in that same format. We're just going to change a few things. Total units, I'm going to set this one as a different color. So this is going to be 600 instead. We're going to leave the data blank. And now what we're going to do is we're going to grab the values of monthly data. So monthly data, if you look at what the data represents, so I go back data, monthly data is going to have month, total sales, and total units. So that's how this information is coming back. So we're gonna be formatting that, and we're gonna use reduce, and we are going to grab the accumulator, which is going to be an object. And here we're going to grab the month, total sales, and total units from each monthly object. And our secondary value is going to be, if I go over here, I can set an object that has of sales of zero and units of zero. So we want to keep track of sales and then the units. So we have an accumulating line. So basically, if you take a look at the final build, what we're trying to calculate on the overview chart is an accumulating value that 
increases over time. So basically, we're going to add January, February, March, April, May, June. We're just going to add it to each number. And we're basically keeping track of the Y value for every single month. So we're basically adding it. So we're not displaying every month's sales or every month's unit sales. We're actually keeping track of the total unit sales up to date that year. So that's exactly why we're keeping track of the sales and the units. So we're looping through this once so we keep track of both sales and units. So this is more efficient than looping through both of them on two separate loops. So here we're going to grab cur current sales and we're going to set acc.sales plus total sales. So we're just adding the current sales for that month and we're going to do the same thing for the units. So current units. So we're going to grab units over here and we're going to grab total units over here. And then what I'm going to do is just grab total sales line dot data and I'm going to create an array over here and I'm just going to add total sales line dot data and I'm just going to add that month's value to this object. So I'm grabbing this guy and I'm basically copying what already exists in the data and we're putting that particular month and sales value. So while we're looping through, we're just adding each one to our line data. So this will build the line and this will keep track of the current amount that's being sold up to date that year. So hopefully that makes sense. This is just more calculations. So you just, it's always going to be different depending on your needs, but this is what you can say is what you would kind of see in the wild, like an algorithmic question. You won't have to do all those like binary trees majority of the time when you're actually doing algorithms for front end and back end. A lot of times it's going to be something like this. And then here we're going to set this as current units like that. And we are going to return the sales with the current sales. So we're keeping track of it and the units. So if you don't fully understand this, just take a look at what's happening. It's not too complicated. It looks intimidating just because the calculation, you probably aren't, you aren't the one doing it, but it's something that you would, when you think of the problem, it will make sense to you. Anyways, so let's keep going. And here I'm just going to have a fail check, which is going to be data and is loading. So if either of those are true, we're just going to return the loading, the loading string. And then from here, I'm going to go to the line chart. I'm going to look at this and now here I can format different things. So X format, I don't think that really does anything, but if I go down, we don't want area. So if you wanted area, you can change that. But if I go down, I want to keep the points. The point size is okay. Point label. Uh, we definitely don't want the point label. Let me double check. We don't have any grid. So in this case, we don't want any grid. So we can keep like, keep our information like that. We have is interactive use mesh. I think, I think that's all, that's all we want to do for now. We're going to make some modifications after we do this, but I will show you the modifications. But with this, we're ready to go to put our line chart and the data, we're going to have a different view depending on the different views. So we're going to do view. If that's equal to sales, we're going to use the total sales line chart. 
Otherwise, we're going to use the total units line. So this is why we have those two different lines, and we're calculating those. Okay, we also did have a warning. Okay, that's because we actually just wanted to change only when it's only when it's like the data changes. We don't want it to change in any other scenario. So I'm just going to get rid of this warning. I happen to do this quite frequently. I don't know why it's still part of ESLint cuz a lot of times I don't I need to not <laughs> require the exhaustive depths because you want it to only re-render at certain times. So I'm not entirely sure why they have that still on by default. But anyways, we have a margin. The margin should be 20. And this is just from me experimenting. There's no like trick to this. It's just me wanting to place things in the right spot. We're going to have a type. Linear audio stacked should be false. So stacked represents the fact that if you have two different lines, they will stack on top of each other, which you kind of don't want. But in this case, it probably actually doesn't matter. And actually, there is something I missed, which is going to be a curve. The other one was a very straight line. But if you want more of a curvy line, you can put catmull rom. And it is in the line chart over there, but I just didn't find it. And then there's one thing I want to do for axis bottom. So I want to format this because this is based on month. And if we are on the dashboard page, which I have not covered yet, but if we're on the dashboard page, it's too long. So you want the month to be concatenated or cut to a three letter string from January to J A N. So if we're on the dashboard page, we want to do return v dot slice zero comma three. So it makes sense. We're on the axis bottom. We're formatting that. So we're going to return v dot slice zero three. Otherwise, we need to make sure we return just regular v. So this will depend on if we're on the dashboard. If the, because on the dashboard it's like there's less space, that's why we need to cut this. All right, and then from there, the legend should not be transportation, but we're going to say if we have a dash, if we're on the dashboard, we want no legend because there's not lots of space, like I mentioned. Otherwise, we want a legend the month. And by the way, the reason why, as you can see, I'm changing a lot of this with based on the dashboard. The dashboard just ends up simply doesn't have enough space. That's the main reason why I'm doing that. And the same thing with count. Here I'm going to do is dashboard. We're not going to put anything. Otherwise, I'm going to do a template string. I'm going to say total. I'm going to say view is equal to sales. I'm going to set this to revenue. If we're on the sales version and then units, if it's not so for year. Legend offset should be negative 60 for this one. So we turned off grid. We're going the point size is OK. Everything else is good. And now we don't want legend for is dashboard. So again, we're going to do is dashboard over here. So basically, if it's not the dashboard, we're going to have this. Otherwise, we're going to set this to be undefined. So this aligns over here with this curly brace. Actually, it aligns over here. So I'm going to do undefined like that. I'm going to save it. And we're going to have the values that we want. Let me make sure we need to translate the X for the legend from, neg from 30. The Y should be negative 40. And then from there, I believe everything looks pretty good. And then with that, we actually need to set the theme like we did before. So if I go back to 
where was the other chart? We wanted to change our chart in geography. So if I go and copy the theme section, so theme allows you to change a lot of the colors. I'm going to copy that over. And I think for the most part, we should be good. Let's save it. Let's make sure everything's running. We have no errors. And we're gonna go back to our app. We do seem to have an error. Undefined is not iterable. So we're gonna go back and we're gonna check that. Okay, so the reason why we have an undefined for iterable is because we did not add the total sales line for return. <laughs> so we actually, we're returning this as empty. So you need to return in array. We're going to return total sales line, making sure that that aligns with that. And it needs to be in an array. And we're going to also add total units line as well. And we're going to make sure we return that. So if we go to our current app, now we can see our chart. So I'm going to refresh it. You can see that we have our perfect line chart. So this is a little, the data is a little unrealistic. The units have a similar value to the sales, but sales should typically be more because that's the price. Whereas total units will be just like the number of items sold, but this is the best we got with our data. So this should be pretty good. Next in line is going to be the daily chart. So the daily chart is going to be a list using the same pieces of data. We can see how many sales per day and how many units per day. So we can also use a date range picker. So we can choose how many days we want to see. So this is pretty cool. You can see which day you want to see and it'll be based on that information. So I can see more than all of this. So we can see like a 30 day chart, for example, almost like this, but this allows us to choose the proper dates. So this is pretty cool. So from here, we're going to go to a scenes folder and we're going to create a new folder and we're going to call this daily. And we're going to put a file in here and we're going to call this index.jsx. And I am going to create our skeleton component with RFCE and we're going to do the daily. So in this case, we actually don't need to make a component in the components folder because the daily chart we're not going to be using in the in the uh, was it the dashboard page. So we're just going to have the daily chart component in the page itself. And so here we can actually we can actually open this up. We can go to overview and I'm just going to copy the imports that we just created because it's going to be very similar, just a few different additions as well. So here I'm going to have use memo <clears throat> and we're going to have, we actually don't need a lot of this. We can just keep box and use theme. We're also going to import use get sales query. And this is the first time we're actually using the same API endpoint for a different page. And that's ideal. If you can use the same different data points for the same or for like a different page or a different UI, that's usually ideal. Not all the time, but you can make it so that you're basically using the same pieces of information for different views. So it's efficient in a way. And then from here, we're also going to import date picker. So date picker will allow us to grab different dates based on the ranges. And so if we go to react date picker, like so, we can go and go to this GitHub and we can see the demos that they have. This is a simple and reusable date picker. It's pretty simple. You can use whatever date picker you want, but you can go to this page and it has a lot of the examples. And so the one we're basically using is going to be the date range. So we're essentially going to be using information that's very similar to what we have. We're not going to be styling this because I want to keep 
keep this more focused on the back end, but I'll show you how to do the functionality. And basically when you're installing and using this, you want to make sure you import their CSS. So you can go to this page, which is in the link in the description and grab this information right here. And you can just paste it above right here. And with that, we are going to have two different states. So we need to keep track of our dates. We're going to keep track of the start date and we're going to have a function that controls it. So set start date and we're going to say use state and we're going to put new date like this. And I'm going to do 2021 zero two zero one. So we're just going to have this as a default date. Like you can choose whatever date you want if you want. But here I'm going to copy this. I'm going to choose end date. Change this E to a lowercase and we should set this as zero three zero one. And then from here, I'm going to grab the data from our use get sales query. And we're going to grab theme for our colors. And inside here, we're going to format our data once again, because we need to massage our data a little bit to get it in the format we want it to. So I'm going to create our skeleton for this, make sure based on that, we need to ignore ESLint, disable line exhaustive depths. Was that correct? React hooks slash exhausted them. And to be fair, a lot of this information that's going to be passed into use memo will be kind of similar to overview. So we're just going to go back to the overview chart and I'm just going to copy everything and we're just going to modify this. We might, yeah, let's just copy everything, but we're just going to modify this quite a bit. So, Instead of monthly data, we're going to change this to daily. Grab the total sales line. This is fine. Same with the units. And we're going to grab the daily data over here. And inside here, we're actually just going to get rid of most of this because this is not going to be reduced. We're going to do for each. And here I'm going to grab date, total sales, total units like this. I'm going to close this. And inside here, I'm going to do date formatted is equal to new date. And we're going to pass in the date that we have. So that comes from the date inside of each daily data. So we're going to make sure we're doing that in the correct format. And then we're also going to do an if check to make sure everything is okay. The date formatted has to be greater than or equal to start date. And date formatted has to be less than the equal to end date. So this will allow us to chart the line only within the range of start date and end date. So this is what's actually happening. And then in here, we're going to have to change our date a little bit. We're going to do split date. We're going to do date dot substring. We're going to do date dot index of, I'm going to pass in a dash. I'm going to hit plus one. So essentially we're just grabbing the correct parts of the date. And we're going to make sure we grab the part after the dash. And then here, we're just going to grab these two pieces of information because it's very similar. I'm going to grab total sales line dot data, and I'm going to set the month instead to be the split date. And we're grabbing the total sales 
and the total units, like so. So again, this split date basically is so we grab the current relevant date because a lot of the date information we actually don't need. So if you console log it, you can see all the dates and you can see that we need to make sure we format it correctly. And then from here, I'm going to do formatted data and we're going to set this to be total sales line and then total units line. So it's similar. I just kind of did this a little bit differently. Instead of returning these arrays of arrays, we're just going to return formatted data like so. And the reason why it's, this is different is because we're displaying two lines at once as opposed to before. And in here, we're actually going to add a few more um, params. So this entire hook will get re-rendered anytime start date, end date, and the data changes. So we actually needed to add these two guys. And with that, we have our formatted data. Now we just need to create that information over here. So in here, I'm going to set a box. We're going to set margin of 1.5 REM, 2.5 REM for left and right. I'm going to set the header. And this should be title of daily sales with the subtitle of chart of daily sales. I'm going to close that. I'm going to say box with a height of 75 viewport height. And inside here, I'm going to do a box with the display of flex with justify content of flex end. And inside here, I'm going to put the date picker. And the date picker requires a few parameters. So I'm going to go back to our page. I'm going to copy this actually. Yeah, I know I already wrote it, but let's just paste that. And we have start date, which is good. Set start date, select start, start date, end date. Everything is pretty. Yeah, we don't even need to change this. And then we have this box. And below this, this is where we're going to place our line. And fortunately, we don't have to go back to grab a line again. We can just go to overview chart. We can actually just copy everything and we're just going to make some adjustments. And below this, we're just going to have loading like so. And where we have our data, we're just going to put formatted data like that. And let's see, we can keep this top margin of 50, bottom of 70, left of 60. We're going to keep going down. I'm actually going to add something called colors and we want to put datum color. So this allows us to use the color data that we have inside our data instead. So otherwise this would just not be the default color. Okay. And then the tick rotation is going to be 90 because we want the axis to be rotated over here. We're going to do legend offset of 60, meaning it moves it down. We don't need the is dashboard over here. And then this legend just could be total as well because we don't have any differences between dashboard. This should be negative 50 instead. And then we keep going down, false, false. We don't need the is dashboard anymore. So I can just get rid of those. Save it. We're going to have an anchor of top right instead. So I want to place it at the top right. 
This is a better placement for this one. Translate X should be 50. Translate Y should be zero. A lot of this we can keep as is. And yeah, I think that's should be pretty good. Let's go back to our page. Let's actually change to data. Okay, so we actually have not rendered this. So let's go to app.js. So we're going to import daily from scenes slash daily. And we're going to do route path is equal to slash daily. We're going to do element. And we're going to pass in daily as our component. And we're going to save it. Let's see if that works. So date picker seems to be not defined. And I think I know why this should be, instead of it being react date picker, we should have just regular date picker and we can actually get rid of overview chart as well. So let's save it. And responsive line is not defined. Okay. So let's go import responsive line. this from at Nivo slash line. And we do seem to have an is dashboard somewhere. So actually we can just get rid of this format. And I think, yep. And there we go. Oh, uh, some, some of our alignments is a little off. Let's just, let's just look at this real quick. Everything does seem to work. So this flex box seems to be a little mistaken, but we can change that. So let's go down to our date picker and let's see what's happening with that. So to resolve that issue, we're just going to add a box and we're going to surround it because the date picker has a width of hundred percent. And because of that, the flex end is not working properly. So we need to just surround it with a box and the width is no longer a hundred percent on the child elements of this one. So that's how we can get it to the right side. And as you can see, we can change it by the dates, which is pretty cool. So the next chart is going to be the monthly sales. So this one is actually pretty simple. It's very identical to the daily. We just don't have a date picker. So all we're going to do, is we're going to go to the scenes. We're going to create a new folder and we're going to call it monthly. Create a new file called index.jsx and I'm going to create RFCE and I'm going to change that to monthly. I'm going to save it. I'm going to go to app. I'm going to set the route to path slash monthly. We're going to do the element and we're going to set monthly like so and close it. And I'm going to go up here. I'm going to import monthly from scenes slash monthly as well. And I'm going to save it. So now we have the monthly page. So even though I already did that, I want to just copy everything from the daily and we're just going to modify it. I know I already wrote that, but we can just replace it. We don't need any of the date picker stuff. We can just change the daily. Let's actually change this to monthly. Same with the export all the way over here. And here I'm just going to get rid of this range information because we don't need that anymore. And I'm going to change this to monthly sales. Then we're going to say this chart of monthly sales like this. And then we are going to do some adjustments over here. I'm going to get rid of start date, end date over here. A lot of this is pretty self-explanatory. We have responsive line, use state. We actually don't need use state now. And in here, instead of the daily, we're going to change this to monthly. So I'm also note that I'm also changing down here as well. 
these should be the same and we are just going to change this to for each this should be month total sales total units we don't need any of this data for date formatting and we could just keep most of this we're going to change the date we're going to keep that information this is good formatted data we don't need to change start date end date we have our formatted data over here and let's make sure everything is pretty similar we're going to have month that's good total and we can save it we can go back and we can see our current app we have split date still is not defined so let me find that split date okay so this instead should be the month and save it let's make sure we have no errors and I think this should be pretty good yep we have everything we need so this was just a variation of the original uh, we do have some things that go underneath but if you want you can use a non curved chart instead so for example let me close this you can just comment this guy out and we can see now we have more of a line chart so if you wanted to adjust it it's pretty cool pretty simple so now one thing I have noted I did not note but Redux Toolkit query is very nice because we're essentially caching some of the data so here if you see the daily and you go to the network tab when we go to this page the reason why you're not seeing any API calls being made is because uh, was it Redux Toolkit query already has made the data API call for sales and because we're sharing the same information we do not have to make another API call which increases efficiency saves money because you're not making the same API call over and over you're not burdening their server or anything like that so we're basically using the same pieces of information for three different pages over here so Redux Toolkit Query is very nice because it automatically does this for you. Occasionally, you want it to refresh the data, and you can do that manually if you need to. But for most cases, you don't want to set that up. And finally, the last chart we're going to deal with is going to be the breakdown chart, which is going to be a pie chart. If you take a look at here, it's just going to be based on the categories that we have set and we will split the chart information on there. We also have something in the middle to show the total amount of sales. So let's go back to app.js and we are going to import breakdown from scenes, scenes slash breakdown, which is not created yet. And we're gonna go to the route and we're gonna do path slash breakdown we're going to set element and we're going to pass in breakdown over here I'm going to close this and we are going to have a route I'm going to create a new folder call this breakdown and in here I'm going to create a file called index.jsx I'm going to do rfce pass that in and we're going to call this breakdown like this and then from here I'm going to import box should make sure that's on another line import box from MUI material I'm gonna to go to the next line we're gonna import header from components header and I'm gonna import breakdown chart from components slash break down chart and this is another chart that's going to be used on the dashboard that's why we are going to make the breakdown chart in its separate component and then here, actually, we're not going to have anything in there. We're just going to return a box that has a margin of 1.5 REM, 2.5 REM, like this. And I'm going to give it a header with a title. 
of Breakdown and the subtitle of Breakdown of Sales by Category, like so. And in here, I'm going to have a box with a margin of 40 pixel, actually margin top of 40 pixel. And we're going to give it a height of 75 viewport height. And inside here, we're going to have the breakdown chart. We don't need to pass anything in. And let's go and create the breakdown chart. So inside the components folder, we're going to create breakdown chart JSX. I'm going to do RFCE to create our function component. And in here, I'm going to do a number of imports. I'm going to import responsive pi from Nivo slash pi. We're going to import box from material UI as well as typography as well as use theme. And I'm going to import use get sales query from state slash API. And in the breakdown chart, since we're using this for dashboard, we're going to do is dashboard is equal to false. So that means by default and in the case that we're using this, this is going to be not the dashboard page. So again, remember dashboard page, it's going to be like, it's going to have things that are smaller, so it's harder to deal with. So we need to make some UI adjustments just for those. And we're going to do use get sales query. And I'm going to do const theme is equal to use theme. I'm not going to console log the data because we have already seen the data. And I'm going to add this if data does not exist. And if it is loading, we are going to return loading information. And just FYI, I've been doing this kind of differently for each one, but it's to show you, you can do, you can handle the loading states differently, but it's ultimately up to you. And then from here, I'm going to create an array of colors. So I'm going to set theme dot palette dot secondary 500. I'm going to paste this three more times. So two of them is going to be 300. The first and fourth one is going to be 500. So the color will be offset from each other and we have some variation. And then here we're going to format our data. This is a lot more easier to format because this is just a pie chart. So we're going to do object dot entries data dot sales by category like this. And we're just going to map it. So we're just going to grab the key, which is a category and the sales is the value. And we're going to grab the index as well. And we're going to do ID for category value, or actually label is going to be the category value is sales and color should be colors. I, so again, this is pie chart stuff. This is how we need to format our data. It's an array of objects with ID label value and color. That's what the pie chart needs. And then we're going to save that. And now we can go down to our breakdown chart and we can make some adjustments. So I'm going to create a box. And here, because we are dealing with is dashboard, we're actually going to have to modify this a little bit. So we're going to set height to be is dashboard. We're going to set that to be 400 pixel versus a hundred percent when it's not the dashboard page, the width should be undefined. So our box is dependent on the height, not the width. And we're going to set a minimum height for is dashboard. And we're going to set that to be 325 pixel and undefined when it's not. 
We're going to copy this and we're going to do the same thing for min width. And we need to set the position to be relative. And the reason why we're doing this is so we can place the text in the center of the pie chart. And so let's go to our Nivo website. We can go and find the pie chart. We have something that looks like this, but we want to make some edits to this. We can keep the arc labels. We have some fills and definitions. Actually, we can just keep most of this. We're just going to copy this over and just modify it. So again, I like to get rid of the fills and the definitions. So I'm gonna go up and remove all the defs like that and the fills. And then I can go back to our overview chart and then copy paste our theme. So I can go down right below our data, we can paste the theme. And instead of the data, this is going to be formatted data. And here I'm going to set the colors. The colors should be set to datum of data dot color. So this will default to the colors that we have identified, like we mentioned before. And let me double check on what we need to do for these settings. So the margin, it's going to be tricky because there's a lot of like responsive issues, especially on the dashboard. So you kind of have to do a lot of this manually, but I've already set a lot of this. Took me a bit of time to get this kind of right. So I'm just going to set is dashboard. We're going to be pasting this. We just need to get rid of one of these curly braces. And in here, the bottom should be 100 and left should be 50. And we can keep it the same or we can just leave it the way it is for non-dashboard. Then we're going to sort by value to be true. So this is going to organize the table based on how big the values are. We're going to set the inner radius to be 0 0.45. So that's how thick the circle is. We don't want a pad angle, nor do we want corner radius. We're going to set the modifier to be actually 0 0.2 is fine. We want to disable arc link labels if it's not the dashboard. And then the text color, we actually don't want to skip angle. We want to change the text color theme.palette dot secondary 200 like so we have a two from a darker and then bottom row for translate x we want to do is dashboard we have 20 and zero and over here this is going to be is dashboard and we're going to set this to 50 and then 56 item width should be 85 I have it left to right item opacity is great circle we want to change the style to be one of the themes so theme dot palette dot primary 500 and I believe that should be good for the most part okay and then Below this, 
this is where we're going to add the text right in the center. So this was a little tricky to set up. So we're going to have a few things. So we need to set a position to be absolute with top of 50%, left of 50% because we're positioning this and the parent component is relative. So if you always want to center something over another thing, you always do relative on the parent, absolute on the child, and then you can position it top 50%, left 50% from the parent component or parent element. And then from here, I'm going to set the color to be theme.palette.secondary 400. We're going to do text align of center, pointer events of none, and we're going to set SX to be transform is dashboard, and I'm going to set translate to be negative 75% and negative 170% when it's on the dashboard. This was a lot of trial and error because there was a lot of responsive issues. And I'm going to set translate. Typically, you shouldn't have to do something like this, but occasionally you are left with no choice. Then we have a typography with a variant of H6. And then we're going to set is dashboard and we're going to set the total to be data dot yearly sales total. So this conditionally, if it's not the dashboard, we can have this value. Otherwise, it doesn't have enough space. So yeah, that was a little bit tricky. Has a lot of like responsive issues had to take care of. But now let's double check. We don't have any errors. It looks good so far. So let's go to breakdown. And yeah, there we go. We have our pie chart. Everything moves. We have a little denotation of what each item is. We have a little bit of a cool animation. And it looks very nice to me. Okay, so with the breakdown completed, now we're going to work on admins. So admins is just going to be another data grid table and performance is where we're going to do an aggregate call but let's take care of admins which is pretty simple so let's go to our server we're going to go to our routes and we're going to go to management and inside management we're going to add a route and we're going to call this slash admins we're going to do get admins and we are going to import get admins from dot dot slash controllers management dot js and then from here we're going to go to controllers go to management i'm going to import mongoose from mongoose and we need to import user from dot dot slash models slash user dot js and here i'm going to create a function called get admins I'm going to do async rec res and I'm going to do a try catch block like so and I'm going to do res.status 404.json message error.message and then here I'm going to do admins await user.find with a role of admin this time. So we're getting all the admins for this particular user and I'm going to select minus password so we don't grab their passwords as well and we're going to do res.status 200.json admins. So essentially this is just a normal get call. We're just grabbing information about the users who are admin specifically. And with that our API is already completed. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go to client, go into source, go on their API and we'll close this warning. We don't really need that. And then right here, I'm going to do get admins and we are going to do build.query. 
and I'm going to pass in query with a callback function. And I'm going to write management slash admins. And then here I'm going to provide tags and I'm going to put admins. And over here, I'm going to do admins over here in the tag types. And then from here, I'm going to go to app.js and then I'm going to add, I'm going to import admins from scenes slash admin. Actually, this should be singular. <coughs> and we're going to get the route as well. So we're going to go path slash admin. I'm going to do element, pass in our admin component like so. And then from here, I'm going to go to scenes, create a new folder called admin, create a new file inside admin called index.jsx. And I'm going to do R-A-F-C-E. I'm going to call this admin and save it. And I almost forgot. Let's go back to API. And I forgot to do use get admins query. So make sure you're exporting that. So I'm going to save it. We're going to go back to index.jsx. And here I'm going to import a number of items. I'm going to close those, close these tabs. And I'm going to import box from MUI material as well as use theme. I'm going to import use get admins query from state slash API. And I'm going to import data grid from MUI X data grid. I'm going to import header from components slash header. And inside our admin component, we are going to grab our data is loading and get it from use get admins query like so. I'm going to put theme and use theme like so above here and here I'm going to console log. I'm going to save it. Let's make sure we don't have any errors. Okay. Just a bunch of warnings, which is fine. I'm going to go back. We're going to go to our current application and let's just make sure everything works. So we have our admin. We didn't put any UI, but we have our network and then we have all the information. And again, remember, try and get comfortable with the network tab. It'll be very good to get a handle on this. So here we have management and then admins. And in our preview, we have our list of the admins right here. Great. So now we can work on the UI. And so again, with data grid, we can, oops, we can create a bunch of columns. And this is probably going to be most similar to customers. So we're going to go to index. And this is just to save a lot of the time. I'm going to copy this columns section. And we're probably going to keep most of these the same. Let's see if there's anything I want to change. Yeah, we're just going to keep a lot of that the same. And then we're also going to go down and grab this box. And we're just going to copy it from customers. And the reason why I'm breezing through this and is copying the same thing it's just so to show you that you can do a lot of different things. As long as you're getting the same data, you can change the UI. So with the same set of data, you can make a different type of charts. Just make sure you format the data properly and grab the information. And then from here, I'm going to change the title to admins. And then we're going to do management, managing admins and list of admins. I'm going to keep the margin top the same. Most of this should be pretty much, we're just going to keep all the styling the same. I'm going to go down and there's one last thing that I actually want to just change. I want to create a components that's going to include a column menu and we're going to give it a custom column menu instead. So I'll show you what this will do. So I'm going to import custom column menu and we're going to create a component 
and we're going to call this data grid custom column menu. Make sure you don't capitalize the R and we're going to save that. So this is not created yet. So we're going to do that. Go to components, create a new file, call this data grid custom column menu. So this is going to be a way to create a custom column menu so that we have different settings for our column. So if you look at what we have right now, we have sort by ascending, descending, filter, hide, show, show columns. But let's say I want to change what these are showing. So again, in the material UI docs, you can look this up, but we have several options. We can do grid, custom, or grid, column, menu, container. So I'm going to import that grid, filter, menu, item, and then hide, grid, call, menu, item. So you can use this and use it to create your own setting. So I'm going to do RFCE. We don't need the React for this one. We can just say, call this custom column menu instead. I'm going to pass in props for this one. And we are going to pass in hide menu, current column, and open. And we are going to destructure it from props. So now, these are not props that come from what we've created, but it, by default, comes with these props that we need to use. So here, I'm going to do grid, column, menu, container. I'm going to close that. And inside here, I'm going to pass in hide menu. I'm going to put hide menu like this. Same with current column as well. And then finally with open. So these are just default props that you need to pass in here. And in here, I'm going to do grid, filter, menu item, do self-closing, and then hide, hide grid column menu self-closing and inside here i'm going to pass in on click we're going to hit hide menu and pass in column equals current column so by default data grid requires these props for both of these so we can use them so i'm going to save it let's make sure we have no errors so if we go back here refresh it now you can see it's actually still the same. <laughs> so let's go back and see why that's the case. Uh, the reason why is we have components and we did not spell that correctly. All right, there we go. <laughs> we, we now have our filter and then we can hide it if we want, things like that. So we can refresh it and it should reset. And the final page we're going to be working on is going to be the performance page. So this one is going to be another data grid and you might think, oh, we don't need to do another table, but this one will show you how to do aggregate calls, which is something I've been mentioning for Mongo database. As a reminder, aggregate calls are similar to joins that you would see in SQL, but the idea is you are using two or more data, different database tables and you are combining that information, combining them and aggregating them in a way and using that information so you can send it to the front end. All right, so with that, let me close the terminal. I'm gonna close all these tabs and now we're gonna go back to our backend. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna create one last model. This is the final model we really need and we're gonna call this affiliate stat JS. So this is going to get information about some specific user and how many sales he has particularly made. And so what I'm going to do, I'm going to go and grab the product JS information, copy it over to make my life easier. And I'm going to say affiliate stat schema. I'm going to select all the product. I'm going to say affiliate stat like so and inside here i'm going to delete everything i'm going to say user id 
and grab type of mongoose types mongoose.types.object ID. So this has to be an object ID that MongoDB states. And we're going to have a reference of user. We're going to set affiliate sales. And here I'm going to pass in the type of mongoose.types.object ID. So in this case, this is an array of this ID. And we're going to say ref of transaction. So this ref is rep representing which data model it's referring to. So again, if you look back onto our page, user ID is referring to user. Affiliate sales is referring to transactions. This is what's called the one to many because this is has an array. So from one to many transactions. And then this here, user ID from user is a one to one relationship because there's only one user ID per affiliate stat. But anyways, let's go back. We're going to save this. And what we're going to do is we're going to insert the affiliate stat information like we normally do. So I'm going to go up, I'm going to import affiliate stat from the model like so, and I'm going to grab data affiliate stat and make sure you don't have a capital F. And then finally, I'm going to go down over here. I'm going to say affiliate stat dot insert many, and I'm going to do data affiliate stat. I'm going to save it. And what we just did, we inserted it to our database. So I'm going to make sure we have that. So I'm going to hit refresh. And now we have our affiliate stats database collection. And as you can see, we have our affiliate sales, the user ID. So these are the transactions that the user has made. Very cool. Now let's go to routes and we're going to go to management and we're going to create another route. So here I'm going to do router.get and we're going to do slash performance and we're going to do another query params. So we're going to pass in ID from the front end to get the performance of that particular user. So I'm going to put get user performance as the function. So I'm going to do get user performance up here. I'm going to save it. And now I can go to controllers and then I'm going to go management. And this is where I'm going to create a function. So first I want to do is import transaction from dot dot slash models slash transaction dot js. Remember, don't forget the dot js. And then you're going to set export const get user performance like so. So this one, we're going to do aggregate calls. So we're going to do rec res over here. And I'm just going to copy all of this over and just replace everything. So we don't really need this. All right. So the first thing I want to do is grab the ID from the params. So rec.params. And what we're going to do now is I'm going to create a variable called user with stats. And what we're going to do is going to use the user.aggregate function. So if you go to the Mongo database, Mongo aggregate calls. They're going to give you information how to make aggregation calls. So this allows you to use what they have something called the aggregation pipeline, meaning it has multiple steps of which you can use to do various operations. For example, this is an example, group by and calculate sum. You have something called match and then group and then sort. They have a lot of these different functions. You don't need to know every single one. You can just reference it when you need to. But these aggregation pipeline will allow you to reference one database and use that reference to talk to another database. And I'll show you what that means. It'll make a lot more sense when we do it. 
So here with user aggregate, first thing I want to do is I'm going to match. So I'm going to match our ID with the new mongoose dot types dot object ID. All right. So you might think, oh shoot, what the, what's going on over here? There's a lot of crazy syntax here. But what's happening is we're grabbing the user ID. We're making sure we're converting it to the right format. So Mongo database has this object ID type. So you need to make sure that the ID type is in the correct format and we're matching it and finding the user who has this particular ID. That's what's happening here. So we're just grabbing the information about the specific current user and grabbing that information. And then with that, we can go on to the next step with this information and we can use something called lookup. And what this lookup will allow us to do is we can grab information from the affiliate stats model. So what we originally did was we grabbed this ID information about a user in the user model. But now we want to look up in the affiliate stats information. So we want to grab from the affiliate stats data and we're going to use the local field of underscore ID and we're going to compare it to the foreign field user ID like so. And we want to display this information as affiliate stats. Okay. Let's take a pause and let's look at this. So what's happening is if you go back to this database, I am looking at these two tables. And we're comparing this ID, which is a local field, because that's where we're running our aggregate function call. And we're comparing it with the user ID over here. So we're essentially seeing which of the affiliate stats is going to be referenced in these two tables. So we're grabbing these two guys and grabbing that information and we are displaying that information as affiliate stats. So now affiliate stats, the last step we're going to add is I'm going to do unwind and all this one, this is, this is very simple. This is very extra, but you can just do this and it will flatten your array. So basically it's just going to flatten the information. So essentially to reiterate what just happened here is that we're matching our current user, see if we, seeing if we have the current ID and we'll grab that information. And then we're going to look up the affiliate stats table and we're going to compare the ID of our current user with the user ID in the affiliate stats table. And we're going to save that information in a, property called affiliate stats. And then we are going to flatten that array or object. So that is going to be what this information is. So essentially what we're going to get out of that is the current users, normal information, but also their affiliate stat information. So we're combining those two into one using an aggregate call. So unlike before, if you compare to the client, if you remember, when we did get products, we had to cycle through our products. Then we have to cycle through each product and grab the products that relevant to each product through a promise.all. And this process is a little slower in comparison to doing an aggregate call, which will do the same thing but at a faster pace and it's just in general, a better practice. So it's very similar to how SQL does joins. And then finally, I'm not going to bombard you with another aggregate calls cause this is kind of hefty, but I'm just going to do await promise dot all. And 
we are going to do user with stats zero like this and i'm going to do affiliate stats affiliate sales so again user with stats is going to have this information and i'm finding this affiliate stats which is the property and then i'm grabbing the affiliate sales from that information so affiliate stats has affiliate sales over here and i'm going to map through i know it looks a little crazy but if you console log and see what these are inputting this should make a lot of sense and then we're going to do transaction find by id so for each one of these we're just going to grab each sale transaction and we're going to pass the transactions we get and then finally we actually need to filter this so i want to filter all the sale transactions i haven't figured out a way to do this natively in mongo database but what you can do is we're just going to filter make sure that we have a transaction transaction should not equal null so we just don't, we just want to get rid of the ones that end up being null because not all transactions typically all the transactions should have some user but the data that i created didn't have that and make sure sales transactions should be plural right here and then finally we can do res dot status 200 and we're going to do dot json and what i'm going to do is i'm going to pass in user which is user with stats the zero value because it's in the array i'm going to do sales as well to get the user sales as part of the information so filtered sales transactions now hopefully this aggregate function makes sense but it takes a lot of practice it's very similar to sql uh, joins like the idea of it it just requires some practice to understand what's happening okay and then so i'm going to close this tab and now we can go to our front end all right and then you should know what i'm going to do from now it's pretty simple everything is going to be exactly what you expect so we're going to do get performance we're going to do build dot query we're going to do query over here and we're going to set this to management slash management slash performance performance and then slash id like that this should actually be template string and we are going to pass in an id into our query and we're going to do provides tags i'm going to say performance and this actually should be get user performance just a better name for this particular one because it's relevant to a specific user i'm going to go up I'm going to add performance over here and go down and I'm going to do use get user performance query like that. I'm going to save it. Now I'm going to go to app.js. I'm going to import performance from scenes slash performance. I'm going to go down to the route path slash performance we're going to set element i'm going to pass in performance like so and then close it and i'm going to go to scenes go down create a new folder called performance and inside the performance i'm going to create a new file called index.jsx and before i just do refce i'm going to go to admin i'm just going to copy everything it's a lazy way to do this and i'm going to go to performance and we should have most of everything so box use steam this should be i'm going to select both of these with command d and do use get user performance query like so we can keep the header we can keep the custom column menu for this one and also i want to grab use selector because we want to be able to grab the ID for this one. So I'm going to do const user ID. And we haven't done this in a while, but use selector. 
we're going to grab the state. I'm going to grab state.global.userID. And we need to pass the user ID into here for our API call. And before we go further, I'm going to console log this data. And I want to comment the data grid out for now, just so we can test our API works. And let's make sure we have no errors and it looks good. So let's go to performance. And it seems like we have our user information. And as you can see, we have the affiliate stats. This aggregate call combined both just regular user information and their affiliate stats relevant to that. And then sales also includes all the transactions relevant to this user. So everything is working as expected. So now we just got to make some adjustments. This should be performance. And we are going to do track your affiliate sales should be F performance here. I'm going to save it and I'm going to change the columns because this column is going to be a little different. So ID, we need to change this one to be, let me change this to user ID and we're going to just change the name over there. This should be one. We're going to set this to be created at, and this is going to be capitalized. We can get rid of the phone number. We can change this to products. And this one is going to be number of products. I'm going to set this flex to be 0 0.5, sortable to be false, render cell is going to be params, like before params.value.length. And the last one is going to be cost, so I'm just going to delete all of those. This should be cost, capitalize this. Set the flex to be one. Render cell should be params. And we are going to do a template string number params dot value dot two fixed two. I'm going to save it. And then from here, I'm going to uncomment all the data grid stuff. And we are going to make Pretty much no adjustments to the styles because it looks it looks fine. And then I'll keep all of this with the data. The rows should be right here, data and data dot sales. Because we want the data sales information, not the data itself. Get row, and then we have is loading. We want to make sure the columns are good. And it looks pretty good to me. Now we just want to change this to performance. Same with the admin over here since we copied this over. Actually, let's close that. Sometimes I forget to close that. And here I'm going to save it. And I think if we don't have any errors, everything should work as expected. So let me refresh it and we have our performance data. Perfect. You can change this as well. I have two different columns and we have our custom column menu. Perfect. There's one thing I wanted to make sure you guys comment this out because I kind of almost forgot, but you should comment the affiliate stat insert many, make sure you save that. So you're not adding duplicate data. All right, so now we are finally at the last of the pages, which is going to be the dashboard. So the dashboard is going to have some stats over here with some value in this section. This is the line chart 
basically this is the revenue chart we saw in overview and then we have transactions and then we also have a pie chart representing the sales by category. As you can see, the line chart and the pie chart are reused from some of the other pages. That's why we are keeping this page as the last one. So from here, let's get started. We're gonna go to our server. We're gonna go to routes and under general, we're gonna write our first route for the dashboard. So we're gonna do router.get slash dashboard we're going to do get dashboard stats. And we are going to import get dashboard stats. And then from here, I'm going to go to controller, go to general, and I'm going to fill out our dashboard information. And we are going to import a few things. So I'm going to import overall stat from dot dot slash models slash overall stat.js and then I'm going to import transaction from dot dot slash models slash transaction dot js and then from here I'm going to export some functions so I'm going to export get dashboard stats which is going to equal to async rec res like so and I'm going to create a try catch block over here. So I'm going to remove all this. And from here, we're going to start. So now, basically, this endpoint is just going to retrieve all the information on the dashboard page. And we have a separate endpoint because we want to compile all the stat information into just one section of the website. So it's a very convenient way less API calls, so we don't have to call multiple APIs if they're just entering the dashboard. So from here, we're gonna write some hard-coded values because we are limited in terms of like the mock data that we have. So I'm just gonna assume our current month is, let's say November, and then we could say const current year is going to be 2021 because that's the only year we have data on. And then we're going to say the current day is going to be 2021 11 15. And here I'm going to set recent transactions because we are going to grab the latest 50 transactions that's happened on the website. So I'm going to grab transactions and we are going to await transaction.find we are going to limit the number of items by 50 and we are going to sort dot sort and we're going to say created on and we're going to do negative one. So that sorts it backwards. And then from here, I'm going to do overall stats and I'm going to grab it from our overall stat data table. We do that with overall stat.find and we are going to grab it from our current year. From here, I'm going to grab several pieces of information from our overall stat that we just grabbed. And we are going to destructure total customers, yearly total sold units, yearly sales total, monthly data, and sales by category. And then we also want to grab this month's stats, and we can do that by grabbing our overall stat, grabbing the monthly data, and we are going to find within our data of month. And we are just gonna return when month is equal to current month. So basically we are looping through our monthly data, grabbing that information when the month is equal to our current month. And the same thing we need to do for this, 
for today's stats. So I'm going to change this month. I'm going to change this to today. And I'm going to change this to daily data. And I'm going to say date like this. And this should be date is equal to current day. And what we're going to do is we're going to return a lot of information for the front end to use. So we're going to do JSON and we're going to pass in total customers. We're actually going to pass in everything over here as well as this month stats, today stats, and transactions. So all this information is going to be set to the front end and this is everything the dashboard page needs. So I'm going to save it. We'll have all the information that we need. So I'm going to close this and now we can go back to the front end. And you know the drill, we're going to go to state and the API file. And here I'm going to do get dashboard. We're going to do build.query. We're going to pass in query to general slash dash board like so. And we're going to do provides tags dashboard. And we're going to pass in dashboard above here. And then way below, we're going to do use get dashboard query like so. I'm going to close this. We're going to go to app.js. We are going to Actually, we already have our dashboard, so we actually don't need to do this this time. And then from here, I'm going to go to our components, or actually scenes, go to our dashboard, and we can start filling this out. So here, I'm going to import some items. I'm going to import flex between from our components. I'm going to import header from our components. I'm going to import download outlined and a number of other icons. So email point of sale, person add, and traffic. Then I'm going to import box from material UI button typography use theme, use media query. I'm going to save it so we have it formatted. We're going to import a number of other things. So data grid, we're going to import breakdown chart. And this is why we made it reusable. We're going to also import overview chart. I'm going to import use get dashboard query as well. And we're going to do what we normally do. So we're going to do theme is equal to use theme. We're going to grab is non medium screens. So this is for responsiveness. So we're going to use media query, which we haven't done in quite some time since the beginning of this app. So we're going to set the min width to 1200 pixel for this case. So we have more responsive elements. And finally, we're going to grab the data is loading. And we're going to say use get dashboard query. And here I want to check if the data is working. So I'm going to console log, save that. I'm going to open up our terminal just to check if we don't have any errors. So I'm going to go to my app, click dashboard, and we're going to check our network tab. So I'm just going to refresh this so we can grab it. We can see that we have the dashboard. We have monthly data, sales by category, this month's stats, today's stats, and all the other information that we need. Perfect. So let's go back. We're going to remove this. And the columns page should be actually similar to the transaction. So if you go back to the transaction, we can go to the columns 
we can probably just, yeah, we can just copy this because it's going to be exactly the same. So this is the transaction file. And we're just going to copy the columns so we don't have to write that. And I'm going to save it. And in our dashboard, we have a lot of UI elements here. So this will be kind of longer. So margin is going to be 1.5 REM top and bottom, 2.5 REM left and right, like so. And then here I'm going to do flex between. I'm going to put a header with the title of dashboard, subtitle of welcome to your dashboard. And that's self-closing. And then here I'm going to create the download box. So I'm going to have a box with a button like so. And we're going to have download reports as a text. And we're going to give this some custom styling. So we're going to do background color with theme.palette.secondary.light color of theme.palette dot background dot alt alt like that and then font size of 14 pixel font weight of bold padding of 10 pixel top and bottom 20 pixel left and right and actually we are we need download outlined icon over here and we're going to give it sx of margin right 10 pixel oh and this needs to be closed so we now have our header with our download button and then from here we can go back to our completed app or over here and we can take a look on how this is set up so if you go into inspector tab, let's open this up a little more. So if we go over here, I'm going to click this and I'm going to click right here. There is a grid button that you can click on that will show you how this grid is displaying. So the way this grid is designed is that we have about 13 lines. 13 col or sorry, 12 columns. So this is 12 columns. These will be two columns right here, each of these. This one is going to be six columns. Same with these will be two, two. These will be two as well. Or actually this will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And this is gonna be four. As for the height, we are specifying this height to be just one, like one with one row height. This will be two row height. This will be one row. This will be how many? One, two, three, three row height. So it's pretty simple. So once you get that done, it's pretty simple. So now when you go past the min width that we set, these kind of collapse and this will be a full width. Let me just turn this off. These will be full width like this, same with over here and this. So everything takes up its own width height. And when you get closer, this should collapse. So now you can just see everything is on its own line. And that's essentially how this layout is manufactured with the grid. And then right here, so I'm gonna do our grid in this section. So I'm going to give it a margin top of 20 pixel and I'm going to say display of grid. And then from here I'm going to do grid template columns and like I mentioned I'm going to do repeat 12 of one fractional columns. So 12 of these meaning one fractional unit meaning it's just it's split up equally into 12 parts. And then grid auto rows for the height. We're just going to have a hard-coded value for height. Generally, you want 
uh, absolute value. So this one's going to be 160 pixel. And we're going to set a gap of 20 pixel between each column and rows. And then finally, for our responsiveness, I can do what we've done before, which is and div like this. So it selects the immediate child directly. And we are going to set the grid column to be if it's on non medium screens, we have undefined. So we have no grid column specification. The stat boxes and all of those will have their own um, identified spans, where if we are below this value, we're going to do span of 12. So that means that it takes the entire row. So from here, I'm going to set this as row number one. And what we're going to do is we're going to create stat boxes because there's four of these, one, two, three, four, and we're going to create these UI in a separate component. So I'm going to go up, I'm going to import stat box like so from components slash stat box. I'm going to go into components file, create a new file, call it stat box JSX. I'm going to do RFCE to create our component. And then from here, I'm going to import box from material UI, typography, and use theme. I'm also going to import flex between. And flex between, as you can see, has been getting a lot of use, so it's a very nice styled component in this case. So anyways, this stat box is going to take a title, value, increase, icon, and description. So it's going to take some st state values that you need. And here I'm going to pass in theme with use theme for the colors. And this is where I will set my box like so. And I will add a number of properties to our box. So I'm going to do grid column of span to grid row of span one display of flex flex direction of column justify content of space between we're doing a padding of 1.25 REM and one REM left and right. Flex of one, one, and 100%. So this is to identify the width and the percentage of how it grows in the grid. So it'll take as much space as it can, unless there's other things that are taking up space. And then we're gonna have background color theme dot palette dot background dot alt and we're going to say border radius of 0 0.55 rem inside here i'm going to do flex between i'm going to say typography with a variant of h6 sx of color theme dot palette dot secondary 100 and then inside here, I'm going to do title. And below this, I'm going to set the icon. And again, I'm going to do another typography. And this is going to be a variant of H3, font weight of 600, SX of color, theme.palette.secondary200. And I'm going to pass in our value in here. And then finally, flex between. We're going to have a gap of one REM. And inside here, I'm just going to copy this typography and make some modifications. So in here, we should have a variant 
I have H5, a font style of italic, and we're going to set this as dot light. And we're going to set this as increase. And one last one, we want the typography with a description. So let me save this. I'll show you real quick. Forgot to show you, but here we have a flex, like these two are aligned. We have another flex, or actually not one flex. This is just one typography. And then we have another flex right here. So that's exactly what we essentially created. And with that, we can go back to our dashboard and we can go down and now we can create our stat boxes. So I'm gonna do stat box like so. And I'm gonna set the title to be total customers. I'm gonna set the value of data and data.total customers. And then we're gonna say increase of plus 14%. Now, by the way, this increase, typically you want this to be more dynamic, but I do not have the information in the back end to grab the increase. Or actually we probably could, but it's just kind of a lot of work. <laughs> and then, so we have a description. We're gonna say since last month. And finally, I'm gonna put the icon and in here, I'm gonna put the email icon with an SX of color theme.palette.secondary 300. I'm gonna say a font size of 26 pixel. I'm gonna close this. It seems like, oh yeah, the email needs to be closed like that. And what I'm going to do is I'm gonna copy this. I'm gonna add this one more time. And we're gonna say sales today. And the data should be today stats dot total sales. This should be plus 21%. And this should be point of sale. All right, then from here, the next item would typically be the line chart for it to be the proper line, but we're gonna finish up the stat box. Stat box is first, so I'm gonna add two more. Here, we're gonna do monthly sales. I'm gonna say this month's stats So total sales, this should be plus 5%. And we are going to do person add. And then we're gonna set yearly sales over here. And I'm gonna do data dot yearly sales total. And this is an increase of 43%. And I'm gonna have traffic like so. So those are all our stat boxes, but the line chart should be the third one. And the way we're gonna do that, we're gonna set a box first so we can set the configurations for our overview chart. So I'm gonna say grid column is going to be span of eight. Remember, I actually, I remember saying span of six. This should be span of eight. So I was mistaken. So this is gonna be a grid row of span two and a background color of theme.palette.background.alt with a padding of one REM and a border radius of 0.55 REM. And over here, I'm gonna set the overview chart. I'm gonna set view to be sales and is dashboard to be true, like so. So now we have our overview chart with our line chart and we have all the specific configurations. So let, actually let's pause here and let's take a look at our website. So we have it responsive and as you can see, it looks pretty good so far. 
Now, the only thing we're kind of missing is the area underneath, and this has less items. So actually, let's go to our overview chart and let's fix that. All right, if I go down, you can put it anywhere you want, but enable area, we want this to be is dashboard, like so. And also, if I wanna to go to axis left, so there's axis bottom, axis left, we want to add tick values to be five. So there's much less ticks. So there's that many ticks, we should see much less, yeah. So now we have the area underneath, perfect. So now let's go back to our dashboard page and we are going to continue now onto row two. So below this particular box, below this one, let's see where this aligns. This aligns with inside here. So actually before the closing of this box, we are going to have a second row. All right, so right here, we're gonna have row two. So right below our stat box. So not after these closing boxes. So here I'm gonna do box, close that, and this should have grid column with a span of eight, grid row with span of three. And now what we're gonna have is we're gonna be looking at the transaction because it's very similar. We're gonna look at the SX over here. We're just gonna copy the SX section. And below this, I'm gonna set up our data from our transaction. So we actually don't need all of this. We're just gonna keep this one simple so we don't have as many. This is not server side. So I'm just gonna remove everything aside from loading, get row ID, rows, and columns. So I believe that should do the trick. So if I go back over here, we can see we have our transaction. Now the cursor is a little messed up. If you look at this cursor, it doesn't look as great as our finished product, but I will cover that very shortly Actually, you know what? Let's make, let's make those adjustments. There is something I want to change in our current styling because it doesn't seem to match as well. So I want to go to over here. I'm going to set border radius to be five REM. So it's a little more round. We're going to have MUI data grid column headers the virtual scroller, this actually should be background.alt. If you look at it, the color is good. The only thing is going to be the scroll bars. So the scroll bars is a little bit tricky. So that's why we kind of need to go to the index.css page. And we are going to target the scroll bars directly. So the way we do that, we do WebKit scroll bar, and we're gonna set width of 10 pixel. And then we wanna target our track. And we're gonna do that with WebKit scroll bar track. And this is the, this is the section where you, it's like the behind of the scroll. That makes any sense. <laughs> so we have a background. We're gonna say 
7a 7f 9d and then with the handle we're going to change that so let me close this handle i'm going to set this as webkit scroll bar dash thumb i'm going to set the background to be 21295c like so and then finally i'm going to do handle on hover and i'm going to pass in webkit scroll bar track and hover oops hover like this and i'm going to set this as background of the same color save it and if we take a look and refresh it now we have our colors that are very nice so this is this right here on the back is going to be the track this is the scroll right here or the handle and then handle on hover is the color when you hover over it okay and so the last thing is just going to be the pie chart so we're going to go back to our dashboard I'm going to close all these tabs and we're on the final stretch for this and below our box our closing box i'm going to have a box and in here i'm going to set grid column with a span of four grid row of span of three background color with theme dot palette dot background dot alt and we're going to set a padding of 1.5 rem with the border radius of 0 0.55 rem and in here i'm going to set a typography with the variant of h6 with sx of color theme dot palette dot secondary 100 and i'm going to say sales by category and here i'm going to put the chart so i'm going to do breakdown chart with is dashboard to be true and below this, I'm going to have a typography with a padding of zero on the top and bottom and 0 0.6 REM left and right with a font size of 0 0.8 REM. SX is going to be color theme.palette.secondary200, like so. And then right here, I'm going to do break down of real states and information. Doesn't really matter what the text is over here. Via category for revenue made for this year and total sales, whatever. Save it. And now let's take a look. Now we should have our pie chart everything is nice and perfect we do have some situations where it kind of pushes out not exactly sure what solution i can handle for that it becomes a little rough at those particular um, dimensions but all the other dimensions work perfectly if you go in now you have this dashboard or the sidebar in the way but you can open and close and now with this we have our entire dashboard fully complete and we just need to deploy so I know you guys have been asking how we can deploy our API and front end we will be doing this and the website we'll be doing it on is going to be render.com so if you go to render you can see this is a way to host both 
your backend APIs, and you can host your front end. So basically static hosting and service web hosting. There are other alternatives. Heroku used to be the dominant one for backend API hosting, but we cannot do that anymore. There's other alternatives such as Railway, like this, and you can see they have a free version. Actually, let me go back. We can go to the pricing. They have a free version, but they have some limits and they deploy it and if you hit the limit, it's going to shut off. Render.com is probably the easiest to do, I would say. However, there is one downside I just want you guys to know is that these automatically do shut off if you haven't used it for 15 minutes. So when someone is going to your website the first time, the API is going to take some time before it loads up. So you have to be aware and maybe mention that on your own portfolio if you want to add your APIs as a portfolio that the first time you go to the website, it's going to take some time to load the APIs. So there is no real good alternative to that. So I'm not entirely sure if there's like an optimal solution, but render.com does a pretty good job aside from that downside. But anyways, let's go to the render dashboard and we are going to sign in. And ideally you would sign in with your GitHub. So I'm going to do that. All right. After logging into render now, before we do anything with render, I want to make sure you guys know how to push your GitHub and how to set up your GitHub repo. So the first thing I want you to go is to look at your client and we're going to check you have a Git ignore. Make sure your Git ignore is going to be ignoring your environment local. So this doesn't get pushed up to, um, doesn't get pushed up to render. And then on server, we also want to create, if you haven't created already a dot Git ignore, and we're going to ignore two things slash node modules and dot EMV. So these two things we do not want pushed up on our repo. And I want to check one thing because this happens a lot is if you go to our client, you're going to see possibly a dot get. We're actually going to delete this. And the reason why is because we want the dot get to be in here. Otherwise, we're going to have some problems. So I'm going to open up our terminal. I'm going to close everything actually or turn off our servers because we don't need those anymore. I'm going to go to our main directory, which is going to be run. And I am going to do git init over here. So this is where our dot git will be created. So if you take a look, if I go back, you can see that the dot git has been initialized over here. And now if you've never pushed up a GitHub repo, you can hit new over here. I'm going to choose myself. I'm going to call this full stack admin. And I'm just going to create repository. And over here, I'm going to follow these rules, except I'm going to ignore add readme. I don't want that. So I'm going to do git init, which I already did. I'm going to commit. I'm going to remote add origin. I don't need this branch to be main and I'm going to push. So just copy this part right here. Not my, not my repo, but your repo. So I'm going to go back to my code. I'm going to do git add dot git commit. I'm going to say init commit like so. So that's just a comment. And then I'm going to paste what I had and I'm going to push origin master. And once you have that, you can go back to the repo, refresh it. And now you'll be able to see that we have our repo. So you want to make sure we have git ignore and the dot EMV doesn't exist over here. Same with the server, the dot EMV does not exist. So everything is perfectly done now. And before I fully deploy, I want to do one thing. I want to show you guys how our deployment is set up. So this is pretty simple. 
in a real production application, this diagram would be a lot more complex, but I wanna show you guys what's going to happen. So here, this is kind of what we just did. So basically you have your computer with code. We had the local environment variables stored on our local machine. But when we push the code to GitHub, we're not pushing the node modules or the environment variables into our GitHub. And then from here, this is the part we haven't done yet, but what we're going to do is we're gonna set up a server and that's going to hook up to the server folder that we had. So we're creating a web service for our server. And here on render.com, we're gonna be setting our own environment variables that will be different from our local environment variables. Same with the client, we're gonna set up our front end, we're gonna use the same repo that we just used, and we're gonna set up our front end environment variables as well over here that will allow us to call APIs on the server. Because if you remember, our environment variables has a link to the localhost 5001, but when it's on render.com, that URL needs to be different. And that's what we're configuring over here. And just like usual, this server is going to be talking to Mongo database. So these will be communicating. And this is a general gist. So if you wanted to enter, if a user wanted to use your website, they would go to this URL and this URL would be interacting with both of these right here. And it all comes from the GitHub code. So hopefully that makes sense. All right, so now we're on render. So I already logged in. Um, you might see a different page over here, but you wanna go either to new or you can click new web service. That's what we're trying to look for. So the web service is going to be our backend. We do need to have our backend first. And here we need to connect our GitHub. I'm gonna connect my GitHub. And I'm going to select just the repository I want. So full stack admin, like so. That's the repo I want and we can just keep it as read access only. And once we have connected, we're gonna hit connect over here. And here, I'm gonna call this, uh, let's say full stack. Um, I don't even know, admin backend. Okay. We're gonna choose a region where it's closer we're gonna make sure since we used master, that's going to be the default. And the root directory. So the root directory, let's take a look at our repo. Our root directory for the backend is going to be server. So this is going to be where our root is. So I need to write server for this one. We're gonna choose node. And for our build, we're gonna do npm install. So that's going to build our application because we need to make sure the server on render is actually installing all the packages and the start command is going to be npm run start and here we're going to choose free there's a lot of different options if you want to increase but here we're going to do advanced and here we're going to add environment variables and what we need to do is we're gonna be adding the Mongo URL. So if I go to server and .env, we're actually gonna use the same URL over here. And that should be good. So Mongo URL. And then from here, I'm gonna add another environment variable. And this is gonna be port, and we're gonna set this as 5001. So we have a Mongo URL and then port 5001. And we can just leave everything else the way it is. And so here, we're just gonna create the web service. And now, by the way, while we're waiting, let me show you what's happening. So this is gonna be where our logs are. So essentially, what you would normally see in your own terminal, this is the log section. So you can see this is our logs. And we can see our events. If you click on deploy, it's gonna show you what's happening right now. 
and let's just wait for this. This can take a little bit of time. Since we're using the free tier, this takes a bit longer. And so if you run it like that, you're going to encounter the same problem I have over here. <laughs> and I keep forgetting. So if you go, basically what it's saying, make sure your current IP address is on your IP's whitelist. So that means you want to go to network access and you want to be able to add the IP address relevant to this. So what you do is you go to connect and we're going to add these three IP addresses. So the way to do that, we're just going to go add that IP address. You need to add all three. I'm going to add this as well and add the third one as well. And we're going to, we're going to wait for these to finish. And with that, if we, it does take some time, but it's going to rerun and we have our server running. So that's perfect. So how do we check? We can grab this URL. And if we want to grab one of the endpoints, we can do management slash admins. So this will give our list of users. So it's a little ugly, but as you can see, we have our list of admins. So that is our admin backend page. So now that's just the backend. So now we got to do the same thing for our front end. And our front end is going to be a static site. So we have to click static site over here. And we are going to connect the same repo. In a real production app, you would have these two as separate repos most likely. But in our case, for convenience sake, we're going to have them on the same repo. We're just going to set the root directory as different. And again, root directory, like I said, this one should be client. And over here, we're going to have a build command. And in this case, it's going to be npm run build. And over here, the publish directory is going to be build. So this is by default what create react app has. And over here, we're going to add environment variables and the envir environment variable, we only need one. And as you can see, if you remember client used to be HTTP local host like this, but we're going to change that. We're going to copy react app base URL, but instead we're going to change it to this base URL. So the backend. So we want that as our value. And with that, we are going to hit create static site and we're going to be taken to this page. I think these outbound IP addresses are going to be the same. Yeah. So if I add this 120, 92, 101, yeah, these are exactly the same. So it doesn't really matter. And let's just, let's just wait for this to finish. And with that, we have everything fully set up. It says your site is live. So now we are ready to go. I can go to admin front end. And as you can see, all our information is loaded. We can go to products. This API call kind of takes a while. Remember I told you we're not using aggregate calls. So this one takes some time. If you go to customers, we have our page. We have our transactions. We can sort by rows. We can sort it. We can do search. We can do different columns. We have our geography. We have our overview, daily, monthly breakdown. These are using the same piece of data, so we don't have to reload it. But if you go to admins, we have different API calls. Perfect. Perfect. Everything is working as expected. You have your application deployed and our application is finally complete. I'm glad you got to this point. This was a lot of work, a lot of things over here. I fully focused on the back end, hopefully trying to get you guys to understand the complexities of dealing with back end and how you can set up your databases, give you some general ideas of how you approach modeling and organizing the data, as well as grabbing that information from the front end and displaying that information in nice looking charts. We did everything from back end to front end. Now, if you don't fully get and understand every single piece of it, 
that's expected and normal, but just understand we, we covered a lot of what you would do at a real company. These are applications that you would, these are things that you would normally do at a real company, like server-side pagination. That's a real problem and it can be very complex. We have a lot of tables and a lot of sorting, filtering, a lot of different things with UI challenges. All of that comes into play when you're at work and we have done so much. I'm glad you got to this point. Congratulations on getting this far. But yeah, that was it. We've covered so much in this tutorial. I hope you guys enjoyed all this content. This took me a while to build, so hopefully you can just give me a like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. There are a lot of you who are not subscribed. Hopefully you can subscribe. I put a lot of effort into this one, and I hope to see you next time.